Welcome everybody at Kind Earth Tech, a virtual event today, not a live event as we usually try to do, um, but we have so much to tell you and so much to share. So this is the beginning of uh, a very long day with a lot of content. And right now, uh, some of you are in waiting rooms, uh, some are still heading over to uh, Kind Earth Tech. Um, I would like to introduce my co-host for today, Demoy Robertson. Hi, Ara. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, great to join you all today. Looking forward to all the content and some amazing speakers. Well, um, <laughs> you're, you know all about uh, content, of course, because uh, you're the guy that started uh, the Vegan Re uh, Review. Um, we will have more from uh, Demoy on the Vegan Review uh, later today. Um, right now, um, I would like to explain a little bit what we're going to do. Um, about every 10 minutes, something else is going to happen, whether that is live or pre-recorded. Um, some of those will actually take you to breakout rooms in Hopin again. And um, I will make sure that I will not be uh, uh, in, in the screen all the time. Uh, so we'll, sometimes you will see me, um, maybe sometimes when something goes wrong because uh, this is the very first time we are ever doing this. And um, uh, luckily we are hosted at the Rai in Amsterdam right now. We have this amazing studio and um, um, you are all probably either in, in your home or in the office. Uh, we are here now in a huge studio uh, and I'm very, very happy that we are a guest here. Um, uh, I would like to uh, point out that if you want to leave, all of this is going to be recorded. So of course, having no breaks doesn't mean that you don't get to take a break. So make sure that you take enough breaks, that you have enough water around, because this is 11 hours, more than 65 speakers, over four continents, and about, um, I, um, I think we have seven hosts all together. Do you have anything to add? Did I forget anything, Jamoy? No, no. Um, yep, just strap in, um, get ready for some amazing speakers. And as Ira said, um, don't worry if you miss anything. It will all be recorded live for you later on. Yes, that is uh, the truth. Are we already uh, uh, ready to get uh, Emma inside? Ah, there she is. Hello. Good morning. Emma. How are we doing? How are we doing? We're doing fine, uh, a bit like, oh, how are we going to do this? It's really amazing. Jamoy <laughs> keeps on looking at the screen instead of the camera. <laughs> I think that's quite natural. I'm, I'm trying not to talk to <laughs> And I'm trying to not talk too much gibberish. Um, <laughs> Emma, how has it been to set up so much in the in the Hoppers uh, space together with Jakob? Oh, it's oh, been uh, uh, it's been great. It's been an interesting <laughs> journey, but uh, yeah, we're figuring it all out. So um, yes, yeah. Well, virtual events will be a breeze after this. Yeah, we'll do that many <laughs> many <a> times. <laughs> well, <laughs> Emma, as you can see, is from Citizen Kind. And uh, please, Emma, could you introduce yourself to us? Yes, of course. So, um, yes, I'm the founder of Citizen Kind, which is a uh, consultancy I set up to focus on helping companies who are, who are specifically focusing their efforts on making this world a better place um, through using technology and innovation. So um, I've been helping them find the brightest and brainiest brains all over the world um, <laughs> to help them do that. And uh, that was how I came into contact with uh, Kind Earth Tech, with uh, visiting uh, Ira in Amsterdam in Nemo last year and experiencing all the wonders that Ket uh, had to offer uh, last year when we were in the sunshine and out on boats in the canal and um, <laughs> just having a having a wonderful time for three days. Um, I remember yesterday there was even a wine tasting at one point. So um, I've, I've just fell in love with the whole Ket community and Ira and Olivia and the cell based world and so I've been hooked ever since and um, that's why 
uh, when I was talking about a podcast, I shot my hand up in the air and said, I can do that for you. <laughs> and um, so that's what we're doing. And so we've started, uh, we've got two episodes already out on all your podcast players that you can access. And um, I'm interviewing some of the people today, some of the people from last year, some of the um, people still to come on the KEP stage. Um, but people who are the innovators, creators and visionaries in this space. And um, it's really, really fun. I'm really enjoying it. Well, I'm happy that you're enjoying it. And I remember that I got to get into CAT also by just raising my hand. And at the time, <laughs> uh, I was in San Francisco uh, during our first, uh, um, at the time, uh, alternative protein show. And I actually never got to the event because I broke my arm. And then at the end of the event, I got there. Uh, I fresh out of the ER, which was an experience in itself. And I had my uh, right arm in a sling. And then everybody was talking, where are we going to do our next cat? And Milan and Singapore and everybody was saying, oh, let's go there, there, there. And I, the only thing I actually could do at that event was raise my left arm and say, hey, um, <laughs> shouldn't we be doing Amsterdam? Well, luckily that was, uh, uh, <laughs> people kind of liked the idea and they actually all came to Amsterdam and to be quite honest, the COVID situation made me really sad this year because uh, we had so many amazing plans. Again, of course, boats and of, again, of course, Nemo. But we will have to wait till uh, 2021 to do that and uh, make sure that we uh, have another good time on boats. The <laughs> Netherlands is not always famous for his weather. So that you had such good weather that day uh, or those days. Um, yeah, that was a good thing. Um, the heavens right were now, smiling upon us, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and right now, uh, for everybody in a different time zone uh, than we are right now, uh, this is Amsterdam. This is, um, I think you're one hour behind us. Yes, uh, I'm in UK. Uh, a little over 10 o'clock here. And it's windy, it's uh, rainy, it's typically November weather here in uh, Amsterdam. And uh, are you enjoying that weather, Demoy? I am indeed, I am. Um, <laughs> I'm originally from the UK, so it's not that different. However, you do get a bit more um, breeze from in the <laughs> Netherlands. <laughs> and is there anything specific that you are expecting from uh, this event right now? Because this is also your f first time ever doing something like this. So <laughs> we're two rookies here. I think um, specifically I'm looking forward to exploring topics, you know, across all the different continents that we've got. Um, typically you don't get to do that um, at one event. It's usually all separated. So it will be really interesting to connect all the dots and see, you know, what's going on across the globe. Yes, because uh, around uh, our time here in Europe, uh, uh, 1.30, we will actually travel virtually to Singapore, where we will be met by uh, Sandia. We stay with Sandia in her evening hours until she really is ready for bed, because that day she had also had a really long day already. Um, then after two and a half, one and a half hours in Singapore with amazing people from Asia, uh, we travel all the way to the US East. Um, we have a sort of a break, I said we don't have breaks, but we have a sort of a break uh, uh, that we have only visuals. So nobody really talking, but only really ex ex exclusive visuals that uh, have to do with kind Earth tech. Um, then uh, we say hello in the morning to Isabella and uh, uh, Shannon Theobald, and they will take us around the tech that is going on in a very, very kind way in the eastern part of the US. And after that, we will join the west part of the US and meet up with Olivia and Shannon stays with us. And after Olivia has taken, I think, Josh Tetrick for breakfast and uh, has been talking or interviewing uh, uh, David Kay, um, she comes over here again 
and we end up the whole event here back in Amsterdam. Maybe have something like a, a, a shout out and, uh, and an after party. We're working on, uh, <laughs> right now, we're working on a playlist. So if you have any requests, please send them to us. We have all kinds of groups. We have WhatsApp groups, we have LinkedIn groups. So if you have a request, please send them in and we'll put them in the playlist. Um, what is your next guest, Emma, on the podcast? Who is that? My next guest. Uh, well, my next guest is actually someone who is featuring in um, the program today. Um, as it's you, Ira. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. Oh oh. It's your. It's it's your interview, which we're doing this morning. Um, so that will be the next episode on the podcast. On the podcast. But then personally, I'll be interviewing uh, uh, next week, hope, uh, no, the week after next, I'll be interviewing um, Michelle Eggers from BioMilk, who features in our program uh, on the US side of things. So ah. she's really interesting because she is uh, creating human breast milk from cell based technology. Um, and she's got a fascinating background. So uh, really looking forward to having a good chat with her. It's really interesting. Um, um, and it's also interesting how much uh, people are these days into podcasts. Um, when I was a young girl, way back when, uh, something like that you just didn't have. Uh, um, and right now it's one of those things that is common. You sit in the bus or you drive your car and you listen to a podcast, you get educated, you get inspired. And um, I'm very, very grateful uh, to you, uh, Emma, that you're doing this work because uh, of your amazing and beautiful English, because you're, <laughs> of your lively conversation always and your kind manners. I, uh, we at CAT couldn't wish for anybody better to do this. And uh, so we are very, very happy to call this CATcast with Emma and not with just citizen kind. <laughs> we had a discussion <laughs> about that. And Emma was really like, really, really? Uh, but shouldn't I be doing this as citizen kind? And so who is citizen kind? Uh, this is Emma and it's hyper personal and you have personal conversations about uh, the passions of people. And I think it's really fitting that it's called the CatCast with Emma. <laughs> well, I actually have come to agree with your perspective, Ira, <laughs> because I realized that, you know, some, when you see on Twitter, people put in their um, bios, you know, views are my own and not that of my company. Well, I'm pretty opinionated, so it's probably a good <laughs> idea that I, I do it under my own name and not under my company name. Um, exactly. So, uh, so, so yes, well, but I mean, I'm I'm so grateful and thankful that you um, agreed to um, us working together on it because um, it's my favourite thing to do is to talk to people. It's <laughs> it's my job, um, which I created for myself. But it means that I'm getting to to to, to do that with so many inspirational people that um, I and I love it. So um, yes, I'm really I'm really happy. Well, thank you so it. very and much. And obviously, if you want to feature on the podcast, then drop me a line. Yes, do that. Drop us a line about anything. <laughs> If you have a question, if you have a request for music, and if you want to be on a catcast with Emma, please drop us a line at uh, uh, kindearth.tech, and we will see if uh, Emma has somewhere in her schedule time for you to chat. Yes, for thank sure. Thank you, Emma. For sure. Pleasure. I think um, we're getting used to all of this. So right now, I think we're up for our next uh, topic. Am I right, Mr. Audio? I'm off. See you. Hello, everybody. My name is Arne Weverling, and I'm a member of the parliament in the Netherlands for the VVD. I'm a big fan of innovation, just like you. And I'm a big fan of cultivated meat. And when you realize that we have in 2050, 10 billion people in the world that we have to feed, then you know that we have to be innovative. In the Netherlands, we have a lot of innovative and sustainable farmers. But when you know that food production will cost a lot of land, raw materials, and nowadays 60 billion animals to feed the world population, then you know that we have to be innovative. Uh, 
Last year, in a debate with the Ministry of Farmery, I made a motion uh, to come to an action agenda. Uh, luckily, the ministry uh, did a very good job, and there is now an action agenda uh, between uh, the ministry and the uh, cultivated meat industry. So I'm very happy about that, and uh, I think and I hope that we have in some years cultivated meat in our supermarkets. So um, that is a very uh, good news, uh, I think. I wish you a good day today. Uh, thank you for listening and stay innovative. Bye bye. Well, this is a, a kind message from Arne Weveling. Uh, as he already explained, he's a member of parliament uh, for the uh, party, the VVD. And that's considered a rather right winged party. And um, I was pleasantly surprised when I found out that uh, um, this party in particular is so interested in cultivated meat. Um, they want to actually go into depth with this, together with another amazing politician uh, uh, that I also had the pleasure of meeting. It's actually Thier de Groot. It's uh, the politician I had a very, very interesting fireside conversation, which is something that we will air later today. And um, the whole reason that I wanted to bring these uh, politicians uh, uh, on today is that um, we can be angry about st things not happening the way we want them to happen. And with my history of being, uh, uh, besides somebody who loves to be on Kind Earth Tech, um, my personal history started a very long time ago when I was about 14 years old and my father suddenly started to talk to people about stem cell research and thought in the 1980s uh, that it was a good idea to find like-minded uh, researchers wanting to actually make cultivated meat. Um, currently it's uh, almost or more than 40 years later and his idea is possible. His idea uh, has actually uh, made me taste cultivated meat uh, uh, at just in, uh, um, in San Francisco. But at the same time, the general public at this moment cannot eat cultivated meat. And that is not only because the science is not ready for it. It is also that a lot of the money that taxpayers actually pay uh, uh, to our government to do the right thing is not always going to the right direction. And um, one of the reasons I kept on driving my car from uh, Amsterdam to The Hague, where our government is seated, was to convince politicians that making sure that they pay attention to something as innovative and as important as cultivated meat uh, would not necessarily have to cost the taxpayer more money. It is actually more a question of where do you allocate your money? Uh, what are you going to do with the taxpayer's money? And um, in the beginning, I thought I had to actually fight these politicians. I had to sort of um, put a sort of massively intense conversations with them. And what I actually found out every time again that I met very nice people who were very curious about what I had to t tell them. And that's something that was top of my mind and something that I knew quite a lot about because I had been around this conversation for so long, wasn't top of their mind. Uh, these politicians have a lot on their mind. They have a lot, uh, they, they have rather big agendas. And um, if we want our government and the people in parliament to do better, I think it is very important that we uh, uh, try and uh, educate them, inspire them, show them the possibilities they, that we know of. Because if you look at uh, the array of people that are going to talk to you today, and uh, I will really stop talking uh, uh, after, uh, these, uh, after this piece of this morning, um, all of those people have so much knowledge 
Um, but we have to make sure that knowledge doesn't stay in a lab, doesn't stay in a university, doesn't stay in a magazine, doesn't stay in a bubble or in a group. We all know, let's say we all know what is going on. We all know why we are at Kind Earth Tech. That doesn't necessarily mean that all the other people that are not here are against it. It might very well be that they just don't know. And um, I've come across many people in The Hague, and I really took my car there the last two years since I started this adventure uh, after meeting Josh Tetrick in 2017. And um, he convinced me to, to go back into a world where my father had walked uh, many, many miles. And um, I have come to get to know my father even better in the years uh, uh, since I've done this. Um, and especially the politicians willing to learn and willing to listen and willing to be inspired and see how within their confinement of politics, of party politics, uh, uh, what for a layman or a laywoman like myself sometimes can be extremely frustrating, uh, they do get certain things done, but they need help. And um, uh, before I was, I had become really skeptical about the possibility of me as a single person to be of any use uh, with my knowledge, with my convictions, with the mission I am on uh, towards uh, better politics. And these two politicians like Arne Weveling or Cheer de Groot, two people totally different from difficult, different political parties, but they sort of restored my faith in the pos possibility of um, having a government that actually does a good job uh, with a working uh, democracy and where you uh, also learn a lot. I have learned so much from being in contact with them, uh, understanding the hurdles they have and the impossibilities they have. And um, um, yes, you just have to come, you go, you go again, you drive there again, you come up with an idea, you present them with a possibility, and if they are good uh, uh, suggestions, I have now learned that if you find the right people, they will listen to you. So uh, later on, we will have Armanda Govers, and uh, she will tell you how she went about all of this. And um, uh, somewhere in this program today, we will have uh, a fireside uh, uh, conversation with Cheert Groot, who explains why he, as a politician, uh, changed his views in a couple of years around this topic completely and now wants to be the most green uh, uh, politician in his own party. So um, make sure that you have a look in our program uh, around the topic uh, of, or around the talk that I did with Cheer de Groot. Um, I want to ask the people behind here in the studio, um, how much time do I still have? Because um, 10 seconds. Well, Des Moy, um, ever met any politicians that you <laughs> wanted to introduce here? Um, not as of yet, but I think you, you know, made a really key point when you say, um, you know, the preconceptions that you had going in. Yes. You thought it was going to be really difficult. Um, and a lot of it was actually based down to the fact that these people have so much on their plates um, that, you know, it's not at the forefront of their minds. So what I'm interested in particularly is that conversation and how you start that and actually kind of get out of your own head to say, you know, this might not be as difficult as I imagine. And then you relax a bit and then ease into those conversations. I yeah. find that very interesting. Um, well, dear Cheert, um, happy to see you uh, again. Um, we've been meeting the last uh, couple of years uh, uh, several times. And um, every time it had to do with what we in the Netherlands called Kweekvlees. <laughs> and, um, in, What's the uh, English name? The English name for um, this concoction, <laughs> it's actually... Uh, under debate constantly. I've, I think in the last 40 years, uh, Kweekvlees uh, 
has been in vitro meat, has been pure meat, franken meat, uh, 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 clean meat. Uh, there's even a book about it, clean meat. Uh, but these days it's either uh, uh, cell-based meat or uh, cultivated meat. So, um, or sometimes people call it cultured meat. And um, to be quite honest, I'm not very steady in the name. I use all of them uh, uh, all the time. And I think I'm allowed to do this because I've been to, through so many names anyway. Um, I've invited you as uh, one of our uh, most important uh, politicians in the Dutch government. You're a part of Dutch parliament. And I have asked you to be a part of this CAT uh, uh, event to explain how, in my view, uh, um, a, a working democracy is actually uh, able to play a role in a transition in innovation uh, to guide, to, to make sure that something that is important, whether this is for climate or for animal rights or for uh, uh, your health. Uh, in, in these instances, uh, I think uh, we've shown and especially you've shown that the right politics can work. And um, the question I wanted to ask you is um, back in um, 2018, you must have seen an item on TV that something happened around cultivated meat in the Netherlands. And why did you jump on that one? Because that was the thing that you did. Yes, I was very interested uh, in this subject because, um, well, uh, it's a lot of work to, to grow meat uh, around an animal. Um, it's very inefficient actually so if there are possibilities to 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 grow meat without uh, uh, growing and killing animals and keeping them in a way uh, often uh, not very civilized uh, according to the standards we should have um, then there's a win there's an absolute win and um, as a politician, I'm, I'm fascinated by efficiency because our uh, food production system as we know it now is very inefficient. And if you allow me to, to explain that, uh, that has to do with uh, giving feed, animal feed to animals. We use arable land on earth to grow crops for animals, feed for example, soy or maize. And you always need um, uh, five, four kilos uh, plant-based uh, protein for, for one kilo uh, animal uh, protein. So there's a loss. There's a loss in giving cereals, actually, which also human can eat, in giving them to, to animals. Um, so we don't, do not use the earth in a way uh, which is fitted to the challenge we have on, uh, in climate and the growing population we have to feed. Actually, one third of the arable land is used for crops for direct human digestion. One third is wasted, food waste, and one third of the arable land is used for uh, feed for animals. So we should change this because in the current food system, if you want to feed the growing population uh, from that food system, you need three earths to do so. It's absolutely not possible. As you know, we have only one earth era. So um, I'm fascinated by uh, efficiency and uh, I introduced in the politics a concept of circular food production in which you stop giving animals uh, grains that also human can, can digest. Um, so you give them rest materials, you keep animals on uh, pastures, um, which you only can use for, for animal grazing, which are not fitted for arable crops. Um, so you do use the earth differently. Um, and then animals can be uh, a part of, of uh, uh, a healthy um, 
a circle of uh, manure, of plant-based production, and of course you have the, the products of the animals. So that, that is basically the fission, the most simple version. And then came, uh, came this documentary and uh, we met um, with maybe even a better idea than that, uh, which is uh, the, the cultivated meat uh, idea. Yeah. Can you understand that I did the math together with my father on a napkin about 40 years ago. Um, he had all of these very smart friends and I was one of those kids that was always curious. So I was uh, um, in their surroundings and I must have been 14 at the time. And my father and his friends did the math. Um, it was about 1980 at the time. And um, if Chinese people would actually start eating as much meat as we were eating at the time, at, they did the math that we would need actually four planets. So we're one planet off for here, but okay, <laughs> that's not a problem. And we wouldn't have any polar caps um, because of uh, everything going out of the animals. And um, he, he at the time saw this as a big problem. And I am so happy with you that you jumped on this documentary that aired in, uh, in May 2018. Um, and at the same time, I hope you understand that I am also very frustrated that I have as just, well, one of the people in the Netherlands, this knowledge already for years that we need several planets if we go on doing what we're doing. And um, you're just one politician. And still you made a huge difference to uh, the, the Dutch agenda by actually jumping on just a documentary, which was made by a very uh, a good documentary maker. And at the same time, I was so worried when I understood that if you wouldn't have done that, um, right now, um, I don't think that uh, a lot of politicians would have dared jump on it, go after it, stay with it, even though the minister told you not to, you, you said, no, I want this debate. And even though I think it's one of the longest prolonged and, and or how do you call this, uh, um, uh, one of the longest debates that was postponed, I think for more than one and a half years. So I kept on driving back to the Hague <laughs> And when there was, uh, uh, when it was on, uh, on the agenda and then it was stopped again. And then somehow uh, you and also Arne Weveling managed uh, to write something that was backed by 100 and 120 or 126 people out of 150 uh, uh, people in parliament. And now with a broad support for a better agenda for the problem of solving, uh, uh, or at least being aware that uh, cultivated meat is a solution for uh, this. So the documentary must have been very important. And um, at the same time, how do we make sure that Topics like these, because I am sure that cultivated meat is not the only important thing going around. And, and that is what in Kind Earth Tech is going on, because also algae, also fungi, also stuff that's going on right now around fermentation. Those are all solutions for the problems that we are facing. And what is the best route to make sure that politicians that can make a difference, like you yourself, are aware of what we're doing? How do we do this? Well, keep the debate uh, alive. Um, of course, uh, we are now uh, going towards elections. Um, yeah. And if voters uh, vote me uh, for another round, then I will continue this uh, debate on, uh, on cultivated meat, but also other alternatives for, for meat. And, but moreover, the, the uh, 
the transition of the the dominant food system, which is the biggest task, I think. Um, so, and I will cooperate uh, with anybody, and um, I think there there are a lot of chances. And your father was uh, of large importance in the Netherlands. We were uh, the first to have. Uh, uh, a patent uh, 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 accepted, accepted, yep. and um, uh, and then afterwards it, it it became silent. And the problem now not is to get uh, venture capital. There is uh, a lot of capital and a lot of young startups uh, trying to produce meat um, uh, in this manner. Um, and the problem was the reluctance at the um, at the government. There was uh, there is still a, a largely conservative uh, uh, government, uh, and the minister of agriculture in the Netherlands had um, uh, ethical uh, problems apparently with uh, with uh, with um, uh, cult cult cultivated meat or cultured meat. Uh, you can call it kweekvlees, Jude. Kweekvlees <laughs> or vlees without a base. Yeah, <laughs> meat, meat without an animal. Yeah. Um, so, and this struck me that uh, a Christian minister doesn't have problem to uh, to keep uh, the uh, uh, the the creatures uh, of God uh, in a way God has not intended uh, intended, and to slaughter them. Uh, that is okay. But uh, to um, to help cells uh, divide themselves, etc., in a merely technical process, um, uh, was not uh, ethical, and that struck me. And uh, when the, there is a chance, there's a huge opportunity for progress, and then you should not have taboos because this is really. Uh, one aspect uh, be open about it uh, have an open mind because the world needs solutions like this yeah. and the second and the second role of government uh, can be that also regulations um, scientists are not necessarily are uh, people who can come who want to walk the long road through the institutions to get an application approved uh, as novel food in Europe. Um, it's not uh, a very simple pr procedure. Nobody has done it before for uh, this, this kind of meat. Um, so you need some help from the government and an open mind. And um, so I tried to uh, uh, convince the, um, the government to do so with the help of uh, 126, you had to count uh, of my colleagues. Yeah. Well, I, I, I hope that we will uh, very soon have a situation where if I would have done the same thing now and I would be here with a company that says, I want to have dinner with people in a restaurant two or three times a week, they can sign uh, a written consent that they understand what they're doing. Uh, you make sure that this is a safe surrounding uh, and if you do diligent testing, that doesn't mean that you do food in a lab because lab, food doesn't come from a lab, it comes from a kitchen. Uh, um, do you think we would have, is it possible that in the near future, this company or such a venue uh, uh, would be able to take place and would be welcomed instead of being uh, yeah, sent out by the NVVA? Um, but a control uh, uh, organization uh, which uh, forbid uh, the testing and tasting of yeah. uh, of uh, cultivated meat. Um, that that was the situation we had. I think um, because this is the discussion exactly I had with the minister, and she told and she wrote that such experiments are allowed as a kind of testing. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you give some, uh, I think this should, you should discuss it with the control uh, organization uh, that you want to test and these are the conditions. Um, but uh, this should be okay. And if not, um, 
I'll be there. We'll have another debate about that. <laughs> That's right. And fast. And fast. A yeah, quick because, debate. Because we don't have enough, enough time. Right. And that is the whole point. And you just uh, mentioned the novel food regulatory system. And is there a possibility or where do we go? Or don't you think it's a good idea to make sure that if a company has enough funding to be a startup, that means that they have some funding to actually build their lab, do research, pay somebody to do the research and, uh, and, and go after to what they think they can make or offer or create. Then also having to work on putting together a, a, a dossier for the novel food regulatory system in Parma uh, run by the EFSA, that is currently a hurdle. And we even in, during the event, we will have people also stating that this is a hurdle for startups uh, to go from uh, uh, an idea to going to the market. And um, I've, I think we discussed this, but I would be in favor of creating a fund in Europe that helps startups go through the uh, uh, novel food regulatory system actively helping them, so actually helping them write uh, the necessary uh, uh, dossier, um, even if they need funding to do certain, uh, to make the dossier even fund them with money. And then of course that is taxpayers money that would go into these startups and startups are businesses. But I, I, can, I can see a, a system where a startup that is successful with what they do, whether it is selling their IP or actually creating a company that does well, that they have a sort of obligation to pay this back in five or 10 or 15 years. And if it doesn't work, okay, it doesn't work. Then the tech didn't, wasn't good enough. The company wasn't good enough uh, to make it work. But you would help, especially in time, uh, go uh, these make these startups go through the novel food regulatory system and create more innovation around food instead of having um, everybody right now in this startup country is looking like oh who's going to go first into this dossier who's going to file first right now we have several uh, uh, cultivated meat uh, startups in uh, in Europe none of them have put in a dossier. That apparently itself, this is a problem yeah that but, in itself is not a good uh, situation especially if we also we also know that one of the best startups in cultivated meat are actually in europe so that in itself should say something to uh, europe's politicians yeah um I, i'm not sure if if money is the problem uh yeah, i problem. think Okay, Where do you, okay. So you get money from, uh, from, from venture capital and where do you allocate this? Where do you put this? Uh, um, it's also not, it's also scary to put in a dossier and get uh, reject, rejected. So uh, all of these scientists do their work diligently and will make sure that if they go through, they go through. Yeah. Um, so money is a hurdle. Yeah. Okay. And uh, well, if, if that's really a hurdle, then I think there's another uh, um, hurdle. What I could imagine is that um, you help them uh, from the government side because yeah. um, going through uh, the health institution and, and going to Parma, the EFSA, um, it's, it's a different job uh, from inventing new pro processes, etc. Totally. So, uh, and there are people working at the government who know how this works. Uh, what should a dossier uh, be like? Can we just try to submit a dossier, not formally, but try it and ask for advice in, in Parma? Is this what you, what you like? Then you need informal contacts. Because if you have this formal application um, and you have a no, then you have a problem. So um, 
I need more than money. If money is a problem, then you should think about it. But uh, more than that, it's finding your way and finding the way to do it, to check it, to improve your dossier, to do an extra test if necessary, and then be sure that if you submit formally your dossier, that it will be approved. And that is a different game. And I think uh, the startup should get help there. Yeah, because I understand fully that we have to have uh, food safety in place. I'm all for it. Um, but if the food safety uh, uh, um, regulation becomes so hard that other things that are also important for our safety, like climate change and, 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 and food safety in itself, um, then you get the question, what is more important? So to, to, if it is important for a government to have a food safety uh, 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 system in place, which I'm all for, then I think they should be aware of the other co consequences this has and me be more proactive. Right now, I have the feeling that it's a, a situation where they say, we have this in place. We've now also updated it uh, uh, and you should be able to go through in one and a half years. Uh, but we all know that there are stops and, when, and, and the clock stops when there are extra uh, questions. So, I, I would ask, and, and it's one of the reasons that I will also be talking to Euro Parliament, uh, people in Euro Parliament, mm -hmm. is, um, is make sure that we, we, or as government and as regulatory system, make sure that they have uh, a support so that the government can show, because they are the ones that the, the public looks at, they want you to produce safe food. So it's something the government wants, the population wants, uh, but we also have a problem in the rise. So how can we make sure that all of these innovative foods are helped to go through something that we think is important? And um, any suggestion of you, Chair, to where I have to knock on a door and, and, and get my car back to the Haag or maybe to Brussels, I don't mind, um, uh, tell me, because I think it is very important that you keep this in place, but help the startups and the innovative uh, cohort of people wanting to do a better job. Yeah, I fully agree with you. Uh, you know, well, this is what we have to do. And this is also my point that government should help uh, to make those dossier uh, uh, to a success and uh, helping startups uh, in this manner. And uh, if you have signs that government is not helping and only doing what they formally should do, which is to 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 less, um, then uh, please give me a sign, and then uh, I will try uh, to to see what I can do. And uh, I will. I promise. I will let you know. <laughs> I know. I know you will. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm reluctant. Yeah, it's true. Um, there's one thing I want to go over uh, with you, and it's, it's more on a personal level. Um, besides the fact that I, I hope you understand um, how much I, I, I worship and how much I am and fortunate that I met you and that you did what you did in, uh, in our government. Um, but there was one instance that where I was really angry with you. And it was in Amsterdam. And um, uh, you actually, um, uh, oh, something's happening here and I wanna do this right. Wait a minute, this has to go off. You have a cliffhanger now. <laughs> yeah, the cliffhanger, okay. So okay. what's up? This is, this is highly personal. Um, uh, and it's, it's it's how this story that is now unfolding because we in this world now have up to 45 to 50 startups working on cell-based meats all over the world. Um, uh, a couple of the best here in the Netherlands, uh, absolutely, but uh, exciting stuff happening in Israel. Did you know this week 
um, a restaurant in Israel is now serving cultivated uh, chicken. Great, great yeah, to hear. Actually, great in a re hear. restaurant in, in Israel, that's happening. It should have been in Zandam. So I am happy, but I'm not happy, but I am happy in, in, uh, in the bigger picture. Yep, for me. Um, but I went to, uh, um, I was angry with you in an evening in Amsterdam, uh, in uh, Pakhuis de Zwijger. Um, it was the fourth night, uh, uh, all about uh, the, the green revolution uh, around uh, animal agriculture or agriculture in large. And I had been to all four evenings and I was waiting to see cultivated meat somewhere on the agenda, innovation somewhere on the agenda. And at the last night, I, I couldn't stay silent and I stood up and um, you said that evening on stage that we would have probably 10% less animals. And, and you almost said that reluctantly at the time. And then um, I also asked why is nothing being said here around cultivated meat? And then at the time you said to me, yes, but I see this as something separate from uh, 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 the, the farming uh, uh, transition. And then I said, I do not agree with you. And I had, the, uh, I had thought that I, in our first conversation, I had actually explained it well. And then a week later, I had an appointment with you and I was really like, What's the point going there? What's the point going to Cheered and explaining him how important it is to also incorporate this into animal uh, uh, agriculture and, 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 and agriculture at large? And then I remember sitting at the table with you and I almost didn't go to the meeting because what's the point? What's the point? And I went to this meeting and I was sitting across to you. And then I tried to explain that how I would see farmers actually do cultivated meat. And then you actually asked me the question, but Ira, do you really mean that a farmer on a farm is going to do cultivated meat? And I said, yes, that's exactly what I mean. We work out the hygiene. We will work out the, the air filtering. We will make sure that it can work. But like starting a brewery on a farm, I can see a farmer becoming somebody who still produces meat, but meat without an animal. So he will start farming cells instead of farms. And I am still to this day very happy that I actually went to our second meeting and I explained it probably better than I did the first time. And um, um, that even though I don't think that right now all farmers will want to do this, I think there is a, a, um, a big group within farmers right now doing animal agriculture that would want to transition to this kind of farming and maintain food producers and instead of farming animals would be farming cells because that is actually what it is. You can farm an animal and that's a procedure and that's taken care and it's 24 hour business. And that's the same for farming cells. Well, I, I'm gladly, I, I, know, I know this moment that I see it separately, uh, what I said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I disappointed you at this <laughs> point. Um, well. I'm still reluctant. I always was, um, um, I find the idea and it's, this was I said to you also that, earlier that that it is very sympathetic to to look for another job for a farmer and um, very interesting idea and I, but and it might work as well not for all yeah. farmers but for yeah. some yeah um, but I'm also uh, realistic and um, I'm not sure if it if it if it can work because the the, the differences are are big. Um, there's also other points. It is it is skilled work. Uh, it is not easy to do. Um, you need different buildings, etc. Uh, because a stable is, is has a 
uh, as a roof like this and you need maybe higher uh, roofs. Maybe, maybe not. But uh, it's still, I find it interesting, but I'm also uh, realistic and um, I'm not sure if it will work. If it works, it would um, address uh, the reluctance from the side from farmers against. So from this idea, it's a very bright and, and a creative idea. So I don't say no, that's not possible because you never say no to creative <laughs> ideas. But um, in this stadium, uh, I see it a little bit separately. So it's more, I, I do not want to to to, uh, to disappoint you again, but so I, I say it a bit, little bit more nuance. At this stage, um, we should focus on the uh, the lab situations and the dossiers and maybe later when there's a big scale uh, scaling up then there are possibilities of course well it shows me i have to go back to the hague and show you how things are being built these days so uh, i i think we have to keep on having discussions here around this topic um and it is it is very interesting every time again that people have certain ideas around what cultivated meat is and how it's going to be made and who is going to make it. And um, in, in, in that aspect, there is still a lot of work to be done because um, uh, um, cultivated meat is not supposed to come from a factory and it's also not supposed to come from a lab. It's gonna, it, it has to be produced by a food producer and um, who that is, whether that is large scale or uh, small scale, right now we can work toward, uh, towards that. And um, I, I, I love to keep on having discussions about this with you. So that is for the future, that's not for today. Um, uh, leaves me with um, uh, a question you might have uh, for us, the, the, the people that are uh, attending this uh, conference, is there anything you would like to know about future foods that is uh, a top of mind of you? Like, what do we expect the future in food to be? Is there something that you want to know from us, uh, the attendees? Well, it's an interesting question. Um... Before I answer, the, the, the nice thing of talking to you and talking about uh, cultivated meat is that the longer you um, think about it, the weirder it is that we have all those animals. <laughs> so, so it's, it's and, and that it is uh, uh, weird to slaughter an animal and then eat part of it. So it is, uh, it's, it, changes your mindset so it's and i think this is for a lot of people um uh the case um and the biggest challenge is for us and i hope yeah you are all uh engaged with this this theme is to um to be more kind to the 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 earth your your theme yeah so um i and I'm not having a specific question, but um, uh, it is good to have those innovations. Uh, and please also keep thinking about um, the current agriculture because this will be the dominant system. And we have to change the current system uh, towards more circularity as well. Um, so in this part, so there, because most of the farmers are still in this system, so we need to change it. Well, having said that, I, I enjoyed uh, talking to you. And thank am... you very much for the questions. Well, thank you very much, Tiert, for having uh, this discussion with me. I am going to highlight to everybody how much I uh, uh, enjoyed getting to know you and being on this road together with you for the last two years. And um, uh, I, I hope we will have another discussion next year. And, and, and if we can make this route a little bit faster and this transition go a little bit better than it's going today, then uh, we are already making use, huge steps. And uh, so personally, forever in your debt, thank you. 
<laughs> and uh, as, a, as a, a Dutch constituent, um, um, you have shown the value of democracy going to The Hague and educating your po politicians and that there is a system in place that if you do the work and you convince people in the right way, um, that it actually works. So you restored my faith in, in politics. Thank you very much for that. That's very kind of you, because that's why we're here for, and uh, that's what I, uh, because politics can, politicians can only function um, when you have a relation with society and when there are people with excellent ideas uh, and, and uh, a great mind, then uh, uh, politics should be open to everybody. So thank you very much for your kind words and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you very much, Jared. Let's uh, let's all do that. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm very honored to be able to share some of the things we're working on at Mozameet with you today. Uh, my name is Tim. I'm Chief Business Officer at Mozameet, uh, and as we say, we're pioneering a cleaner, kinder way to feed the world. Uh, it makes me really happy to see so many familiar faces as well as many new faces today uh, and re read some of the recent updates in the media. And as we're nearing 2020, uh, a year that many of us would, would love to be over as soon as possible uh, and never look back, I would like to reflect uh, and look back on some of the things that have changed recently and, and some of the th things that are upcoming. Because in 2020, with all its ups and downs, uh, it seems we've really entered a new phase as an industry, and I'm proud to see so many make great progress. But first, let's take a, a step back. I think what unites us here all today is, is a strong desire to fundamentally reshape the global food system. You know, remove these beautiful animals from the production process of food uh, because of the many, many reasons you're all too familiar with. And that's what drives us at Moza Meat, and, and that's what drives many of you too. And this year, we noticed that there have been more and more organizations, including cellular agriculture, in their communications as a credible option to make progress against climate change, to improve animal welfare, to increase the resilience of how we make our food. Um, so when I talk about this new phase, what does that mean? What does that mean for us? What does that mean for the broader community? Well, for most of it, it means that we've grown from originally way back when, a government-funded research project where our founders, Mark and Peter, met to a philanthropically funded research project that produced a hamburger in 2013 to now a company with more than uh, 60 mosaics from 19 countries all over the world at uh, our, our new home near Maastricht University. And in this pilot facility, we, we are ready to scale up production. Because scientifically, we are in a, in a new phase too. Of course, we've improved cell culture conditions and standardized and improved cell selection. Uh, we've transformed our process from initially, initially the planar growth to now uh, scalable bioreactors. Um, we've removed serum and other animal components from the medium. We recently announced reducing the cost of the medium by more than 80 fold. And we've laid some of the groundwork to recycle growth medium because ultimately the sustainability of the processes that we are designing is, is of the utmost importance to us. So, for example, we're preparing to use solar panels on our pilot uh, plant and projections are they might be able to completely cover the energy consumption of the entire facility when fully operational. So uh, we want to make sure we optimize on all the different uh, parts of our operations. We're also, of course, growing fat tissue in addition to muscle to create great texture and great taste. And we're continuing to improve the protein content of these muscle structures. And this list goes on and on. These have all been uh, internal developments. Um, but of course, the external landscape has moved to a new phase in 2022 with, for example, more diverse and uh, larger investment rounds. So for us, the support of M Ventures and the Bell Food Group, Blue Horizon, Nutreco, and others uh, has brought, brought much, much more than just capital. They're now real partners uh, who help us along many parts of the new value chain. And we see that investors throughout the COVID situation uh, have doubled down on the opportunities of cellular agriculture. So 
what is ahead of us then? In the short term, we are looking at very practical pieces of scaling our production, increasing speed, start submitting dossiers for regulatory approval, uh, all while continuing, of course, to improve our beef and grow the team. But let's also talk about the slightly longer term because I want to reflect on the sheer scale of this movement. Most of you know this projection by A.T. Kearney and 10% by 2030 would roughly mean a $100 billion market. Or if we just look at projected top level growth of the total meat market, uh, it's expected to add around $400 billion in the next decades. And I'm mentioning these numbers because this obviously is more than a way for me to make myself feel better when I'm grilling a burger in the backyard. It's also more than just a commercial opportunity for any of the companies that are starting in this field. On a global level, this, this shift can, can impact big things like trade balances or food sovereignty or independence of entire countries uh, or regions. So that's why I'm encouraged uh, to see two members of parliament from the Netherlands joining us today and see them actively gear up for this transition that is ahead of us. Um, that's why I love this quote from Bruce, that the government that divorces meat production from the need for living animals would have eternal bragging rights. Um, the way I see it, governments can get much more than just bragging rights, as we saw on the previous slide. And part of this new phase that, we're, uh, that we've seen take shape in 2020 is an increased attention and awareness of the integral role that governments can play in this transition. Um, so again, we, we're seeing encouraging progress. We're clearly in a, in a new phase and, and we're doing this all collectively. So I want to take this opportunity to thank you all for doing your part in reshaping the global food system. Um, if you uh, have any questions about our role in it or uh, how you can contribute, reach out to me or anyone in the team. And I'm looking forward to uh, connect with, with many of you uh, today and over the next uh, the next months or years to uh, to, uh, to reshape the global food system together. Thank you very much, and I hope we'll be in touch. Good morning, everyone. It seems it seems we're we're going live. This is uh, my first uh, breakout on this platform, so uh, bear with me. As you see in the chat with Jacob. Uh, feel free to share your audio and video. I would, would love to make this. Uh, would love to make this as interactive as possible and, and um, uh, uh, make this uh, a conversation. Um, so it seems if, if you sh if you click share your audio, <laughs> share your audio and video, that this uh, becomes more like the 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 meeting environments that we've been in uh, for this year quite a bit. Uh, I, I know I've. I was slightly familiar with video chatting uh, from a previous role where uh, I was working at a technology company and, and much of our interaction was digital. I think 2020, as I, as I said in the, in the previous talk, 2020 really made this, uh, uh, made this mainstream. So I'm really glad that we can all uh, uh, be together here digitally, but um, uh, feel free to, to uh, to open up the mic or video as much as possible and get any questions, get any questions in. Uh, hi, Sandra. Hi. So maybe first a bit more about myself. Uh, I, I, I'm conscious that the the, uh, the video was, was fairly short. So um, my name is Tim. I, I've been uh, joining Mosa Meat since 2017, which was uh, um, uh, around the time when uh, the first companies were were, uh, were, were, were setting up in, in the cellular agriculture space. Uh, I reached out to Mark and Peter and said, can I be of any help? Because, you know, I, I, there's there's uh, nothing that, that I, I, would, I could spend my time and my energy on that I think has a, has a bigger benefit for the for, for the world. So give me anything that I can I can support. Uh, I, I was working at Google at the time. I've been in different uh, marketing roles there. Before Google, I worked at a market research startup, uh, and the red thread usually has been throughout my work that I try to find out what people really care about, what they want, and and how you can make a product that delivers on that. Um, and when I learned about Mosa meat and about cellular agriculture, uh, I noticed, oh wait, I eat, I still eat meat. I know there's all kinds of things, um, um, there's all kinds of negative benefits of my meat consumption, 
but I'm too hooked to to really move away and to really change my habits. Um, um, and I have a, a, a business and marketing background. Usually, when something really solves a, a difficult problem for yourself, you're not that unique. That you know, you're the only one, and it, and it usually is a something that's beneficial for more people. So I reached out in 2017, uh, and since then I've been uh, working uh, to to lay some of the foundations for um, for growing the business side of the, of the company. So uh, I'm not a, a cell biologist, um, uh, but um, I want to make sure that the, the the regulatory landscape or the political landscape is favorable, that consumers are aware of what we're doing and understand it and, 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 and like it, um, uh, get, get the, the, the first commercial uh, relationships in place. Um, and, and as I said, during the, during the, the presentation, uh, I've really seen huge changes since 2017. Of course, before that, from 2013 until now, many things have, have changed, but even in the last uh, two or three years, I've seen um, uh, the, the, the conversation shift significantly uh, with with companies growing and, and getting uh, more funded with the, um, the quality of the of, of the discussions that are taking place moving to a new uh, a new level. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited about uh, the, the developments in the entire industry. Uh, and, of, and of course, uh, I'm super proud to be, to be able to, to be a part of. Um, so I want to make sure, ah, here comes the first question. Uh, feel, feel free to, to either um, unmute and ask a question personally or, or put it in the chat. Um, Jacob asks what, what, how the transition was moving from uh, one of the world's biggest tech firm into a cultured meat company. Well, the, um, the big shift was of course from a well-cushioned big organization to being a small team again. But um, um, I think the adoption of new technology is, is something that I'm super excited about. I think, um, uh, you know, humanity's progress over the last thousands of years has always been somebody crazy thinks of something like, you know, maybe we can fly and then actually starts building that and realizing that. Um, and I And I think the, especially the people early in, in this phase where, where it wasn't really um, um, a given that this would ever succeed, like uh, Willem van Ehle or, 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 or Mark Post, then, then you have to swim upstream a bit and, you know, not really care about the fact that people will go, oh, wait, this, is, this is super crazy. Um, but then the, the, the moment you realize it the first time, then that sets the world on fire. So the 2013 hamburger created uh, kind of a, uh, a green light for others to say, oh, wait, maybe if this is possible, we can also do that. Or, or uh, we, we can build on top of each other's work. Um, so that, that, that spirit of, uh, you know, th that spirit of what, what happens in Silicon Valley with companies that say, oh, wait, we can vastly uh, uh, increase or improve um, um, the, the options that people have I think that's the same the same spirit that I see in this in this new industry, um, and yeah, it, it, it's still um, the familiar curve of if something new is just demonstrated for the first time, how do you make it? Um, how do you re reduce the barriers for people to start adopting it and see the the actual value of it? Because there's this podcast; it's called the Pessimists Archive. Uh, I highly, highly recommend it. It has all kinds of examples of new technologies, uh, sometimes refrigeration. How did that happen over time? And, and um, how did people respond to it? What was the political landscape? Um, and you see that over and over again, there's this first uh, sense of, wait, is this something we want? And, and how will this land? Um, it's even, you know, he has an, an example of how forks were once uh, crazy for people to use and, and it actually there was uh, there were hurdles for people to start using them or bicycles or things we take for granted um, uh, at this point so um, uh, I'm, I'm super fascinated by that so if you really see the benefits and you think how can anyone be against this there's still these um, the, the way society adopts new things and, and how they eventually become more natural like 
you know, agriculture was once a technology or the alphabet or uh, harnessing fire to cook your food. How do you become something that that, that is uh, broadly used and has the impact that you that we all envision? That path for me is is, is super fascinating. Um, I see that Andrew asked, um, how are you different from any other cultured meat companies that are also emerging recently? And how do you make sure that Moza Meat can be a leader in the industry? Um, well, I, I feel that the, um, the, 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 the space of food in general and, and maybe meat and seafood specifically is, is you know, ginormous. Um, uh, and, and yes, we will need to solve all the different parts of um, of that puzzle. We're focused on beef just because, uh, you know, cows are the biggest uh, polluter. Uh, beef is very inefficient, you know, an animal, using an animal for, for producing beef. Uh, so that's where we start. And uh, we start with minced beef. Later on, we move to uh, uh, whole cuts. Um, th that's, that's basically step one, you see. Many people uh, creating different different products. Um, we also, uh, you know, for for reducing complexity with consumer adoption and with the regulatory landscape, we want to focus on exactly creating the, the same thing that uh, you would eat now and buy buy traditionally. So uh, that means we go back to uh, a live animal and don't change anything in the process. Just just um, uh, create the environment where these cells do what they naturally do, um, and and that for us is a uh, is a big challenge because if you don't if you only want to use those first animal cells and not use any animal components in in the rest of the process, so no uh, no serum, no um, no other animal components, then that is uh, scientifically that's a huge a huge task. So you have to mimic. The whole biology of, of animals and that uh, we're making great strides. Um, I think we are we are not driven by uh, being the first one, for example. So if you say, how do you make sure that we are a leader in the industry? That's not the core of what drives us. What drives us is that this is a problem that should be solved for anybody, for anyone at a global scale. We don't intend to make all the meat in the world, but we want all the meat in the world to be replaced with this technology. So in that sense, um, we're, um, you know, we're, we're trying to tackle the hardest problems first, with, the, with beef being the biggest problem, um, but also you know, the, the fact that some types of cells are easier to grow doesn't uh, make us change, change course. It's not that we start with the easiest parts. I think we, we really wanna show that um, the end goal is also something that we can uh, uh, we, can, we can tackle. Um, so that's, uh, I think, what, what sets us apart a bit. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there, there might be other things you see. I, I'd be curious to, to, to hear how you think, uh, uh, what you think the biggest or the most important differences are between companies. Um, Abhinav is, uh, uh, is asking, what is the timeline you envision for completely non-animal ingredient-based tissue culture meat. Um, well, that's that's that, that's happening already. So we've we've developed a growth medium. If you if you check out the blog on our website, um, we've created growth medium that um, uh, doesn't use any animal components yet, and in some instances, it even performs better than 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 using medium with uh, with animal components. So it is possible. Um, of course, we there is a lot of work to do. So we need to get the cost uh, down further. Um, uh, we need to make it at higher volumes, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of scientific and more mechanical engineering challenges that that are ahead of us. But um, we believe that to make real meat, you, you need to start with the, the first animal cells. But the rest of the process to be sustainable and and to be um, um, you know cost uh, cost competitive. It needs to be completely, um, uh, completely uh, animal free. So, that, so it's happening, and that's that's the exciting part. More and more of these pieces of the puzzle have been have been created. Um, and and I if, coming back to how are we different from others in the in the industry? We are uh, 
we are all taking different routes. We're selecting different types of cells. We treat them differently. Uh, we focus on different species or on different production processes. And that's the, the diversity you need to, to crack the, uh, the, the, the challenge that, that's ahead of us. It's, it's, uh, um, it's incredibly large. And, and the diversity in this group, uh, I think, is, is the key to, uh, to become an impactful, an impactful movement. If we'd only all be doing the same thing, then the niche or uh, uh. so going back to the to the chat. <clears throat> um, the timeline for a practicable price. Well, the I think the biggest um, the biggest impact on timelines is a, a regulatory approval. So even if we could make uh, very small quantities that are slightly higher price. Uh, there, there are many people that want to uh, uh, start uh, trying it, give, give feedback, so we could start learning. Um, and of course, for us as a company, it's a bit of a of a, of a dilemma. If if timelines for a regulatory approval are long, so so in Europe, uh, it's roughly a year and a half, but it could be a lot longer. There are there are examples. Of industries where um, uh, where it has taken a lot longer. Um, if we want to start that process, you want to do it with a version of uh, your burger that can actually uh, go to market for a good price. So the longer you wait, the better the product is. Um, and and we're exactly in that in that phase. Like, what is it that we can produce where we feel confident that if you go through the entire process, that that's uh, um, uh, you know a good a good initial product and. Um, from the technology industry, there's this uh, saying that if, if you're not a, a bit ashamed of your first product, you're probably not going fast enough. Like you have these clunky big cell phones and you have all these, the first versions will always be a bit uh, uh, almost ready. Um, but for food, we want to be, you know, not um, you know, piloting and see what happens. For food, it's really important that you get you get it really right. So. Um, that's the that's the, the, the phase we're in at the moment, and I know that, that others are in the same uh, having the same same discussions internally. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I got caught in the lab. So apologies if you I missed your talk, but um, okay. apologies if I already answered it. But um, so I'm wondering, you're using biopsies, right, and adult stem cells. Have, what are your reasons for that compared to using ES cells? Um, well, the, 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 I think one of, the, um, um, one of the reasons we take cells that will only become muscle cells is um, um, that it, first, it, it simplifies the, the, the process a bit. Um, and again, I, I don't, I'm not a I'm not a cell biologist, so I I, I couldn't answer that on a uh, on a very technical specific level. Um, but there's of course the different ideas about either you start with um, very early phase cells and they can become anything. They become muscle and fat and, and uh, maybe even other other tissues. Um, we for, for clarity. Uh, we we only take um, uh, a sample which contains muscle and fat, and then select the right cells for both and and grow them uh, separately. And then for minced beef, eventually you can put them together like the eighty twenty or ninety ten um, uh, components. It's um, it, it, I would have to ask Mark <laughs> uh, to get to get to, to, to get the right answer there. Um, so, what is your background? Uh, so, I'm I'm a master student, but I'm working also in stem cells, uh, yeah. neural stem cells, though. But uh, yeah, this is sort of I I find like yeah, um, clean meat uh, super interesting as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Good to see that you're, that you're into the uh, <laughs> into the space. But and I think the. Um, if I have understood the process correctly, if if you want to make sure that, the, that those very early cells really become what you want them to become, you have to really give them the right signals at the right time, 
uh, and that's all part of the uh, the growth medium and, and all the um, uh, the growth factors that are in there. Um, so I think it, it's my my responsibility to, to reduce complexity. Uh, yeah, because we, we have a lot of, we have a lot of nuts to crack. <laughs> So Victoria is asking, do you think consumers are ready for wide scale adoption of cultured meats or need more uh, education and which markets are more mature in your view? Yes, from, from research, uh, we've, we've seen that uh, the more people know about cultured meat, the more willing they are to, uh, to, to try it or to buy it and to, and to, and to pay more for it. Um, wide scale adoption, I, I don't think Adoption will be limited by uh, consumers' acceptance in the in the short term. It will probably be how much companies can produce at, at what cost. So, um, if you look at uh, uh, acceptance research uh, in, in most countries that I've seen, like these, these are European countries, this is the U.S., India, China. Uh, the majority of consumers says, "Well, I'd be willing to try it." Um, and you know, I have a background in market research. That's very high. That's very encouraging for a product that is not even on the market yet, and and that can be kind of has a weird ring to it. So I think consumer acceptance at this point is already way higher than we would need. Um, and for example, in the Netherlands, where uh, where we're from and and where the environment for cultured meat is so good, uh, the acceptance numbers are way way higher. Um, so, so in that sense, I think for for launch and for early adopters, we we'd be more than ready. And um, and longer term, if we get to the situation where there's burgers that uh, look the same, that behave the same when you cook them, that smell the same, uh, people are eating them and excited about it, then then the whole uh, role of your prefrontal cortex, which tries to predict the future and and it's risk averse. I think that that uh, that will be a process where where uh, acceptance will, will will go up. Eventually, we'd love it to be, you know, very boring to eat cultivated meat long term because we we're making the exact same thing, um, uh, just without without the downsides. And uh, the markets that are more mature, I think that that comes down to. Um, Two things like how much knowledge is there in the country? So, for example, the Netherlands is uh, doing well. I think in the U.S. and in, and in Israel, because of companies that are based there, uh, the uh, the environment is, is is good. But there's also uh, a sense of um, uh, how progressive or how traditional certain countries are when they look at look at food. So that that's something we're we're looking into at the moment. Um, because if you look at the Netherlands versus France or versus Germany or the UK, you see very uh, strong differences, but it, but they all have, have their have their unique dynamics. So um, we're mindful of those differences, and, and uh, we're working with people in different com companies that uh, are in different countries to see what is needed here to get the right levels of education in place. Um, Looking at questions regarding regulation, do you think that there will be only one first, or that every company will have to go through its own regulatory approval? Oh, because because there is such a diverse um, uh, set of companies with different approaches, the the regulatory approf of approval process is very thorough. It doesn't only look at the composition of your end product, but also your process. So each company will have to go through their own regulatory approval processes. Um, it, it, it will probably help if the first companies have gone through it and the, the concept of cell-culturing food is, um, you know, has been proven to be safe by a food authority. And I noticed that food authorities are also always looking at each other a bit, like, oh, if, if that region or country would say it's okay, then it's easier for others to also uh, follow their lead. Um, but the companies will all have to do their, their own their own process for their own products. Um, then I see a question, do you find any restrictions in terms of importing and exporting? I'm not sure I get that question. 
uh, if you can if you can clarify a bit in the chat, that would, that would be great. And I see that there is a lot going on concerning improving the product. What is needed to make the products fulfill the ecological promises, for example, for energy? Yes, there's been a lot of uh, um, there's been a lot of uh, debate about energy use, um, but for us, the, the, the process itself doesn't require um, too much energy. If we have, if we use solar panels on our roof, we can likely, you know, uh, um, uh, accommodate all our all our processes just with our own energy generation. Um, the, the the biological process itself generates heat. So, um, in our climate in the Netherlands, we would need to heat it up to body temperatures. But if you're in a very warm climate, you need to cool it down to keep it at the right uh, at the right temperatures. So, um, of course, we're not uh, pr producing a process that will uh, that will not be, you know, orders of mag magnitudes better than than the current situation. And in terms of energy use, there are these uh, projections that if we would keep using the current energy mix with fossil fuels. And you look at a timeline of maybe 400 years, then yes, it might not be better than traditional. Uh, but but yeah, these are very theoretical. And and, and once we can show our pro process and how we uh, how we care about the sustainability and uh, you know uh, prove prove the the uh, the sustainability of it, um, that will that will help a lot. Because currently, of course, you can't show it at scale yet, but uh, that's definitely something we uh, we're, we're very excited about. So, Matthias, companies like Memphis Meats are working on multiple animal products. Do you think that cow muscle cells actually will taste different from chicken, or is it only something we see in conventional meat? Well, there's there's a, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, there is likely, we're, we're, we're focusing on, on beef, so we're, we're not taste testing different species at the moment. But um, they they are likely different, just just from the species. Um, I'm, we're not convinced that within a species, so, so the cow, the boss towers, uh, the different variations there have a have a strong uh, a taste component to them. But of course, the way uh, cows are fed or where they're from, there 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 are differences in in conventional meat. Uh, and we're trying to trying to find out where that how that happens. It's likely that that happens through the fat, because most of the taste and flavors are, of course, in the fat. Um, but but how uh, how to get a sense of terroir in our beef? That's uh, uh, that's all work in progress. We probably need to uh, um, uh, need to be working on that for for quite a bit. Um, and there's lar very large differences in. Uh, in preferences across the world, and what a burger should taste like, or wh what a steak should should uh, should be like, um, but um, uh, especially on on uh, steak, I'm really excited about the, the the opportunities there because it feels already a bit old-fashioned to uh, brute force, for example, uh, 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 the marbling of fat in an animal by feeding it something specific in the last fattening phase of breeding them um, while with cultivated meat you can you can just choose what marbling you would like and and, and, and go with that or, or or not add mature collagen so that it's become super tender so after burgers and minced meats i'm very excited about the, the prospects of really creating the highest quality um, uh, steaks because that's that's uh, where these factors also, what kind of terroir from from fat and taste should should we should we have? So first, get the scale with a simpler product. Ultimately, we uh, we definitely are looking into things like this. Um, Maria is asking, are the principles of cir circular economy already relevant or considered? Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So um, because we want the the process to be. Um, to be able to scale to planetary size, we were always optimizing for uh, ingredients for the growth medium, for example, that uh, that are available at, at very, very large scale. Um, 
uh, highly commoditized. But um, there are, for example, waste streams uh, of, for example, breweries that that also that are also protein rich, um, and where uh, you know in, in certain situations it would completely make sense to to repurpose the the waste streams from one industry to uh, input from another industry. Or you know, there's um, uh, when when eggs get peeled, uh, there's this little skin in there that is also su super um, um, high in protein. All these opportunities are there because I think one of the cool things in cellular agriculture is that cells can eat many different types of, uh, of nutrients and we're not tied to one specific type of crop or one specific uh, type of protein. So that, that makes it uh, inherently more flexible to, be, to play a part in a circular economy. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. Kevin. Um, everybody is trying to find the most efficient road to market. Who are the consumers you think your product uh, will address better at launch? There's, there's, um, uh, if you're interested in this topic, Cor, uh, um, uh, who's uh, also uh, speaking later, and um, um, and uh, um, uh, Chris Bryant, um, they have uh, quite some good uh, papers about about acceptance, and what you're seeing is that. Um, yes, um, the more you know about it, it's, I, I guess the, the biggest uh, predictor of, of acceptance, but you see that um, when people are uh, higher educated or from the cities or um, uh, uh, I think flexitarians, uh, omnivores are a bit more accepting than uh, vegetarian or vegans. Um, there's a couple of background variables for uh, for, for people that are more likely to adopt it. But um, yeah, as I, as I said, we, we really are keen to not keep it to a, a first group of early adopters, uh, which is even happening with, with plant-based at the moment. If, if your prices are higher than traditional beef, then it, you run the risk of addressing the people that, um, uh, that are willing to spend more, that are highly uh, aware and, and uh, willing to change their their habits based on on the on the, on the, the impact of meat consumption, um, we think that price is maybe the the, the best way to go more mainstream, uh, and and uh, and the, the early adopter groups are are large enough to accommodate that step towards uh, scalability because that's that's really really a, a strong drive internally to make sure that we get to that point and, and not stop halfway there and it stays kind of a, a token uh, uh, a token consumption for people that spend more on this niche product. Uh, the, the scale of it is really uh, uh, what drives us. Um, let's see, the cheapest beef in a supermarket is, is not the same as an Angus beef. This is due to also the animal welfare diet and lifestyle, epigenetics then play a part into how this meat turns out. If you get a cell from an Angus beef, can you control that the texture stays the same? Um, well, we, we've tried different uh, uh, types of animals, different uh, um, uh, different breeds, but um, uh, we we didn't notice much difference in how these cells then grow. So much of the, the difference is how an animal is then shaped and moves and is fed and. There are many, many um, differences that, that shape um, also the quality then of the meat. Um, and some of these names are also kind of uh, uh, dubious in how they would really describe the quality of the meat. So um, so for Black Angus, uh, if, I, if I understood correctly, there's kind of a rule that says, oh, if it's 51% black hair, the cow, then you can call it black Angus. And there, there, there's a, um, how people perceive a specific piece of meat is not only the, 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 the cell structure and the composition of the meat, it's also how, how, they, um, uh, how they perceive that meat, if that, uh, if that makes sense. Um, 
Elwin is, talk, is asking, you touched on production at planetary scale. Can you comment on the business and scientific strategies for achieving that goal? Well, to start with the scientific strategies, uh, this is exactly what, what the founders have been working on for over 15 years. Um, everything has been um, done with scalability in mind. So even if, we, if we're designing our own uh, machines, we're thinking about, oh wait, is there enough of steel in the world to to make all these bioreactors, for example, or um, what could be bottlenecks to do this at at, uh, at a planetary scale, um, wh which is exciting, um, but also puts us puts us a bit in, into context. So one of our calculations was that uh, you would roughly need the production capacity um, uh, of the current wine industry, so the amount of uh, tanks, fermentation tanks uh, that produce all the wine in the world. Roughly that size of an industry is needed to produce all the meat in the world. And then I think, okay, that's that's something I can I, I can I can get behind. Um, so and then for the business goals, uh, yeah, it, it's that that's that's basically the, the companies that can make a high quality product, which is something that people love currently. That it's very big meat market, the product that people love, uh, high quality, at large volumes for a low price. I think those are the companies from a business perspective that will do well. So we're focusing on those um, on those three. How can you get the best beef at a, at a high, high, high scale for a low price? And I think most most companies are, are doing that. And the ones that actually execute well on that will do well as a business because they then um, provide value to, to consumers. Um, and then I, I think I skipped one from Matthias. He says, to my understanding, regular meat is composed of muscles, fat, and blood. You mentioned uh, blood and fat. I think I mentioned uh, muscle and fat. Have you considered including blood cells in your product to improve the taste? Uh, yes, so there is, um, in the process of, um, the process that these cells uh, go through, the, the the last part where these cells fuse together, they differentiate really into muscle, uh, um, and and when they're happy, as as the team often uses their key metric, um, they start as expressing protein, and and they, they can also start expressing uh, myoglobin, which you know uh, um, uh, would would give the red color um, uh, is a bit you know, blood like. It's the is the counterpart um, uh, uh, of uh, uh, hemoglobin, if I'm, cor if I'm correct, then quote me on the, uh, on the terms, but, but that, that, would, that would be the, the, the bloody part of, um, uh, of the process. So yes, it, yes, it's important, and, but, and there's more that happens, of course, when, when these cells really mature and when they really become meat. So in the first phase, getting from some stem cells to many stem cells, then you're not making meat yet, is that that second part where they differentiate, where you know that's where you get the chew and that's where you get all the uh, all the nutrient nutritional value and all the goodness. That's where it, be, where it becomes meat, um, you know. And that's that's what you want because then um, if you have then the same end product, if you have the same meat, then it will behave the same when you cook it. So when in 2013 we were cooking it. Uh, these taste testers confirmed like, oh yeah, this is you know, unmistakably meat. And, and the whole Maya response with you know, the, the, whole bio, the whole chemical reaction of um, flavors and aromas forming you know, with the amino acids and the sugars and, and the, the fat melting, that, that whole process will be uh, the same as traditional be uh, beef because you start with the same building blocks. So the less we, we uh, use uh, plant-based ingredients, the more we use exactly the same, um, uh, end up with exactly the same product, the more it will, will behave and taste and smell the same as, uh, as traditional, uh, traditional meat. Let me check out the time. I have no idea <laughs> how much time we have, but uh, more than willing to, uh, uh, to keep going if there's, if there's any more questions.
and if not, um, I want to thank you for your uh, for your for your time. Feel free to reach out to me personally. I have my um, uh, my de contact details on the slide. I'll put them in the chat here too. If you if there's anything you want to um, uh, ask me more privately, or if you have any other comments or suggestions, then uh, uh, reach out um, and, and and enjoy the rest of the program. There's a lot of exciting uh, things over the horizon, and I'm really excited to see all the all the different speakers for the rest of the day. Um, thanks again. I hope we'll be in touch. Cheers, everyone. Je voudrais grandir dans un monde où règne la douceur et la gentillesse. Où tout le monde est traité avec respect. Un monde où il n'y aurait plus de cages, plus d'abattoirs. Un monde sans cruauté et sans violence. Un monde où les animaux ne souffriraient plus pour nous nourrir. Je sais que ce monde est possible, je le sens dans mon cœur et je vois ce monde dans mes rêves. Je sais que ce monde est possible si on se lève pour ceux qui ne peuvent pas se défendre. Si on apporte de l'espoir à ceux qui n'en ont plus. Si on transforme la violence en douceur. Cet avenir peut devenir réel si nous agissons tous aujourd'hui. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today at Kind Earth Tech event. My name is Susanne Wiegel and I'm investment manager for Alternative Proteins for Food at Nutrico. Nutrico is a leading global animal nutrition company. We are headquartered in the Netherlands and we are also owned by the largest family business holding of the country, SHV. Nutrico is feeding any animal species that you can imagine, from livestock over pets to marine species like fish um, and shrimp, for example. Throughout our business, innovation is really a key focus. As example, um, Nutrico uh, is the largest producer of salmon feed in the world, and our aquaculture division, Scratting, has invented a new fish feed that um, contains only vegetable proteins and is not dependent any longer on fish meal. So essentially, Scratting has turned the carnivore species salmon into a vegetarian. But we are not only looking at innovation within our core business. We are also looking beyond. And this is why we have um, established an innovation and investment arm called New Frontiers. And I am dedicated to alternative proteins for food within New Frontiers. So one can ask the question why an animal feed company bothers at all about alternative proteins for food. And just to be clear here, it's food, it's not feed. Alternative proteins for feed are very important too to us, but I am focused on the food side. And so the answer to this is that Nutrico is really a family owned forward looking business that truly cares about how we are feeding the future generations. We all know about the nutritional dilemma. We have to feed double the population over the, last, uh, uh, the next decades with half the resources of our planet. And so at Nutrico, we take this challenge really seriously, and we know that this also requires new ways of how to make protein in comparison to how we have done it so far. We believe there will be still a demand for animal-based protein, and so we are also focusing very much on sustainability in the traditional animal protein value chain. However, we also need to explore other ways how to make meat and seafood. And this is where we feel uh, alternative proteins will play a key role. And we want to be part of this momentum. So the growth of these new forms of proteins, of course, likely will impact our existing value chain and business. And that is something we would like to understand. But 
more so, we believe that it will actually be um, a new business opportunity for Nutrico. So we want to get involved to help develop the technologies and leverage this opportunity that alternative proteins actually presents. And uh, we do think that what we are good at in the animal protein value chain is actually of relevance for this new alternative protein value chain. So, for example, sourcing and supply chain management of raw materials, nutritional formulation of protein products, protein characterization, processing like extrusion, for example. And also we understand in general food and feed regulation, quality control and operations very well. And so the approach we chose to be close to these new alternative protein companies is through investments and partnerships. Nutrico dedicated a 20 million euro fund to alternative proteins and we are in, uh, investing across the various technologies from cell-based over fermentation-based to plant-based startups. Um, the companies that we are considering need to have a B2B business model, at least ultimately, um, and they really need to be technology focused because this is what our business model is and we believe that Nutrico as a strategic partner can add best value to these kind of startups and scale-ups. And um, one area where we feel uh, we can bring specifically um, obvious value to the table is really cell-based protein. And this is why we have started investing in that um, area. So first, uh, we have invested into Blue Nalu and Mosa Meat. Mosa Meat is one of the first um, cultured meat companies founded in 2015 and it's based in Maastricht uh, in the Netherlands. And as you know, of course, very well, very well Chief Scientific Professor uh, Mark Post was the one who produced the first cell-based hamburger and presented it to a wider audience in 2013. Then in 2015, the startup was founded and is now really one of the leading uh, cultured meat companies in Europe. Um, Mosami just raised a, a, a spectacular Series B and uh, with these funds um, they will uh, make a first uh, commercial production uh, facilities and um, uh, get to market entry. And we also invested across the ocean into Blue Nalu. Blue Nalu is a San Diego-based uh, startup developing um, cell-based seafood. What we like particularly about them is their um, technology platform that allows for multiple species seafood. Um, and also like Mosa Meat, they are preparing for the upscaling and the commercial entry. Hi, my name is Armanda and for the past 10 years, I've been working on a protein transition. But as you all know, it's quite a challenge and it's not going fast enough. So two years, I decided to do something which was quite out of my comfort zone. I joined the biggest political party here in the Netherlands. And a lot of people who are dealing with sustainability do not really trust this party on making the best sustainable decisions because this party is quite conservative. So I figured there was a lot to gain from this experience. And quite quickly, I noticed that the protein, protein transition was not on their agenda. They just didn't really see the urgency 
and the benefits from this, the economic possibilities. So I, I did put it on the agenda, but at the same time, you see that a lot of farmers are active members as well, which figures because a lot of them are quite rich and quite smart. And this party is kind of the rich people party. So it's actually quite logical. And you see how huge this influence from these farmers actually is. Since a year or a year and a half, we have the nitrogen crisis here in the Netherlands. The court decided that we have to lower the nitrogen deposition. And the biggest source of the nitrogen is, of course, animal farming. So what did our government do? They made people drive slower and construction did not get permits this easily anymore. And that is a big problem because we have too few houses. We do not have enough houses here in the Netherlands. So we need more construction, not less. And the weird thing is that the construction does not even account for a half percent of this nitrogen deposition, a half percent. And traffic, meanwhile, we had to drive slower, you know, 6%. And animal farming, 46%. And then also 30% comes from abroad. And of course, a big part of that is also from animal farming. But what this, did this big, biggest political party say about animal farming? We will not reduce animal farming, not even with one cow or one pig. And that's kind of crazy. So you think, all oh, right, well, is this such a huge vital economic sector then? No, it's not. The total agriculture accounts only for 1.4% of the Dutch domestic product only 1.4%. So it's it's actually a tiny economic sector. So why is this so important? More important than building houses or driving fast, which a lot of people love. So you see how irrational these decisions are and that's purely because of the influence of these farmers, which are completely invested in this these parties. You see that in the Dutch parliament, the person that is dealing with agriculture for this party is married to a dairy farmer. And the person in the European parliament, which is in the agricultural commission, commission and the environmental commission is also a, an ex dairy farmer. He's the son of dairy farmers. So, well, that, that's bound to go wrong, right? And you see that in the Agricultural Commission of the Euro European Parliament, most people are, most politicians are farmers. So while all the eyes were on the veggie ban, which of course did not come through, which is awesome. Uh, at the same time, a lot of money was allocated to the European farmers, almost 400 billion euros for the next seven years without any conditions for nature or climate. So that is a huge, huge, huge win for the agricultural lobby. And if you know anything about this lobby, you're like, oh my gosh, it's like a conspiracy, but it isn't. As you see, it is a culture, it is a system. And what happens, and I see this happening up close, is that the party just hears a story of all these farmers, which are members and are even politicians within these parties, and they are viewed as the experts. Well, I think I and a lot of other people, all the people from the NGOs have more expertise because they also know about nature and the climate and all those effects. But all these farmers are really the experts within these parties and these smart people from the NGOs, they are outsiders. But now I was on the inside and we did book success with this big political party. I must say, I really feel at home at this party. They really surprised me. They have beautiful core values. They have really awesome people. 
Um, but still, overall decisions are quite irrational. But we did book success for cultured meat. And the Minister of Agriculture was really opposed to, agri to cultured meat, but now she has to work on it. The parliament decided that, sh that she has to come up with an action plan. So I see up close how easy it is to influence politics from the inside. Those farmers are on the inside. Another example I can mention is in France, perhaps you know this. Uh, in France, it is illegal to name a meat substitute after meat. And you can get a fine of 300,000 euros for this. Who proposed this? It was a farmer, a, a cattle farmer, who is in the parliament for the biggest political party, the party of President Macron. This is the party with the most influence, so it's quite easy to get these proposals accepted if you are in the biggest, most influential parties. So everyone who it has been campaigning for a lot of years, just like me, uh, to change something in our food production system, I would like to advise you to try this. Become a member of a political party. It doesn't even have to be the biggest party, but let it be a party who is not yet as insightful on agriculture, who doesn't really see the urgency and the benefits of this protein transition yet. You, all, everybody here, I think everybody's watching has a lot of knowledge. And I would say use that knowledge, become an insider and yeah, see how easy it is to influence politics and to create change. So, and if you need any help with that, please let me know. I would love to help you with this because I found these two years really awesome. Um, and I want to keep on doing this. So it's been a great experience and I would say, go and do this too. <laughs> hey everyone, um, great talk there on how to influence um, organizations from the inside, which of course sometimes we have to do, um, not only on a macro level, but also on a micro level in you know our everyday environments. I think the key part of you know what Armanda just mentioned was that the farmers were on the inside, um, which you know would be very difficult for anyone to create change without also being on the inside. Um, in terms of the, the overall topic, it's something that I encourage not only my immediate circle, but you know people that I meet online to, to explore and to do, um, to, to find out what's actually going on, to come up with actionable solutions and to see how to create influence in that way. Um, in terms of you know being a stakeholder, there are many ways to do that. There's many ways to, to you can volunteer. Um, a lot of the times, um, companies who are looking for finances is that that is also a big part. And um, finding out that the farmers had that influence because of their finances was also not very um, should not a very um, surprising um, point that was made also um, because a lot of the times you know finances do um, create or um, spark the focus for political change. Next we're going to be going over to Claire Smith who is the managing um, director at Beyond Animal and Claire is going to be discussing the importance of cruelty-free investing. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Ira and Damien Demoy. It's really nice to be with you um, this morning. Um, I'm here to talk about cruelty-free investing, which has been my life for the last several years and would have been for earlier if it had been possible to actually invest cruelty-free. And this was a need that I felt was in the market when I myself um, took over the running of a pension scheme, um, which uh, I, had, uh, I had been part of in the 1990s. Um, and found that it was impossible to actually find any cruelty-free funds into which I could put this pension scheme because the pension scheme required 
the, that required it to go into fund vehicles that other asset managers were running. So this led me to think about whether I should create my own asset management business. And this is what I did in 2017 with the Beyond Investing uh, platform. Um, I think what's important to, uh, of which Beyond Animal is a part, um, I think what's important, important to note is, is, is how people in, invest and how they need to be invested across different elements of the market. Um, it's not the case that you can put all your money into fast, you know, growing startups, uh, you know, companies that are being incubated in this space. What you need to do is to think about an allocation of, um, of, of your portfolio in a way that's going to enable you to have money in the future for various needs, maybe your kid's school or your retirement, et cetera. And this is how people need to think about investing. I know the startups are fabulous and we will we'll come onto those later, but we do need to think about the rest of your portfolio um, and the impact that that can have. I always say there are three C's in terms of how a person can interact with the world and have influence on what is going on in the world. Um, and these are uh, consumer, citizen and capital. So as a consumer, I'm so sure all the vegans amongst us and the non-vegans as well who want to act sustainably are shifting away from uh, meat consumption or have removed it entirely um, and, uh, and are doing other things that are important in their lives. Maybe they're buying electric vehicles or putting solar on their on their house or or sorting out their trash. Um, it's important that you also do that with your money. So clean up your money in the same way as you clean up your consumption. And as Amanda was speaking about before, clean up also your politics. Uh, think about what the parties that you, uh, you vote for um, stand for, sign petitions, get involved in other types of actions, um, you know, the, the campaigns such as Extinction Rebellion, um, 350.org, etc who are, are trying to, uh, to move us towards a sustainable um, transition. But the other one is capital. And capital is so important because, as I always say, what gets financed gets done. And conversely, if something doesn't get financed, then it will not get done. And that's important to note. Um, as Amanda was saying, a lot of the lobbying um, by the, the industry of meat does mean that they get a lot of support from government, some 25%, I believe, of the European, of the EU budget, and similarly large amounts, about 100, 100 billion in, in the US. Um, if, if the politics doesn't change, then the money is not going to go towards plant-based businesses, and it's going to continue to support the meat industry. Anyway, let's get back to capital we can all act with our capital. Even if you don't have a personal investment portfolio, most likely your employer is contributing on your behalf into your pension fund. And so you can lobby your employer to um, impose cruelty-free screens on the pension money or find a manager who will. But as I said, there was no manager doing this. So I created an asset management company in order to do this um, and launched the US Vegan Climate ETF in 2019 which was based on a cruelty-free index, which we created in 2018. So that's been running for over two years now. And this index is taking out animal exploitation um, and other environmentally unfriendly practices, such as fossil fuel, burning of fossil fuel, um, single-use plastics, um, plus um, other aspects of animal exploitation besides animal agriculture, such as animal testing. So it is genuinely cruelty-free. Um, so that's been trading since September 2019, but I often get asked, why is the ETF full of technology stocks? Well, technology stocks are huge, and if you're trying to mimic a market index, if you're trying to create something and give somebody, give investors the opportunity to put their money into the general equity market, but avoid taking those exposures to animal products, um, then it, you're, you are going to be left with the other stocks that are there that do pass our screens. And so there is a bias towards technology simply because they're the largest stocks in the market. And frankly, the S&P 500 index, which is you know, the benchmark for the large, largest stocks in the market, is also very heavy in technology these days. It's just the way the world has gone. And this has led to outperformance for our index because those technology stocks have outperformed, whereas fossil fuel stocks have fallen, as have animal agriculture stocks and a lot of stocks in the leisure industry. But we do have a solution as well for people who want to invest in public equities that, of, uh, that are more vegan relevant. 
And that is a strategy which we will be launching very shortly called the Vegan World Strategy, which uh, takes a, a universe of, of stocks that are below 10 billion in size um, and constructs a, a basket, which is around 30 to 50 stocks, which are companies which are making products that are relevant to the transition. So are within those sectors where animal exploitation is the most prevalent. And that would be within the areas of uh, consumer products, food products, clothing products, toiletries, some materials companies, as well as um, agricultural products, which are for humans to eat, as opposed to being grown for animals to eat and then be eaten themselves. Um, and uh, any, any just general sort of fruit and vegetable wholesale production type stocks, because obviously we hope that everybody will start eating a lot more veggies. Um, so that's, that uh, is, is a new strategy that will be launched soon, and that will enable people to get this more targeted exposure to vegan stocks um, and, uh, and participate from the growth in those stocks because people are switching into um, eating and using those kind of products which are, which are kind to animals and more sustainable. Now, I know it's exciting to talk about startups, so I'll just do a few minutes on, on this now, which is uh, to talk a little bit about the portfolio which, uh, which I started building in 2017, um, and uh, that now has 23 stocks in it, um, which are spread across cellular agriculture, other types of alternative protein like the, um, the precision fermentation, plant-based um, companies uh, that are creating ingredients and also creating um, companies all the way through to the consumer or, or food service. And I've also got some cruelty-free um, stocks in there with an animal testing alternative, an alternative uh, to collagen in the cosmetics market, um, a food uh, testing company and a vegan leather company as, as well, vegan leather clothing company. Um, and uh, I, I felt that it was important to put money into this space. As I said, what gets financed gets done. And so as a seed investor, sometimes the first investor into some of these companies, I guess my money has been quite crucial in terms of creating those companies to start with. For example, one of those companies since their, the launch of their product in 2019 has saved the lives of over a thousand pigs because they're creating pepperoni slices, which can go on pizzas. Um, and, uh, and the quantity that they've sold has, has, has made it possible for people to choose that in instead of choosing, um, choosing to eat pork. I know that not everybody wants to put their money into a venture capital vehicle. And indeed, venture capital may not be the appropriate type of financing for many kinds of, of companies in any case, if they're not fast growing companies that want to have an exit. And it's for this reason that we've created the Beyond Animal platform in order to bring a wider range of financing options to companies and also bring the opportunity to invest directly in these companies to a wider universe. Um, my, 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 my fund is something of a micro VC, but I would like to see a lot more money go into this space and a lot more people be able to participate. Um, and uh, that's why we've created Beyond Animal in order that people can be shown deals that are appropriate to them, that are within regula regulatory guidelines, of course, but to a wider range of people. And we will be, be uh, launching that uh, facility to uh, look at deals um, and to, um, to um, enter like into this area sure. shortly. Thanks um, very much for listening. It's been great to, uh, great to be with you today. And I'll join the breakout in order to answer your questions. Hello, hi. Hi. Um, hi. People, do I have? I think there's nine people. Okay, yeah, there's a few people joining. So uh, we have. Uh, yeah, it would be helpful if you could uh, maybe introduce yourself if you can speak, Vincent, and anybody else. Yeah, well, uh, I'm Vincent Dudé from France, and I'm a vet by training, and I'm interested in uh, cellular agriculture for a long time now. Okay. Uh, I had exactly the same question as Didier uh, mentioned in the chat that uh, whether you could explain about your free. Yeah. Okay. Certainly. Okay. So, um, yeah, essentially what we've done is that we've created a, a, a sort of stock selection process, which is um, uh, trying to remove 
the um, exposure to uh, uh, causes of animal exploitation um, from, from an index. So if you look at the S&P 500, which we've used as a base for the um, US product, which we've launched, um, there are 500 stocks in the, in the S&P 500. And of those 500 stocks, we actually end up uh, taking out almost half. Why? Because um, that we have the energy sector, we have the sector of animal um, raising, but we have all of the products that go, to, go, into, um, go into that. So we are excluding things like animal feed because that's part of the ecosystem which is, um, which is exploiting animals. And then all of the stocks that are using those animal products to the extent that it's a large proportion of their, um, of their, um, their activities. Um, uh, what we are also doing is looking in the mid caps to see if we can find any stocks to replace those exposures that are actually cruelty free stocks that are not using animals. And so we are promoting into the um, mid cap, in, from the mid caps into the large cap about 20. So we end up with a portfolio that's generally about 270 to 280 stocks out of the 500. And we're generally removing about 48% of the, of the S&P 500. Uh, what we are trying to do is to also remove exposures which are kind of um, supporting that as well. So we are also removing quite a lot of banks because they have high amounts of fossil fuel exposure on their books. Some of them are heavily involved in um, um, deforestation, uh, which, is, which is mostly caused by animal agriculture. So we are trying to invest for what we call a kinder, cleaner and healthier world where some of these damages to the environment are, are not occurring. We hope that by creating this product, we will be able to show that people can invest according to these principles, but still receive a, a market-like return. Um, and in addition to that, we hope that the companies will realize why they're not in the index and figure out that they need to change their practices. Does, does that help? Yeah, but uh, do I get it right that anything has to, that has to do with actual farming is re is included in your uh, animal cruelty? Actual farming? Uh, no, not if it's killing any animals. No, it's removed. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And um, hello. Yes, hi, hi. Is that hi, Nicola? Can you, hello. Can, can you hear me and see me? Yeah, I can. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm, um, thank you for the presentation. It was, it was very interesting. So hello, Vincent. Hello, Claire. I don't know if there are many over. Right. Um, so I'm Nicolas Tresch. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a researcher in economics. I, I work mm -hmm. in Toulouse in the southwest of France, the area where they produce foie gras in France. Um, and so I'm, uh, I'm doing uh, research in, um, in different fields, in particular environmental economics. It's some uh, it's been a couple of years I've been working on uh, animals and um, economics of animal welfare, veg mm -hmm. vegetarianism and so on. One of my colleagues, by the way, in Toulouse is a Nobel Prize in economics. And uh, so we have, a, we have a fairly visible economic department and we have a big chair in sustainable mm -hmm. finance mm -hmm. with many banks, uh, all the important banks in France. And we develop, uh, we present them research about sustainable finance and mm -hmm. um, corporate social responsibilities and I want to push the topic of uh, of uh, vegan uh, funds uh, corporate social, social responsibility practice in, in favor of, of more and an animal friendly products so I'm to do that I need more information I need mm -hmm. to, um, to understand better what you do uh, what others do on the, on the field to understand better the method because uh, the key is the, is the method how do you compute and excludes some uh, companies mm -hmm. and uh, I, it would be very interesting for me also to know what has been done so far in terms of studies i don't think there are any publication about this but in academia but it could be so anyway i'm just happy to discuss with you and my objective here is to uh, get more information uh, okay all right well i mean obviously we have created uh, policies around this which are dictating what companies stay in and what companies are excluded um, the policies, as I mentioned, do take into uh, account animal testing for any reason um, and also everything to do with animal products. So the entire supply chain of animal products from, from what the animals get uh, get fed, if it's, um, let's say, so for ex as, exa as an example, we tend to exclude uh, companies uh, like Bungie whose, are, whose products are mainly used for animal feed. 
So we're, we're excluding down through the supply chain into the, um, obviously the companies that are directly raising the animals and, uh, and, uh, and, and killing them, so meat packers. Um, and then the, where those products go. So um, companies that have um, clothing, which is wool-based, for example, uh, leather, shoes, everything to do with that supply chain is, is, is removed. Um, and so it, it is quite stringent, I would say. We are taking out far more of the index than, than, than most ESG products. I see us being within that ESG format, but adding this additional animal exploitation screen onto the ESG format, which does lead to quite a large amount of exclusions, particularly in sectors such as the consumer sector, where um, animal products are, are in, in almost everything, frankly. Um, because we call it US Vegan Climate Index, we are actually also taking out climate unfriendly and environmentally unfriendly stocks as well, um, because we felt that it didn't make any sense to be excluding animal exploitation, but retaining within the index fossil fuel companies that are destroying the natural world and hence killing wild animals. Um, we also felt that there was probably a crossover in our audience, that many vegans are environmentalists and many environmentalists are becoming vegan. So there was a, there was obviously a, a sort of match up there. Another point, obviously, is that these practices are, just, animal agriculture is actually destroying the climate as well. So the vegan aspect is also um, uh, beneficial to the to the climate if people if more people were to go vegan so that's that was the philosophy of combining these two elements together to inform our, our policies so do, are you transparent about the exact method you you are using so well, it's, like, yes, we've, can, we've, can you share documents yes i mean you know are we going to uh, you know our, our screens and our determinations are our intellectual property. So it's not as if we just suddenly are just going to publish on a website everything. That having been said, um, we have an obligation because we have an SEC registered product, which is on the New York Stock Exchange, to put up a website, the veganetf.com. And on that website, we describe in in uh, broad terms what our methodology is and we also provide a prospectus and the prospectus has in a legal format what the the principles are in our in our exclusions and then also we are required on a daily basis to disclose all our holdings and so you could look at the holdings every day you can go to the website and you can download them they won't change from one six months to the next we have a rebalance every six months and so yet they will change in june and december so you will see them change around the fourth or fifth of uh, fourth of December. There will be a new a new index um, created, and the ETF in, uh, overnight will switch into that uh, that new index. But so we are transparent on the holdings of the index. Yes, effectively through having the ETF. Thank you. We can also provide. I mean, the Selective is calculating independently from us the ETF. You can look on their website and you can see the track record of the ETF live. We also do have a back test, but we're not allowed to publish that, but we may be able to provide it to you for academic purposes. Wonderful. So um, can we follow up? Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, um, I can put um, uh, in the chat, I can put my email address so you can drop okay, me a line. Wonderful. Oh, hang on, I've got, made a mistake. I don't even see where is the chat. Um, maybe if I send more pop up. Ah, yeah, yeah. Can so I got in it. session so and then on the right hand side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can copy it. Sure. So thank you very much, Claire. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It's very clear. I think it's, your, it's wonderful. And thank you very much. It's very, it's very good to be in touch with you. And uh, oh, you may be interested to know I've invested in a company which is creating cellular poika. Oh, we uh, gourmet. Yes, yeah. I don't okay. know if you know. I, I'm, 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 do, I'm doing uh, research with them. We oh, are cool. uh, estimate. We are currently estimating the willingness to pay for uh, culture foie gras. Ah, interesting. Okay, okay. cool. Well, then we've okay, got something so... else to talk about as well. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, have a nice day. Thank Thanks you. so much. Okay. Um. I think there may be some other people. I think Anne, did you join? Does anybody else want to answer, uh, ask any questions? 
Maria, are you here? Please uh, jump in and ask questions or um, put a question in the chat if you if you prefer not to speak and I'll try and answer it. Okay, um, thanks Vincent uh, for joining. Marta, you have a question? Please, uh, please give me a, a, just put it in the chat or maybe um, go on screen if you, if you can, I'm not sure how, but uh, um, what's, your, what's your question, Marta? Jakob, uh, do you have any questions? Please, your question. Marta. Okay. All right. Platform for making the. Oh yes, that's right. The Beyond Animal platform. Unfortunately, I. I mean, I talked too much at the beginning, um, but uh, I didn't get onto the the point, or I did. I didn't get onto the point that the Beyond Animal platform is not only for um, being able to access investments, and that's basically our business model is going to be to provide a deal management activity. Um, for people that want to invest in this area. But we've basically built a front end, which is in a way a kind of funnel for the, the investment activity, but is has its own value as well, which is to be um, uh, effectively a LinkedIn for uh, the vegan business community um, and anybody who wants to be involved in that. And in fact, consumers that want to find vegan businesses that they can, um, that they can um, you know, buy from and find their products and, and help and help them and support them with their consumer activity as well as their um, as well as their capital. So yes, the Beyond Animal platform, and I'm not sure if I can share my screen at this point or get into it, but uh, if you go to www.beyondanimal.com, you register very simply, it takes like less than two minutes and uh, create your profile and then you could go and visit all of the activities on the platform. We have an events listing, we have a jobs board, um, and uh, we have, um, uh, no, Marta, it's got lots of other things. It's not just investment focus. Um, we have an events listing, a jobs board. We have a lot of resources that are being shared by people on the platform as and ourselves. We try and put up anything that we find to be interesting in this area, any research reports, news articles. But we automatically have a news feed that's coming in from 70 different channels, news channels that is about vegan businesses, vegan products, um, news, you know, political news that is related to the vegan space, like the veggie ban. Um, and, uh, and so there's an enormous amount of resources. And what's great about it, which the mainstream platforms like LinkedIn and Facebook don't have, is that we're categorizing everything and date stamping everything. So every time that something is put into the platform, its date is stamped, the category of type of material it is, is it a video, is it a podcast, is it an article, is it a research report, and the um, area of activity, so is it something to do with finance and investment, or vegan products, or um, community aspect, or any, any kind of like tag, um, we are categorizing, and so then you can go in and you can find the things that interest you the most by, um, by selecting through the filters. And you can go back and say, oh, well, I was on holiday in August, so maybe I didn't see anything. So you can go back and, and see what was posted then. Um, we do have groups as well. So with groups are getting more active. The groups are based around either places or different types of activities or interests like veganic farming, vegan fashion, um, cellular agriculture, um, all, all, types of, all types of groups. Algae, we've got one for. Um, so there's there's lots of opportunities to join groups and meet other people that are interested in the same thing as you're interested in on the platform. So this is basically the resource platform, the knowledge library, connections, and all the activities that are going on in this area. And if you're interested in investment, we have the ability for companies to place a fundraise registration, which we will then analyze against the interest from the investors that are registered with our platform and advise whether the company could successfully raise on our platform based on the, the indications of interest that we have from the investors. And then they will then be able to pass be passed through to a deal management platform where we will undertake the deal, um, you know, 
uh, and, and, and help the company raise, raise money. Uh, as opposed to VCs who are only interested in one specific thing, what we're doing is uniting the VC community on that platform. And in addition to that, we're working with other types of providers to provide other types of financing as well. And so one of these is supply chain financing because vegan companies, especially given that they're, that they're very young, often really struggle to get bank financing because they have a very short track record, even though their revenues are increasing. And so we're supplying, what we're doing is we're looking into supply chain financing solutions in order that they can finance their production and increase the amount of production that they, that they have without having to go to a VC and sell parts of their company in order to grow their business. And we think that that's going to be very valuable because it will keep the founders in control of their company for longer. I'd be very happy to catch up with anybody after the event. Um, you, you can either call, contact me on the Beyond Investing. If it's to do with the public funds, then please contact me on the claire.smith Claire at beyondinvesting.com. Um, if it is actually about uh, the um, other types of financing and uh, the uh, connections platform, then what I would like you to do is to contact me on this one, which is claire at beyondanimal.com. And that's uh, that's uh, the best way to get in contact with me if you want to know more about the connections um, and humanity platform, as we're calling it. So connections, events, jobs, resources, news feeds, lots of activity groups, the LinkedIn for vegans and vegan businesses and the um, uh, deal management side of things, which will be launching very shortly. If you're interested in asset in, in, in raising money or getting some kind of financing, that's the place to go. And we have. On the front page, we have a very simple form for you to register um, in order that we can assess what we, how we can help you, whether we can put you in touch with, uh, with, uh, with people directly or, um, or, or enter, allow you to enter our deal management platform and, uh, and run the raise for you. Is there a specific investment phase I'm focusing on pre-seed? Yes, I have invested pre-seed. Uh, the current um, vehicle that I have is closing, and I'm, I'm just doing a couple more um, investments, but mainly the money is going into the, is follow-on investments to the companies that I've already um, invested in. Um, the new Beyond Impact Fund will be uh, launched um, in January. Um, so we, we hope that we'll be kicking off with a new round of, of investments then. Um, and as I said, the Beyond Animal platform is aiming to unite all of the investors that are interested in this area on one platform to see the deals that are coming through and uh, ensure that the companies have a far easier time raising money. Um, so that could be any type of size of financing, although we think that basically what we will find is that the main financing will go on between the areas of say $200,000 up to about $5 million. That's where we think that there's the most need and where frankly VC funds are not stepping in as much as they could in the kind of pre-seed, seed, before bridge to series A, that area of the market is particularly difficult for companies that are that are um, wanting to grow, but are not big enough to attract the, to, to move to series A just yet, um, and have to have some proof, some revenue already in order to get the VCs interested in. And the other area, as I mentioned, is the supply chain financing, which um, is, is even hard for companies that are very easily getting equity financing. They find it impossible to get financing from, um, from the banks. Um, and, uh, and so um, we're, we're looking to route some uh, specialist financial providers through the platform in order to um, be able to um, uh, uh, fulfill that need. So I'm waiting to see if there's any other questions. Please put them in the chat. Or I think there may be some way that you can actually enter into the room as well so that it's a bit more interactive. Um, see, Ralph had a question, which I just answered. David, I know, uh, and uh, he's uh, just entered. So any, any questions uh, at all, please, please just throw them in. Um, and, uh, and I will try and answer them. Can I ask where you're all dialing in from? Are you all from Europe? Is there anybody from Asia here? 
Oh, okay. From from the Netherlands. Loans and government grants. Um, we are not at this point adding oh, loans. Yes, because as I said, the supply chain financing. So within the deal management uh, functionality, we will we, we have debt as well as equity and convertible and so in actual fact the beyond animal platform does have the ability to do crowd lending in switzerland and that's a that's a, something we'll be putting up as a public um uh, offering as it were for companies to register with us and then be able to do crowd crowd lending um and that that can occur in um, in switzerland with the um i wouldn't say approvals but the um authorizations that uh that we we you know the the the, the uh, Finma has, has has permitted us to do that. Um, so yes, loans possible. Government grants no. Um, I think that there are some specialist places where you can go for help if you if you want to go to, to for government government grants. It's not something that really very easily comes onto a platform because it's not really a commercial um, it's it's not really a commercial exercise um, and uh, and obviously. You know, it's very specific to regions. Generally, if you live in one place, you can get a government grant from that particular place. Um, what we could onboard onto the platform is advisors in terms of making those um, making those um, uh, applications for the government grants. But we're not we're not expert in that side of things. What do you recommend if you have a good plan for your business but lack a co-founder? I would recommend you to come onto the Beyond Animal platform and see if there are people on the platform that would be interested. So we have thousands of people already on the platform and a lot of those people are business people um, who are expert either in business management or in marketing or in um, some other aspects like food science. We've got uh, a number of people who are food scientists on, on the platform. There's even a, a food tech group. So depending on the type of co-founder that you want, um, I would say the, the, the platform could be, could be a good place to start. Um, you know, we have people joining, you know, every, every day. Um, and as I said, it is naturally a platform for people who are interested in um, in this space to connect, um, make, make connections, like you said, and possibly find business partners. We do have like testimonials. We have um, examples of people that have come to the platform and found a lot of sales leads. Um, and so as such, um, you know, we would encourage you to come onto the platform and uh, and make contact with them, um, with people um, on the platform who look like they might be appropriate for you based on their 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 interest or experience you can even create a resource if you want and say i'm looking for a type of co-founder and maybe put the profile up of the type of person that you're looking to um to partner with in order to launch your business okay that's great yeah yeah you create it as a resource and then you just tag it as looking for and so anybody who's also looking for things or, or wants to see what other people are looking for can can identify your resource. Thanks, Dinesh, for coming in and and uh, and putting the platform um, platform URL up, which I uh, did say earlier. But just in case somebody missed it, www.beyondanimal.com. Are there any uh, other questions from the people who are on the on the session? Yeah, do do throw them in. Um, we're also doing on beyondanimal.com, we're also doing a weekly meetup. So you have the opportunity to meet other people that are on the platform. And this is being done through a speed networking app. So if you uh, register for that, you enter the speed networking app and over the course of an hour, you meet 10 new people, which is fun. Um, and uh, these are all people that are motivated in this direction, that want to be part of the transition, play a role in this transition. Some of them are already running vegan businesses, some may be investors, some may be consultants. And it gives you the opportunity to um, increase your network in a friendly and fun way. How would you onboard LPs to your investment vehicles, angels and individuals? Okay, I mean, up until now, um, I've been doing most mostly by reverse inquiry. I have a website. In terms of LPs to the uh, 
VC. I have a website which is www.beyondimpact.ch. And Beyond Impact is part of the Beyond Investing platform. If you go to beyondinvesting.co, there's a panel which allows you to decide if you're interested in public markets or private equity. And if you're interested in private markets, then you go through to beyondimpact.ch and you can complete a form and I will reply and tell you, and tell you what the opportunities are um, in terms of um, entering a fund. Um, as I said, uh, I just closed the last vehicle. I'm not, to act, I'm not um, adding any new investors into the vehicle that I've been running for the last uh, two, two and a bit years. Um, and uh, uh, that's because I've completed the portfolio. I don't want to increase the, the size of the portfolio anymore and, and dilute my existing investors. There will be a new version of the Beyond Impact Fund um, arriving in, uh, in the new year. Um, and um, and that would be, and, and then, and so I would, uh, I would encourage anybody who's interested to get in contact with me then. For angels and individuals, as David, um, yeah, I'm sure you know there are restrictions on who can invest into venture capital um, funds, uh, depending on where you live and what type of investor you are, what kind of assets you have. Venture capital is extremely risky. Uh, probably about 10% of companies do, you know, turn into unicorns, do extremely well. Um, and uh, you you have to allow for the fact that the majority of the portfolio may just kind of soldier on but not grow very fast and some some companies will definitely fail because there are so many hurdles to get through in order to become a large company. So it's pretty risky and that's why there are controls on who can go into these funds. Um, there are some structures which individuals which are slightly lower in terms of assets can go into. We're looking into rolling fund structures in the US um, and uh, also as I, as I mentioned um, the Beyond Animal platform is a way for people to go in and co-invest. Some of the deals that go through that platform will go into crowd raising. So we'll be attempting to get a good number of investors in from the larger investors in order that the crowd raising is possible. Um, no crowd raise takes place with no investment already being being made into the um, into the company. So what we will be trying to do is pre-filling the raise with bigger investors and then we will bring it to crowd raises um, afterwards and we may be working with other platforms or we will use our own um, regulatory um, uh, permissions in order to do that which as I said we can do in Switzerland. Thank you David, it's nice to uh, hear from you, hope all's going well, I hear it is. Just for the Europeans, I mentioned. I, I saw that Ralph had uh, had mentioned that he was from um, uh, the Netherlands. We've had difficulties in terms of the uh, ETF that we have in the US being made available to European investors, and this is entirely out of our control. It's because of regulatory differences between the European markets and the US markets. The US markets require um, only certain information to be published about a fund. The European regulators require more information than the US is prepared to accept. And so if we were to make the um, ETF available in Europe, we would have to publish that information and we would immediately get into trouble with the US regulators. So um, we have come up with a, a, a way to um, to bring the European, uh, bring the, the vegan ETF to um, to Europe, working with a, um, a company that is a uh, helping us to put out a structured uh, a note, a certificate on the index. And, uh, and uh, so we hope to be able to provide um, access to that very, very shortly. We have a mailing list, which is bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y um, backslash vegan invest, if you're interested in the um, fund products. So please register on that mailing list. Um, for Beyond Animal, simply create your profile and you will get every week our newsletter, which highlights all the exciting things that are going on on the, pla on the platform. And we, it will also keep you in touch um, with the uh, launch of the um, fundraising side um, and allow you to determine if you can join the deal management platform, which will depend on where you are, as I said, where you are, what kind of investor you are. Um, with only some investments being made available to some people, depending on that, and other investments being made available to the wider market, 
if we go into crowd raising mode on those investments. Happy to hear any other questions. I'm not sure how long we're staying on the uh, on the on the line here. How how long we have this room available to us? If anybody's in, whoever's in the chat, if uh, I'd be really interested to know what you're doing as well, what kind of work you're involved in. If you uh, if you want to share that with me. Or otherwise, just drop me a line afterwards, or go to any of the websites that I've mentioned, and um, and uh, send an email for the investing side. So Claire.Smith at BeyondInvesting.com for Beyond Animal, Claire at BeyondAnimal.com, and on Beyond Animal, you will see me on the platform. So once you've made your profile, you just put my name, Claire Smith, at the top of the screen in the search, and then you can actually connect with me there. And we have messaging. One-to-one uh, -one messaging, just like on LinkedIn, that's functioning. Um, if you want to start a chat with me, that would be great too. Obviously, we're on all the social media too. So at Beyond Invest on Twitter, Beyond Investing on Facebook and on Instagram, and the Beyond Animal is on Twitter, Facebook. Um, Instagram and the companies are also have pages on LinkedIn as well. So if you want to follow us there, but as I said, the best the best way to to uh, go about things maybe to go to the uh, beyondanimal.com and uh, and then you will see things on the platform which we then share out onto social media. So you'll get it first if you go to beyondanimal.com. And through beyondanimal.com, we've also been able to provide discounted rates to a number of um, events um, because we are partners to those events and um, working with them to provide networking functionality for those events on our platform as, uh, as well. So if there are any other event organizers that are here, please get in touch with us. Um, I'd also like to encourage anybody who has a, a company that is looking to fundraise to go to beyondanimal.com backslash fundraise dash register. Um, if you can't remember that, um, oh, Dennis has kindly put that up. If you, it, so it's also on the home screen. And if you're interested in investing, even if you're not actively investing at this point in time, register um, under, under the link, which is beyondanimal.com investor. Um, profile form or actually or investor register investor profile form now um, and that actually allows you to create an investor profile um, which we will keep and uh, keep checking to see if there may be any um, deals that could be of interest to you and we'll make you aware if there are any such deals and then you would have to uh, let us know if you would be interested to hear about those those deals because we have to do things properly from a regulatory standpoint so we can basically say we might have a deal that's interesting to you please get in touch um and so that would then create uh, a sequence of uh, of uh forms etc that you would be you would be completing um before you could then see see the deal um this is because there, there are regulatory checks you can't have the finance industry sort of just working like the sort of wild west um, and uh, and people buying into things that they shouldn't be buying into which are not suitable for them as investors um, so we have to con we have to control access to a certain degree but if you create an investor profile using the investor dash register then we will let you know if there's something that is um, that is uh, possible for us to um, to bring to your attention If there are VCs uh, also here, um, what I'd like to encourage them to do is to get in touch with us um, because we're keen to be a kind of portal for everything that's going on in terms of the investment side. Um, and if VCs are bringing deals, we want to be able to help them. Uh, if they have companies they're interested in investing in, they could bring deals to the platform and that would enable them to go ahead with that investment. Because a VC, you know, I find that myself as a VC quite often that I'm interested in a company, um, but maybe the raise is a little high, a little higher than I can invest. Um, and so that investment, that investment, I'm not going to be able to make that investment unless I can get other people 
interested in the investment as well. And so this is all going on really rather informally at the moment in terms of VC saying, well, there's something interesting here. Maybe you should take a look at it. By creating a platform and bringing those deals to the platform, we have the opportunity to, to make a lot of people who could be interested aware of, of, of a deal um, and, uh, and then get that deal accomplished a lot faster and more efficiently. Save founders uh, an enormous amount of time. And allow them, obviously, if they're saving time on their fundraising, then they're able to get on with the job and get on with producing their product and finding you know, customers to sell their product to um, instead of just going round and round talking to investors and having the same conversation over and over and over again. I wonder if there's any more comments or, or questions. I'll just put my email up again so that people don't um, have any excuse not to get in touch with me. Okay, so beyondanimal.com is the platform. And um, um, oops. Then it is reminding me that we do actually, for the investor side, have the opportunity for investors to say what SDGs they're most interested in. You're probably, you, I'm sure everybody knows the SDGs, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 of them. We think there should be one more. The 18th one is zero animal exploitation, and that's what we're about. Um, but uh, essentially, there are 17 others, and many investors are using these as a means of directing their um, impact investments. Impact investing is a an area of investing which um, which is taking into not just taking into account responsibility and avoiding companies that are doing bad things, but actually directing your investment towards things that you uh, that are going to achieve benefits to society, to the environment, um, you know, to to the world as a as a whole. Now, the SDGs provide seventeen different categories for um, for um, uh, these uh, goals. Um, they are about uh, the environment, as I said, the biosphere, life below water, life on land, climate action, clean water and sanitation. There's about another five or six, which are about society, which include good health and well-being, decent jobs, zero hunger. Um, and then there's a few at the top, which are about the economy and institutions. Um, if you have a particular interest in those SDGs, then you want to find projects that you can invest in. Um, or give grants to potentially if you're a philanthropist um, that are specifically addressing one or other of those SDGs and within the investor profile form and uh, we will be determining from our review of the um, entrepreneurs propositions um, we allow the investors to identify which SDGs they're particularly interested in and that's going to be something that's within our filtering um, to propose to them the products the projects and the, the, the fundraisers where the company is specifically addressing that SDG. By choosing to invest in vegan companies, you're already benefiting or you're already investing towards seven of the SDGs because um, the issue of animal exploitation is so heavy on the environment and society. So you're already dealing with things like biodiversity, um, climate, um, clean water, um, zero hunger, because so much of the land is being used to feed, uh, to, to grow animal feed, which is then going to animals. It's enormously inefficient. If we were using that land to directly feed people, then, uh, then they, there would be a lot less hunger in, in the world. And as I said, a lot less uh, pollution um, and, um, you know, responsible consumption and production. That's a big um, SGD, um, the, a big issue at the moment with the uh, with that SDG because of the amount of waste. So responsible consumption and production, vegan businesses are automatically less wasteful because they are not putting food into an animal's stomach to then grow an animal. If you waste animal products, you're wasting all the inputs that went into the animal, not just the animal themselves. So there's, as I said, there's, uh, there's uh, at least six or seven um, SDGs there that are directly linked to um, the issue of animal exploitation. 
And um, as such, um, you know, you're already um, checking a lot of boxes on SDGs, but maybe you want to add other ones as well. And there, there may be some aspects around gender equality that you're interested in. And so there we can, we can put that into the, uh, you can uh, select that as an SDG and you will be shown projects that are more related to that as well as, as, well as being zero animal exploitation. If you want to listen to more on that topic, I've done a video presentation um, which is available on Beyond Animal and also on um, the sort of entrance portal to the Beyond Investing platform, which is beyondinvesting.co. Um, so that that um, um, video presentation is called Combating Animal Exploitation, the Next Frontier in Sustainable and Impact Investing. And it talks about the investment programs that I discussed earlier and the Beyond Animal platform. If anybody's here that knows about green bonds, can they also get in contact with me? Because I'm doing a little bit of uh, research into how green bonds can also um, help in this uh, mission of accelerating the transition by funding uh, farm transformation. So that's another area which I think is very, very productive in terms of potentially getting money into this space for projects that will, as I said, create this kinder, cleaner and healthier world free of animal exploitation. Maybe I've exhausted all your questions. Um, I don't know whether um, there is still some questions or some thoughts that people want to share. Does anybody else investing in this area want to give any comment on how they're investing? I think it's also possible for you to actually enter and for us to have a chat as opposed to you know, just watching the chat. Okay. If I can see who's here. Okay, so got I don't know, I think that's everybody. Can't see who's in this session. Okay, all right, so we've got Danish and myself. Uh Danish, who's been jumping in, in the chat, is actually the co-founder of uh, Beyond Animal with me. Um, we started discussing this in 2018. Um, created the company later that year, started with a beta version in 2019. And our latest and greatest version is available currently. It works on your um, on the website and also on an Android um, as a progressive web app. Um, it's uh, going to be coming out as an Apple um, um, app very shortly for Apple iPhones. Um, but it does work as a progressive web app, but uh, it works better. It'll work better as an, as an app. Um, Okay, Vaipab is a student in food engineering. Omed is here and Ralph. Um, not sure if you have any further questions. Uh, Ralph, you were asking about funding earlier. Um, Omid and Vaipab, do you want to say anything about what you're doing or do you have any questions or thoughts to share? please put them in the chat, or if you can work out how to do it, it is possible to speak um, somehow. Um, somebody, so a couple of people were able to do it earlier, but I have no idea how, how it is possible. There must be a button that you have to press. Just check the direct messages. Okay. Okay. I haven't seen any new 
um, comments or questions come up in the chat. So, um, and we have been going for over half an hour um, since I, uh, actually well over that since we started it just after um, five past 10 when I realized where it was that I had to go after I'd uh, done my talk. Um, so um, what I would suggest is if there's any follow up, please um, contact me on either of the emails, go to beyondanimal.com, um, add me as a connection there and, uh, and contact me there. Um, and I will be dropping in and out over the course of the day. You may see me on some of the other sessions. Um, if there are networking opportunities, please feel free to contact me during the networking opportunities as well. Um, so I think we'll close off. And um, I'd like to thank those people who who, who came. Um, Ralph, Omid, Bebav, who are still here. Uh, Vincent, Nicholas, and Marta, I think it was, who had questions earlier. I'd like to thank everybody for joining me um, today. And do, do please get in touch if you'd like more information. Thanks very much indeed. Nina Buffi, Managing Director at OSPIN, a company automating and digitizing bioprocesses in different fields, also in the cultivated meat field. And today I would like to share together with you my vision about cultivated meat, mainly from an engineering perspective. And so let's just jump into the future and let's try to describe with as many details as we can um, the cultivated meat landscape of the future. So. Cultivated meat companies will have uh, production plants where cultivated meat is going to be produced. And one of the first aspects I would like to discuss with you is where and how the feed for the cells is going to be produced. So cells, in order to grow, to differentiate, to maturate, they do not only need medium, they also need glucose and amino acids. So they also need feed. And First of all, it's very important that the feed, or I believe that the feed is not going to be produced somewhere else and then transported where the production plant is, because um, this is going to, would have an environmental impact, which we are trying to minimize in the cultivated meat uh, field. So I think it's going to be like that, that the feed is going to be produced where also the cultivated meat is going to be produced, right? So on site, on site. And, but the most interesting question to, to ask ourselves is how the meat, how the feed is going to be produced, like uh, which raw material is going to be used. And this is not so trivial because we need a raw material that is easy to produce, which has probably a high grow rate, which doesn't require much attention, uh, which by, by producing it, the environmental impact is as low as possible. And it's also important when we, when I say we need to feed the cells with amino acids, it's not just amino acid, it's uh, we need to some specific amino acid and we need the right ratio between the different amino acids. And this is not so trivial. What maybe we could do is to genetically modify the, 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 the raw material that is used to produce the feed and uh, to, to have the right uh, amino acids composition and ratio. Um, but again, that we are facing the problem of a genetically modified ingredient, ingredient used for the production of cultivated meat which is from a consumer perspective, is not maybe the best. And I do not know at this point which raw material is gonna be used. Maybe maybe some algae which are uh, easy to, 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 to cultivate. And I believe the environmental impact is not that high, but it's, it's an open question and we'll have to see what's gonna happen in the next, in the next years. Um, another aspect I would like to discuss together with you is uh, a decentralized versus versus a centralized model. So there is this discussion about uh, are we going to have uh, a few big production plants where cultivated meat is going to be produced and then the meat is going to be distributed everywhere in the world, or are we going to have a more decentralized model model where many smaller uh, production plants are going to be everywhere and so that and then uh, the production is going to be more local and also uh, maybe more inclusive because also 
farmers or smaller company will be able to produce cultivated meat. Um, I don't believe it's going to be either or. It's kind of probably going to be a continuum. So I think what would work or what will work is a franchising model, which is used in many other fields. So I'm not saying anything very really new here, but I just think that we can apply a franchising model to cultivated meat. And the idea would be the following: Let's make an example. Like as I let's assume I'm a cultivated meat company. So okay, I developed a process to produce cultivated meat, and uh, I, I have my first production plant. But now I want to have a big share of the market. So I want to own a relevant share of the market. I want to produce big amount of cultivated meat. Yeah. Now the investment, the capital investment that I will need to make in order to produce all this cultivated meat is going, probably going to be huge. And maybe I don't have this money or my investor don't want to put that money on the table. They simply don't have it. So in that sense, it's going to be interesting to allow other entities, farmers, smaller company to buy the machinery needed to produce the cultivated meat. And then I can sell to those entities uh, myself, my recipes. So I can still make money but I don't have this huge investment of capital at the beginning. And in such a constellation, I believe that digitization is going to play a major role. So to explain that, let's make another example. Let's assume now I'm a, I'm a farmer. I'm, I'm representing a smaller company that just decided to buy some equipment to produce cultivated meat. Now I have this machinery and OK, I buy from the cultivated meat uh, company, the cells that are needed to produce the cultivated meat, and now um, I need I need a recipe. I need I need to tell the machine what to do with the cells in order to have at the end as output the cultivated meat, right? So imagine a digital platform as Amazon, for example. Let's assume now I go in my browser, I open a tab of the browser, and then there I can just download uh, from the just download different recipes that I can run on my machine with that sauce. Recipe, in one case, the fat uh, content is higher, in another, the taste is going to be a bit different. So I can download different recipes. And to download that recipe, so every time I download a recipe, uh, I, I, I give some money to the cultivated meat company that produced that or that, that developed that recipe. And now, once I download my recipes, then everything is going to be digital and automated so that I only have basically to, uh, to open the recipe and click on play. And automatically, the recipe is going to be applied to the machinery that is going to run completely the process, the process completely automatically. You're probably going to have a, a cloud, a cloud, uh, a cloud platform where everything is per Wi-Fi. So on my, from my browser, click uh, play and then the, uh, the, the recipe Again, it's going to be applied on a machine. The machine runs everything automatically. And uh, so, and I believe I, I will have to pay not only to download the recipe, but also every time I run the, the recipe. So since everything is digital, it's easy to track all these things. So the cultivated meat company is going to know how many times I'm running the recipe. And every time I'm running it, I have to pay, like I am charged, and then the cultivated meat company makes money. And, our last point we'll have to think about, unfortunately, I think I know the answer, is that most likely uh, a specific machinery is going to be, uh, it's going to work with the process and the cell for a specific, from a specific cultivated meat company as, and not uh, with the salts and the recipe of another company. On one side, because the processes are going to be very specific, um, but as in the cases where the product is very similar and the process maybe is very similar, I don't know if how much culti different cultivated meat companies are willing to cooperate and make sure that a same piece of machinery can be used for uh, one cultivated meat companies and the, the, pro the process for, uh, of one cultivated meat companies and the process of another cultivated meat company. There, we'll have to see if, if the hardware can be to some extent the same, or I have to choose for uh, the, 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 the hardware for one specific process or the process for one cultivated meat company. That we'll have to see. It's obvious that if maybe like to produce fish, probably need another a different machinery or different enough uh, machinery that to produce pork. Uh, that is clear. But if companies producing the same uh, 
uh, similar products our lab like uh, will share the same machinery I don't know difficult maybe probably because of competition that's not gonna be the case but let's see so I think uh, yes automation is gonna play a major role but digitization I really believe in this um, digital platform with this downloading on the recipes and um, uh, this is gonna play a major role I believe good I hope I hope you enjoy my, my little vision and Feel just free to share your comment to think to tell me where you believe I, I, I I'm you believe I'm wrong or where you would like to to add something and I would love to uh, to discuss with, with some of you my vision and see if we can improve it. All right. Thank you so much, Nina. Right now, I would like to introduce uh, Brett Thompson. He is the first uh, Selec uh, uh, startup in South Africa. Hello, Brett. Um, hey, and, folks. Um, <laughs> when I heard there was one in South Africa, you know I jumped on it right away. And the floor is yours, Brett. And uh, tell us why on earth are you doing this over there? Thanks very much. I, I do ask myself the same thing every now and again. Um, I. Uh, yeah, I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, let me just make it uh, full screen. Um, just to double check, you guys can see full screen what I'm what I'm presenting. Yes, we can see okay. what you're presenting. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So, um, I think uh, I think it was opportunity that kind of got us to decide to start this company in South Africa. Uh, we were having a conversation, which led to some research uh, at the end of last year and realized that nobody on the African continent was actually even looking at cultivated meat from our perspective and nobody had actually become close enough to start one. I think there's a few people within the research space that are working on cultivated meat and cellular agriculture in Africa, but from our perspective in terms of a company, there, there wasn't actually anybody doing it. So we decided, my co-founder co -founder and I, Jay van der Waal, to you know, kick it off and actually be the first ones to, to go ahead and, and start a company. Firstly, I probably just need to get into what does Mzanzi mean. So I think, uh, Ira, that was quite a great pronunciation, but I, I know quite a few of the Americans do struggle. So I thought I'd do a quick, uh, is it closer lesson on, on what Mzanzi means? So it's Mzanzi. And uh, I think Emma uh, sort of put it quite nicely because it's always good to have M at the front of your food company name. And then uh, Zan, I, I like it also because it's uh, we're from sunny South Africa. So Sun, and then also the sea. It's South Africa's coastline. It's beautiful. It's synonymous with the country. So uh, the, the word sort of encaptures just on saying it, uh, the place that we are starting to do this. And it's from, uh, it's a colloquial term used to describe South Africa in, gen in, in general. And it's from Koza. And uh, it's, uh, it just means low or south. So it's, 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 quite, it's pretty much a direction. Uh, like South Africa. But what I think is more important is what does it actually mean? And uh, when in the context of where we find ourselves in South Africa, I think everyone on this, uh, on, on this, uh, in this conference would say that meat is a big, uh, plays a big cultural importance or uh, is just a big important thing for people in the countries that they find themselves from in, whether it's in Europe, the US, Asia, or, or, um, or the United Kingdom. But I think South Africa takes it to sort of the next level. Uh, and it's, it's something that uh, we spoke about in terms of how we try, are trying to revolutionize something that you would know as a barbecue and we know as a braai. Uh, and it's because it's, it's such a big thing for South Africa that our Heritage Day, which is a national holiday, has pretty much been rebranded to be called National Braai Day. So it's like, 4th of July or some other equivalent Independence Day or, or, or important day to some of the people on this call being re renamed to be called Barbecue Day. And that's how closely it is aligned with South Africans. And our name kind of speaks to that because I actually got it from a song by a band called the Heels Fantastis. And I know the Dutch people will know what, I'm, what that means. Um, but that means the Heels are fantastic in, in, in English. And it's a song with the Heels Fantastis, the Soweto Gospel Ch uh, Choir, and H, uh, Triple HP and JR. And it speaks to the fact that in South Africa, we have 11 official uh, languages. And if we wanted to capture um, uh, capture a, a, create a company that could capture and speak to everybody, we needed a word that would do that. And Mzanzi does that. 
So what do we stand for? Well, our purpose is really to create healthy, delicious, accessible meat in Africa. And I'm only going to really drill down into three words there, and that's healthy, delicious, and accessible. I think the first two make a lot of sense. Every single, um, every single startup in this space or company in, in cultivated or plant-based meat is looking to ensure that their food is healthy and delicious. But in our context, in the landscape that we find ourselves in South Africa and Africa, it's important to ensure that um, it's accessible to all. We've got a, a massive problem with inequality in this country. It's one of the most unequal countries in the world. And uh, if we truly want to be able to make a food that everybody can enjoy, it has to be available and it has to be available at a price that people can get to. So price parity is a discussion that is spoken about um, by everybody, but it truly is built into the narrative that we want to be speaking to when it comes to our R&D and our marketing going forward. Now, uh, the, the, this slide, I think somebody would, could probably look at it and say it's, it's a bit of a problem, uh, the, number, the, the level of meat eaten in South Africa. But for us, it's an opportunity. $16.4 billion in 2020 represents a massive opportunity for cultivated meat to be part of, be part of this protein space. And it's also reflected in the, in, in, by the fact that uh, vegan, vegetarian, flexitarian lifestyles are starting to grow within the, within the South African context. So it is becoming mainstream, even though cultivated meat is something that's very, very, the knowledge is very, very low in the South African context, and particularly in the rest of the continent. But as first movers, um, we do have the ability to um, shape the narrative and then start targeting a country that is going to have 71 million people uh, in, in a couple of years' time. It's, it's about 55, 60 at the moment. And also, we do want to note um, as a company, we're not just looking at South Africa in general. We also do, I like the term, uh, looking at north of the Limpopo, which is the border river between South Africa and Zimbabwe. We are looking at the rest of the continent and ensuring that we want to make a meat that can actually feed Africa, not just South Africa. So those, that's the two of us that started it. Uh, we've got quite a, bi uh, uh, a bit of experience, uh, Jay more in the cultivated space and, and me more in the plant-based space um, and, and more in the animal advocacy space as well. Then uh, when it comes to our team, outside of the co-founders, uh, we, this is obviously the people that are really driving it. Uh, our, uh, Dr. Angela Burtis is our CSO and head re uh, researcher Lauren Crooks have got a, a lot of experience in mammalian culture. And uh, we have a lab just down, down the road from where I am in Woodstock uh, called in, in BioCity Labs, which is um, enabling us to really just jump uh, jump ahead with our, with our R&D. But I mean, we only started in uh, February of this year, which is one of the most interesting times to start just before a global pandemic. And Taz and Upsi are the ones sort of um, ensuring that we're getting it right with PR and finance. I also wanted to sort of talk about the sort of thought leadership that we're involved with. Uh, we're not, uh, we also want to be having conversations, as I said, with the rest of people within the rest of the con uh, continent. And, and uh, it's about tapping into these folks that, uh, you know, rather I can say um, in, in areas like uh, Beryl and, and Mutali uh, from um, Zambia and Kenya, uh, they are one person there over there is a, is a poultry uh, involved in the poultry industry and the other is involved in the fish industry. And uh, we are starting to engage in sort of earlier conversations with them, you know, um, to ensure that, uh, well, firstly, there's a reception that I think you wouldn't probably find from other industries around the world who are involved in traditional or conventional livestock. So we are beginning to have those conversations and uh, they are facilitated and made possible through the networks that uh, uh, our advisor, John Simpson from Bluegrass, uh, in, uh, investments is helping to, uh, to foster. And um, just to, to sort of wrap it up of um, getting close to the end of it, uh, I think there is an appetite for knowledge about cultivated meat in South Africa and beyond, um, but it's still limited and it gives us the opportunity, as I said, to, um, to sort of shape that narrative. It's very cost effective to do business in South Africa and Africa. However, it does pose challenges that I think a lot of people in the, the rest of the world probably don't even um, understand. And, um, and it, but it, that also sort of provides us with a bit of a competitive advantage to people that are thinking about maybe potentially coming into Africa. We've already been quite happy with sort of the discussions that we've had in terms of the PR and really setting that, uh, that stage for, for media and, and eventually regulations and governments to ensure that it's a friendly reception to this unique, um, this unique, unique uh, protein in South Africa. 
Uh, I think it's quite safe to say that everybody is, is, is looking for talents and it is a challenge to get the right talent. We, because it's such a new industry here, uh, we, do, we do have to compete with the individuals uh, who would prefer maybe to get into biopharma and ca cancer research and the like. Uh, and it's a nice challenge that we have to sort of deal with. And we are actively looking for somebody to sort of help, or more people rather, should I say, to help bolster our, our, our scientific and R&D um, team. So if you're looking for a time, for some time in South Africa or, or to, come, to come live in Cape Town for a bit, you know who to call. And sort of finally funding, uh, although we've been quite lucky and, and, and we've been able to get funding from the likes of Ryan Bethencourt and a couple of other angel investors, it has still seen Africa as a bit of a, a new market to sort of for VCs from America, et cetera, to sort of put money into it. So that is a challenge that we're also having to deal with. So I think I'll probably just end it there. Um, and then I really just I hope you guys uh, enjoyed to hear a little bit more about sort of the more lands, the, the landscape that we find ourselves in South Africa. Um, please drop us a line if you would like to contact us, particularly when it comes to um, R&D and, and, and bolstering a, a, a young team down south. And uh, yeah, we're, we're open for business. So we're looking forward to hearing from you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, everybody now uh, interested in doing business with you in Africa, follow you to the breakout uh, room so that I can now introduce a dear friend of mine. So um, if I can get you off stage <laughs> and hopefully Cor van der Wele on stage, um, I would be very happy. I met Cor van der Wele uh, in 2010 when at Nemo in Amsterdam uh, I helped organize the first ever cultivated meat uh, uh, convention uh, for politicians, general public, uh, interested people uh, um, and in 2010 um, that was really no news and I met uh, Cor van der Wele uh, professor at Wageningen University at the time, and she had been looking into uh, consumer uh, aspects around cultivated meat quite intensely and had, um, in my view, always very creative ideas. And the thing that has always struck me about Cor van der Wele is that she keeps on researching her own research. So you have an effect at a certain point in time but then uh, uh, a few years y later, it is very well possible that you would have totally different findings out of the same kind of uh, research beca because time is going on. And um, uh, I met CORE uh, several times since, um, but especially the last two years, we've met up on different uh, occasions uh, all over the place because there are so many things going on around cultivated meat these days. And they ask her for advice. She's been a speaker uh, on several of them and she has published uh, 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 quite some interesting uh, 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 topics like pick in the backyard having your own uh, uh, pick in the backyard of the, uh, of the community, uh, having the pick uh, being alive, not eating the pick, but still uh, having meat every day or every week uh, from the pick uh, through cultivated meat. That was a project. It was something that she uh, had discussions on uh, with uh, people. And I uh, always applauded her for that because doing projects around cultivated meat and research these days is way more common than it was, let's say, only 10 years ago. Um, these days, I find, and I think I can, I, I can safely say this, having been around this for almost 40 years, that um, the story I have been able to tell around cultivated meat has changed every, let's say, decade, where uh, when I was a teenager, I had to explain this to the parents of my friends, and they were sort of asking me, really? <laughs> and sometimes I was not asked back. Uh, Ten years later, it was something like, oh, well, yeah, cool, futuristic. Ah, is it? Ah, but if that's just an idea. 
And then around 2000, there were more and more people that you could actually talk about the fact that there was stem cell research, that we uh, actually were wo working on research on, on cells. And in 2010, uh, it was also time to involve uh, uh, the public and uh, involve uh, at that uh, point uh, the industry. I have been indeed doing a study mainly through focus groups into the question if uh, cultured or cultivated meat can offer new opportunities for farming, uh, for farmers, instead of just being a threat. Um, and as you can see from the slide, uh, I did the study at Wageningen University, where I work. Uh, it was funded by the Bud Nisset Fund. Uh, you, you, I saw you shared the logo already. Uh, and the scenario drawings were by Cox Janssens, and you see one of those here. And you will see it again later. Um, Today, I present very brief and tentative results. Um, and before I do, uh, start doing that, let me give some uh, qualifications uh, with what I'm going to say. So I present uh, my view on the outcomes, but it will not be a plea for anything. It's only at the end that I will uh, briefly sketch my own hope. Um, next, uh, the study has involved focus group discussions uh, in the course of almost two years. And I had hoped that uh, technology would have been developed and made accessible faster than it has. So there was still big uncertainties have been a problem, certainly from the perspective of the interested farmers. Uh, then also bear in mind that focus groups give qualitative research, uh, results, not quantitative. And finally, uh, 10 minutes is very short um, and requires me to be very selective. So let me start right away with the storyline that emerges for me. So the storyline is that um, cultured meat as an option for farmers is a prospect riddled with tensions. I will illustrate those tensions later, but um, in general, as one farmer said it, the story has inherent contradictions. But yet precisely these tensions turn out to generate a lot of new ideas for bridging those tensions, go beyond them, etc. And one recurring idea was to make this product so full of industrial and laboratory associations from cells taken from individually known animals that we can relate to in happy ways. Um, and what indeed emerged from the study is uh, a clear need for new stories, particularly emotionally inspiring stories, not for the, just for the purpose of convincing consumers, but also for farmers themselves. And here I'm talking not about very large farmers, but about middle or, or small farmers. Uh, the discussion can be seen as a series of probes towards such new stories. And <clears throat> by the way, those yellow bags that you see in the picture here do not yet designate uh, money uh, earnings for farmers, but subsidies for farm scale research. In this scenario, this is the scenario that depicts um, um, as an open question, what kind of different things a farmer of the future might be doing. So, onto my next slide. Just a few words about the background of the study. I think uh, Irel probably already said something uh, about that while I was frantically uh, trying to solve my problems. Uh, but very briefly then, um, Cultured meat is evidently meant to be disruptive for animal farming. So the question arises, well, this is a threat for farmers. What about them? Well, now it has emerged from our earlier studies that uh, consumers have mixed feelings about meat, traditional meat, and they are um, more or less attracted to the idea of cultured meat, especially when it's made on a small scale. And there are also increasing signs that producers too have, uh, have mixed feelings about meat. So that um, is the background of wondering, well, is cultured meat production perhaps an opportunity for farms? So the setup, um, uh, we had uh, eight focus groups in total, first round with farmers, uh, three times live in 2019. Uh, and the second round in 2020 was during Corona times, so online, with a very, uh, with a much broader set of uh, people who were all interested or involved in cultured meat. 
and we structured and guided the discussion with the input of the visual scenarios. So let me show all of the four different scenarios that we use for this very briefly again. Um, here is the first, and it's the most straightforward one. Uh, it's to produce cultured meat in collaboration between scientists and farmers at a farm. So what you see is, um, is a bioreactor. It's about the same size, namely about 2,000 liters as a bioreactor uh, to make yogurt, uh, for example, on a farm uh, that makes dairy from its own milk. Uh, you see such a reactor on a dairy farm uh, on the right. It's indeed 2,000 liters. And, well, the size might be similar, but of course, cultured meat production uh, will uh, surely be more complicated than yogurt making. Uh, but, but you can get an idea of the size. The next uh, scenario is the idea that perhaps farmers prefer to wait a little not uh, start up in, in, uh, in this first phase, but wait until the market, which is here symbolized by a market stall, is, um, is asking for it. And uh, the technology is more ripe so that they can be more assured of perhaps a smooth production process and, uh, uh, and also uh, to, to give it to the market. The third scenario is, um, is um is visualizing that farmers say well let's make let's let cultured meat be made by other people so you see in the, in the far background the cultured meat factory uh, but we will do a complementary thing namely extensive farming you could also imagine uh, farmers uh, let's say collaborating with cultured meat production by growing the crops that will feed the cells for cultured meat so that's complementary work so to say and the next uh, scenario, the fourth one, the farmer of the future is the most open scenario. Um, and it wonders what a farmer of the future might be doing. Well, so far for the setup, let me now turn to the results. Um, I already spoke about tensions and the amount of tensions that uh, emerged in the discussions was really striking. People talked about tensions between farmer and industry, farmers and consumers, farmers and farmers, farmers and the system. And I will also, again, come back to uh, tensions in the scenarios and in the stories. I will illustrate each category just with a few quotes. So first, farmers and industry. Who will make it and where and when? Those were all questions uh, that were discussed a lot. And the first quote is about big versus small. So someone said, let's face it, right? The big companies will produce cultivated meat and they will do it at a very low cost and because there is a large power behind them. And maybe the farmers can come in later. It's like small breweries. The analogy of breweries was indeed used very often. Uh, and someone else said then, for example, that many of those small breweries are taken over again by large companies. So this discussion about the possibilities for small companies uh, were much discussed. Another theme was um, the question, who actually gains from this uh, production at farm level? Um, from the side of um, companies, it was said that production at farms would be helpful for, for acceptance, at least in the beginning. But farmers wonder, wondered what they had to gain. So they wondered, will the companies then involve the farmers just because they need a boost? So that's also some tension about who helps who. And then um, naturally uh, an interesting discussion topic was what a model is for farmers to earn money from this. And uh, you can imagine. Let's go to the next one. I will, um, about each uh, category is much more to say, of course, but I keep it brief. Uh, between farmers and consumers, uh, there are also many tensions and farmers, they are really struggling to understand consumers. They tend to be somewhat cynical about consumer motivation, but overall they hope to bridge the gap that they experience with the consumers. They, they, they often say there's such a distance, they don't know the farm anymore or things like that. But on the other hand, um, they note, or it was noted, I must say, that people are very concerned about the power of big companies and they like small, so again. Um, 
And it was also noted that it may work for consumer acceptance if we can make it in artisanal ways. That is something they may go for. Then when we go to the tensions between farmers and farmers, there are visible tensions and there are hidden tensions. And the visible tensions are, are uh, I think, out in the open. They are partly on TV very often. Um, but in our focus groups, it was the tension between ordinary traditional farmers and innovators, mainly. Um, so at least that's what I, I bring to the fore here. So what, someone said it's so far away from an ordinary farmer emotionally, I, it will meet with much resistance. But then on the other hand, we are seeing new generations of young innovative farmers. And also it was said that the educational level of farmers, especially the best 20% farms, that's almost university level. It's really smart farming. Uh, and then um, there were also more hidden um, tensions um, relating to the morality of animal farming. So someone said, ever more farmers are morally concerned about what they do, caring for animals that are then killed. And that is new and it's worldwide and everybody knows it. You cannot say it as a farmer, it is high treason. So that's also an interesting but uh, tension, but less spoken of so far. Then let's go to the tension between farmers and the system. Uh, and here, um, I just mentioned a single theme because it was a widespread feeling. Uh, there was a widespread atmosphere against the dominance of the big players. We see a new value chain in which farmers don't play a role or just a very small role, it was said. Um, and, and against that, it was um, argued how important the farmers are. All those big companies, Campina and Danone and Heineken, they all depend on farmers. Or it was said, we need new economic models. It's far more interesting than the technology. And it was also remarked, it's a task for the government to be involved here. The BV Nederlands should act against big business. So, of course, this also uh, works in the scenarios. This is the scenarios, um, uh, there's much to say about it, but again, I will be brief. Let me just stress the first scenario uh, that kept coming back, even if it's fraught with difficulties. And the difficulty is, is easy to imagine. You need huge investments to put this in the market. The big companies will do it. And yet, people said, we should not throw away the first scenario. There was a general feeling that this scenario needs to become more tangible. So uh, pilot farms may make it more concrete, it was said. And I think that IRA will say more about this in, in this conference. Uh, so keep an eye on that. Uh, then finally, uh, to the stories. Uh, I began with the stories that uh, that had inherent contradictions, according to many farmers. Uh, but that, if you can link the, um, the technology to to the tradition, uh, it may it, it it may be possible to create new stories. So, if you can link it to a specific cow, cow or chicken, it feels better. Combining the laboratory and the artisanal will produce a new kind of authenticity. I expect that kind of thing. And many ideas were not yet stories, but may become part of stories. For example, making uh, cultured meat with rare animal races and for many different species, to have workshops as farms, exporting knowledge, collaborations of farms and companies, of farms and restaurants, farms and scientists, cultured meat as part of a wider innovation, such as fermentation farming, etc. So these stories, they may, um, uh, th these ideas may be taken up in, uh, in fuller stories. My own hope is that the pilots and the experiments with farmers will really materialize and that they will lead to inspiring new stories, but also to feasible models for farming. So that was it. Uh, many thanks to all the focus group participants, very importantly. Then to all the people who helped me uh, uh, have the focus groups, Cox Janssens, Simone van Zuiligem, Clemens Driesen, Elke Gehoel and Ira van Elen. And of course, uh, to the institutions uh, that enabled this, the Bart Misset Fund and Wageningen University. Okay, I will stop sharing now. Hope that this works.
Thanks a lot, Cor. Um, Ira has now gone to her own session, um, so I'm okay. just taking over for the moment. Um, okay. But thank you very much. And I understand that you'll be available for a breakout session, so everyone will be able to, um, you know, join you privately and ask any questions that they might have. So thank you very much. Yeah, so I'll go to the breakout session now to have discussion about this topic. Okay, thank you. Uh... Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, so while Pete works on his sound, I will um, I will uh, read um, Mike Penfern's question then. Um, he says, thanks for the presentation. One question regarding the model of smart far small farms. You mentioned the parallels with microbreweries, but meat has different implications. Wouldn't a system based on micro farms present potential issues regarding food safety? Okay. Um, so we we we're not talking about. Um, let's first have talk about the, the word micro. I'm not really uh, talking about tiny, 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 but about let's say normal, normal sized farms, not the big ones. In the in the Netherlands, we have really big uh, farms, but also ordinary ones. And the farmers that we had in the focus groups were more of the of the medium sized type, I think, uh, on average. Um, so. Uh, um, but 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 of course, in comparison with small with large companies, that's that's very small. And indeed, we have been talking about the safety of doing cultured meat in smaller bioreactors. Uh, you will work to uh, you have to work in in sterile ways, and it's probably more uh, difficult to um, to do that in uh, in a farm environment than in a, a factory environment. Um, on the other hand, what even uh, Moza Meat uh, uh, projects is to do um, to do cultured meat not in very very large bioreactors, but in medium-sized ones like the one I showed. So there are, let's say, uh, similar challenges for Moza Meat as for farmers, and I think these challenges will no doubt be. Uh, Will be um, will be tackled in similar ways as well, and I, I guess so. That's what I imagine. Uh, what will, will happen is that these these problems of of safety and keeping hygiene um, will be solved in collaboration between farms and companies, such as, for example, Mozambique or other companies, perhaps bioreactor companies, uh, uh, and that is precisely why I think that Ira's idea. And other, and other people's idea of uh, working with pilot farms to to explore these difficulties, to explore these challenges, and see in what way they are solved uh, can be met. Ira, do you want to add something to that? Well, it's it's um, somehow cultivated meat has been framed in such a way that we uh, and and already quite some time so it's a it's a it's a persistent framing um, but it's been framed in such a way that we did it as if cultured meat is coming from a laboratory and that is of course not the case but every time we go whether we're a politician or a journalist or uh, take pictures we go to somewhere where it is still a lab uh, and that is something that is not in 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 our mind uh, that that have anything to do with our romantic image of a farm and it has nothing to do with uh, uh, our uh, <laughs> sometimes not even with uh, our ideas around um, no and, and i think that in what that i respect... imagine is that we have <laughs> okay i think in that respect so what I'm no, 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 I, I want to finish up. I won't take too long, but um, what I've it is a persistent idea that uh, cultivated meat has to be made in a white space with glass and uh, a high ceiling or a different kind of ceiling or a glass ceiling. I don't know. Um, whereas, if you actually look, as you already said, to the plans that both Memphis Meat and Mosa meat are right now working on, it is actually stacking 
small farm size uh, to make it in scale, but it is not that they are going to put in, and it's actually right now physically impossible, going to be put in huge uh, tanks because with the amount of uh, air that you would need and the cells would <laughs> die and it wouldn't work. So there's this, a certain amount that they can make right now. And for, for as far as I know, that would fit perfectly in a farm. And then well, in my view, of course, you have to have clean air, you have to have tiles and stuff like that. But I think this is very well possible. The comparison with, um, and especially, I, I've I've discussed it. <laughs> there's there's some delay, I think. Sorry. Online. Okay. Get up. There's some oh. delay. So I start talking, and then you are still you are still talking. So there is a there is the delay creates something of a problem. But I wanted uh, one thing to add, which is that um, uh, I showed you the the dairy farm. Uh, which also has bioreactors and making yogurt also requires a lot of hygiene. So that already shows that it can be done. So uh, uh, no doubt uh, cultured meat has different requirements, but they will uh, they will also be it will be also be possible to meet them. So so uh, Mike, is that a, an answer to your question? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I think. Um, it's 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 a new model. I, I, I didn't have insight about this kind of model so far, and I think it's really interesting. But uh, for sure, there are a lot of questions that are that are coming with this new. Type. Yeah, as I said, there are actually technologically more questions than we would have liked. Uh, we we hope that the the technology was more out into the open by now. But of course, these companies they are working. Uh, to compete, out compete each other, and they are not telling everything to uh, to the outside world. So, Pete, how's your um, how's your sound now? Still not. <laughs> okay. Yeah, let try that. So, so put, yeah. That's really a pity. So maybe if you if you uh, extract it, oh, Pete is going to try again. So other other questions, perhaps. Um, there's a question from Hermes. He can't get in at the moment. Um, he's asking, do we have already a good idea of the profile of the uh, cultivated meat farmer? Age, education, specialization, organ, uh, organic versus conventional. Um, did we see anything in research uh, in this aspect? Mm, yeah, so we had um, in the focus group, uh, in the focus groups, we had someone who has a lot of experience with uh, uh, farmers innovation. And what he notices is that uh, the best educated farmers uh, are the most innovative. Well, broadly speaking, of course, it's not always the case. But they are not so afraid for new things. They are they they, they do not fear a technology so much. So um, that is one of the profiles. But it can also be um, that this profile might broaden as soon as the technology becomes easy to handle, and uh, people see it as a really tangible something that is. Um, well, that, that that you can simply do if you want to do if you are looking for alternatives for traditional traditional animal farming. Um, and um, I think this profile is bound to develop because when we discuss the last scenario, so the open scenario, so what is the farmer of the future like? This really generated a lot of different answers and a lot of speculation and a lot of uncertainty. And I think we should take this uncertainty seriously and and also uh, bear in mind that a lot of what is being developed now is not yet known and certainly not to farmers. So so there's a lot for, a lot for that curious farmers uh, can learn if these if these developments are really uh, developing further. For example, cultured meat, as I very briefly indicated, is now part of 
uh, a larger field that is often designated as uh, the fermentation uh, promise. Uh, a lot of uh, startups are uh, are now working on, on different types of fermentation processes. So, so that's working with microbes and you can do endless things with microbes. You can manipulate them, but you can also make them grow in natural ways. You can use them as cell factories, but you can also use them themselves. Uh, so so um, this is something that I think that, well, perhaps it's quite possible that the farmer of the future is a microbe farmer. Um, well, well I, I don't say it's plausible, but it's. I, I think it's one of the possibilities. Uh, so, yeah, this this profile is certainly going to uh, to develop. Let me see. Are there more questions? I think Peach is still trying. Hopefully, he returns. And I see in the in the chat that there are people who have the same problem that I experienced when I wanted to go backstage, and they cannot enter this room for the same reason. And Pete says, I'm sorry, Cor, no idea why the audio isn't working. I'm going to shut down and start up again. Be right back. So we wait for um, Pete to show up again. <laughs> Can I, do you hear um, me, Cor? Yeah, Kelly has a question. Sorry? Anna, yeah. yeah do, do you hear Anna, me, Anna, there's also a question from Kelly. Uh, I can hear uh, someone speaking. Is it Anna? Yeah. Yes, it's me. Hello. Okay. Can you Go hear ahead. Me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I was wondering because in the Netherlands we are rather progressive with uh, um, uh, research for alternative ways of getting our food. Um, and well, I'm almost a vegan. I stopped eating meat for 30 years ago. And I see a lot of uh, inventive solutions for another way of producing milk, eh? like uh, from uh, from oat or uh, uh, from soya, or well, there are a lot of sources to produce milk. But and there are even um, 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 former um, dairy farmers, young young people who stopped uh, uh, their family business uh, with cattle producing milk and they started to produce soya to get milk from so it was a really really trans uh, transition from animals to plants on the same location um but do you see this um uh so do you see the same evolution uh in the um the meat producing farmers that they also want to swap from that is is there this interest in those farmers that they want to swap from cattle producing meat to uh, a plant based production because it it is uh, it it seems to me that it is a, a bigger transition than for the milk part but it's also coming from animals so i was wondering is there a bigger resistance well that's that's quite possible uh, but when we we were looking for interested farmers to to participate in a focus group, uh, so, so that's almost two years ago now that we started for for interested participants. It was really not so easy to find interested farmers. So exactly. we looked at all kinds of possible ways. So it seemed that the farmers that there were not so many farmers who were interested. Now, of course, we didn't see that as a big problem because we thought you only need for this for this development to start going you only need a few pioneers and when it becomes more concrete uh, others can take note of it and and can uh, can join it uh, still uh, i think that what this this quote that i mentioned in my presentation of this uh, farmer who said well this moral concern that many farmers have is not something you can easily talk about means that there is a kind of hidden discomfort that um, that I want I really want to go into uh, in when I will start to work out these these findings but I, 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 I don't know enough about by now because I know that some farmers are are not feeling comfortable with the traditional ways but I myself have I have no idea how widespread that is and and how easily people will um, will really say that um so so when people are not of not precisely of one mind so when they they are really ambivalent about 
being uh, in the old ways and and be and, and and being uncomfortable with the old ways um this is a very difficult position for 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 change and this can last for a while but i think it's also a hopeful sign that something below the surface so to say is really happening so we I think, I think tradition is a big grow. thing um, tradition is a big thing i think it is yeah a difficult yeah. issue yeah, <laughs> yeah. Peter, how is your sound Can now? I, um... Can you hear me? Yeah! <laughs> Are you done? Oh my goodness. Yeah! Right. yeah. And I'll, I'll blame the headphones. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, Peter, um, we have uh, a few more questions, but uh, since you were first in line, actually, um, tell us a little bit more about your findings in the United States. Yeah, well, it's very nice to reconnect, Core. Um, so, uh, I'm a, I'm a researcher based at the University of Colorado in Boulder in the US and uh, was have just recently completed and submitted a, a research paper um, which actually asks somewhat similar questions to, to CORE. Um, it was exploring whether, uh, as you say, whether there are opportunities as well as threats to, um, to rural producers who are involved in uh, or that might emerge from plant-based as well as um, cultured meat production. So we had a different methodology. We conducted uh, semi-structured interviews with about 40 um, experts across the animal agriculture sector, across the cultured meat sector, plant-based meats, um, and uh, plant protein sectors also from soy and, and pea and such like. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, so we basically were trying to to catalog, um, but not to quantify the range of possible opportunities and, and threats that farmers might encounter from from these sectors if and when they scale up and, and achieve um, some meaningful scale um, with a focus on the US. But I do think a lot of the trends um, would be somewhat universal or uh, in nature. Um, so, I mean, just to briefly add some of those here to the, to the conversation, um, of course, one, one of the opportunities that um, was commonly identified was exactly um, what you've been talking about, Core, which was that farmers, it may be possible to have small bioreactors on, on farms and for farmers to produce cultured meat themselves. Um, but additionally, also growing feedstock, so for, for crop farmers to be growing um, the inputs, both for plant-based um, and we see that already with a growing demand, for example, in the US for pea protein for um, products like the Beyond Burger and then other analogs that are, are now coming out. Um, so an increased demand for, for crops and particularly for, um, for new and more high value leguminous plants, which um, can bring environmental as well as economic benefits to farmers. Um, the opportunity for raise for at least for maintaining a small number of animals and um, particularly perhaps those from rare or high quality breeds as uh, as a source of genetic material for cultured meat so even if the farmer isn't producing meat themselves on the farm to maintain a, a small herd of livestock that is providing cellular inputs for cultured meat um, opportunities for blended and hybrid animal and alternative protein products and so we see that already with um, uh, sort of blended meat and, and plant products but in the future perhaps for blended uh, animal meat and cultured meat products or for um, blended uh, cultured and, and plant protein products um, and then and then I think interestingly as well a lot of a lot of interviewees thought it could really give a lot uh, give more a new and um, uh, sort of differentiation with with higher animal welfare and quote unquote regenerative farming uh, and grow and actually give um, more market value to animal farmers who are doing a sort of more um, a, a type of animal farming that is more uh, has a higher value proposition um, than than the sort of um, mass industrialized con uh, intensive uh, animal farming which dominates at least in, in the US and uh, some other parts of the world um, so no. so I I guess a range of opportunities that could um, emerge and then obviously some threats also, although I think actually fewer and less um, intense than I would perhaps anticipated, um, largely because I think the, the, a lot of people's um, sense is that at least in the early 
at least in the foreseeable future, uh, it's unlikely that cultured meat or plant-based meat are going to displace animal agriculture, but rather they will um, account for the growing uh, protein gap uh, and protein demand where we, we know global protein demand is increasing uh, and maybe alternative proteins would fill that a growing demand rather than actually displacing or replacing uh, animal agriculture to any um, tangible or meaningful degree in the, in the near future. So I think actually um, at least our interviewees were less concerned about threats of loss of livelihood to animal farmers uh, in the near future than um, just a, a burgeoning emergence of alternative opportunities. Yeah, thank you. So, so if I understand you right, um, the, 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 the idea that cultured meat cultivated meat production and uh, and what farmers do with regenerate, regenerative farming can be complementary. That was maybe the most the most dominant road ahead that that your interviewees saw. <clears throat> um, and so again, we didn't really ask about this. Sort of what they thought the likelihood of different uh, scenarios was. Um, I would think that would be a fascinating thing to do, but um, I think difficult at this point to to sort of really kind of put. Um, numbers on it um, but it's certainly I think it was something that a lot of a lot of them foresaw was that where you know some animal even in the long term some animal agriculture would persist but it, perhaps it would be um, this yeah higher animal welfare regenerative farming yeah. that has where people are buying it also f to support the story and the tradition and the um, uh, and the sort of other values that that might accompany their food um, decisions rather than you know, you're buying um, intensively produced confined animal feeding operation meat. It's really about buying cheap protein, and it's not you know you're not buying that for for other reasons. Um, and so that might be the the sort of part that cultured meat would replace, um, leaving the sort of more regenerative uh, pasture raised or um, lower intensity animal farming more uh, more intact and with a and more differentiated. Yeah. Thank you. Do others have questions about this? Yeah, Mike. Yeah, uh, in this kind of uh, decentralized farmers-based model, um, shouldn't the, the, the farmer be producing directly on the place of consumption? That means at the middle of the big megalopolis compared to hundreds or thousands of kilometers away from their consumption. Yeah, that's indeed also one of the scenarios that you could foresee. You could even foresee that people do it on their own kitchen sink uh, when it becomes really micro. Um, but you can also imagine doing it in cities uh, or in vertical farming indeed in cities. Uh, on the other hand, so, so I think that that's, that's definitely uh, um, those that are extra scenarios that, um, but in, in my, um, in my study, at least, we focused on the farmers that feel the threat of cultured meats. And, and they also, that's not something that I stressed very much in my presentation, but they, they really uh, also emphasized the importance of the livability of, of the, the countryside. So they said, well, um, not everything should happen in, in the cities, but we should also be having a prosperous and and flowering countryside where where you can also have jobs well i think that is something that could be debated because it's also really interesting to have more nature in, in on much of the land um, but on the other hand to have just cities and wild nature <laughs> that's also a, a very strange uh, thing to uh, to uh, visualize so we will have to I think much discussion is needed for the ideal combination of, of yeah. cities and countryside. Yeah. I think it depends really on the on the country. If you take the Netherlands, um, for example, the country, the territory is quite small, so you have the production which is quite close to the consumption point. Yeah. If you take all the territories like like the developing Asia, you have a scarce land and um, and a lot of a, a booming population so maybe depending on, the, on the yeah thank you mike your your your, your microphone is a your, your voice is a little bit soft but i can just hear you uh, and for those who have not been following you um what mike has just been saying is that it it also depends on on the country um uh, how this relation can best develop or how it tends to develop 
Um, I can just add one thing there as well, Paul, yeah. which I think I think is a really important question, Michael. Um, and it's something we asked uh, that came up in our interviews a little bit. We also asked about one, one of the other sort of layers we asked about was what different actors or so what different stakeholders might do to try to maximize the benefits and minimize the risks to farmers of a transition of the emergence of, of cultured meat and plant based meat. Um, and one of them was that, well, at least there's, there's some potential for, for governments in particular to incentivize or disincentivize growth and production and economic opportunity to 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 happen in different places and so certainly one option one opportunity is to develop meat production cautious meat production close to consumers near cities or on the periphery of cities um, but another is also to, to, to incentivize through tax breaks or other means um, production in places where job which are less prosperous and where where um, new job opportunities would be would be most beneficial um, and so to sort of uh, manipulate uh, to some degree the um, the geography of, of cultured and plant-based meat production. Yeah. Um, there's also have, a, uh, there's also a Kelly's question in this chat. I want to. Um, Ira, what, um, can, can I? Do I have time to, yes, uh, to go want... into Kelly's question? Sure. Okay. Yes, you you have all the time in the world. Oh, okay. It's your, it's your room. Oh, so we can or go our on. Room. Yeah, it's, it's, but we will not go on for the whole afternoon, but um, or yeah, morning. Yeah. We <laughs> but we can if you, you can like. You can stay as you like, and you can stay as you like. <laughs> <laughs> so Kelly asked, um, is, Kelly wondered whether uh, some of the tensions that we found were perhaps resolved a little bit during the conversation right. in the focus groups. Uh, and the answer is is indeed yes. Uh, and I think that I, I very briefly hinted at the, the ways in which they were resolved, because um, uh, the tension between cultured meat be, being very industrial or very laboratory-like, and on the other hand, a very traditional way of dealing with animals, perhaps a romanticized way of dealing with animals, um, they thought that that could be combined in, in making a kind of artisanal or authentic kind of cultured meat, that you make from the cells of real animals that you know perhaps by name uh, and that you uh, that you really love and that you don't have to kill you only have to take biopsies for some cells and then you have some combination of um, of doing it on a farm in a way that that really has an extra story to tell because there is really a connection with the animals that the meat comes from without killing the, those animals so it gives some extra and it's of course uh, I, I, I formerly did uh, similar kind of studies with consumers or citizens, and they uh, this this these studies generated something a scenario that we call the pig in the backyard, and it was in fact an urban scenario, and that was also about uh, very small scale uh, cultured meat production, perhaps in, a, in indeed in a vertical farm in a, in a city, uh, but then the uh, the, the 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 pigs or the cows were were kept in uh, well in, a, in in a backyard you cannot imagine that very easily for um, for a cow and and perhaps also not so easily for um for a pig uh, and at the very least it is not uh, it's not uh, uh, in conformity with uh, with rules uh, in most cities and countries i think to have a pig in this way so the idea was that this is perhaps a really beautiful and attractive scenario. People really liked it, uh, but not very practical. So that's one of the backgrounds of this idea that um, real farms, so not urban farms, but rural farms, might be the replacement for this pig in the backyard and to do it on a small scale and combine, um, overcome some of the tensions. Um, but without the impracticalities of this pig in this uh, urban backyard. And um, I'm, I, I, I forgot about the pig in the backyard during my focus group with farmers. And then when I analyzed the results, I realized how much it indeed in a way showed up again in, this, uh, in, in the way the tensions uh, were resolved in the, in, in the farmer groups. Is that an answer to your question? 
And there's also thank a question of. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I think it's really awesome that you're in this time frame doing this research right now where you there's still time to have these visions that could resolve these tensions. Because if there's like more introduction of cultured meat at some points, maybe that's people feel less able to dream. And I hope that those like new storylines that you identified can inspire the production of cultured meat in a way uh, in the future too. Yeah, really nice. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you because you are you are quite right so on the one hand and i was frustrated and the farmers were even more frustrated that the technology was not yet ripe but on the other hand you cannot if you wait until the technology is ripe you are in fact too late uh, for developing new storylines so so that that is that is a kind of balance that is not so easy to find and i guess that uh, that pete has also been encountering this tension uh, in his research that it's in fact too early to say precisely what it's going to be like and what are the possibilities but it's not too early to think about what could be uh what could be attractive to uh, to realize so peter in fact has a question in the in the chat i think i'm curious how many of the farmers in your focus groups had thought about cultured meat as an opportunity before you presented your scenarios how many had thought of it as a threat and how many were now th uh, new to thinking about the technology? Did minds change during the conversation? Um, in, in, in response to this question, I really have to um, say that the answer is, is a bit mixed. There were some who had really been thinking about it and had, were very eager to, uh, to go ahead with it. There were some who were, um, we approached them as uh, as innovators of um, of a different kind. So they, they had shown to be innovative farmers and we wanted to hear them uh, in a way as a kind of um, experts of doing something new. But they were of course not necessarily interested themselves in cultured meat because they were already doing something else that was also new. And it was interesting that they tended to me the, to be the most skeptical group. Um, actually, because because they said, well, it's still so vague. I mean, you cannot work with this. So they they wanted it. They they really wanted it to be more concrete. But then there were also people who who did indeed change their minds, who said, well, we may have to wait a little. But this is definitely something that we should keep an eye on. So I think focus groups are really good um, social environments for people to start their thinking processes and also <laughs> and therefore also to to start changing their minds. And I thought I, I, I thought we saw this happening several times uh, during the focus groups that people who, who started out quite skeptical, they thought, well, Okay, not for now, but let's keep this. Let's keep an eye on this. So that's um, that's that's uh, Peter. Um, can can um, I add, add one? I have to leave to speaking? go to another. Uh, this is Ira. Okay. If, yeah. Um, yeah. Good, Ira. Good. I've done. I think we will add uh, one go, thing go to on. the discussion. <laughs> now you can go on. I just have to leave. And I want to leave you with one thing. Uh, having so many conversation as Cornos uh, with different kind of farmers all around uh, the Netherlands and also already in Europe. Uh, wanted to talk to me uh, wanted to organize groups with me, wanted to put me in their uh, uh, farmer community. Almost every time, uh, somehow, they said, I cannot go with you right now because it would make my community um, too difficult. So keep me informed. So I, right now, I have a huge group, I think, 40 different farms that I uh, uh, um, inform about what I'm doing, 
but they don't want me to mention the fact that I am in extremely eager to find out what is possible, what can we do, how can we help, but please don't mention my name. Hmm. I have to go somewhere else on stage, but I have to go and meet DJ now. <laughs> Thank you, Ira, for, and also for the for this last point that we, we will certainly uh, come back to that. Thank you so much. And um, then there is a question from bye bye um, bye bye Ira. There's a question from uh, Clemens Driesen, uh, who is wondering whether Nina has any ideas on the kinds of bioreactor and other technologies if these would possibly cater to the small scale requirement as core envision them with farmers? So Nina, uh, could you could you tell some, uh, something about that? I want, uh, yes, I want to be honest here. Uh, what we are doing, it's really still very much, at least our company is still very much engineering and R&D, so very much funding, uh, trying to find solutions still at a lab scale to solve biological problem and engineering problems. So it's one of the reasons why I'm following all this discussion is to like get out of my engineering world and try to understand what people are envisioning in terms of how it's going to look like in the future, which business model can we implement, what farmers are thinking and so on. But I don't really have on a technological level now the solution or a clear vision yet how it's going to look like. Because for me, there is still this discrepancy of what is my daily job, try to find a solution at a lab scale for media recycling, for feeding, for is better a rocky motion, is better a steer tank, do we go uh, uh, hollow fiber or whatever. There's very, very specific engineering questions that is my daily basis. But then, and then there is this, the other angle to see, okay, how it's going to look like for the farmer and so on. And I still don't find a match, like I still don't match the, the tools, so to say. And so I'm also blind in that, in that sense. But I'm trying to participate with that, those things to, at some point, uh, yeah, match these two, or these, two, these two angles or these two, uh, these two points, so to say. Yeah. So here again, we have, we have an issue of uh, many fu op future open questions. Yeah. yeah. So maybe uh, I do realize that um, uh, that there are also people we, we cannot see here. As as uh, there are there are six people now that are visible, including myself. But there are uh, some so, some others uh, who are um, who are not visible to us, but are uh, apparently uh, also watching. Um, oh, Ralph. Ralph has a, question, has a question about Peter um, alerts me to that. So let us see. We are not. We will not continue for too long, I think. But uh, let's look at. I see Ralph's question here. Do you have any proof points for farmers that the business model is financially more interesting? Ah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, and uh, as I said, it was discussed a lot in the. In the in the focus groups, the business model, uh, but there was also a lot of um, different directions in which to go. So people said, "Well, you will never never earn something from this if uh, if you just have to sell uh, your cells, uh, the cells that you get from from your um, from your animals uh, to a, to a, a cultured meat company, because." Um, um, well, this is not going to bring in uh, enough money, and 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 by the way, the meat companies can can produce their own cell lines. So so this is not going to work. So how is it going to work? And I, uh, I think that the most concrete model that we had was um, how Mark Post envisioned it, uh, at so, uh, uh, also on his website, I think, that um, he wants to. Uh, have a model for a factory, and then he wants to uh, give out licenses for for such uh, uh, a setup on on very different uh, scale levels. 
So that's an idea that Mark Post has been having for quite some years now, and that, that you can simply license as a farmer the whole technology. Uh, and perhaps also, um, I don't know what the, what the, what how the financial model for Nina's recipes would be, but that would be something that perhaps also you could buy and license or something. Uh, and then you can uh, you can uh, earn money, but it's completely uncertain at this moment uh, how um, how profitable that can be. I, I don't know if uh, if Pete has something more to say about that. No, not really. I don't know. I didn't ah. directly, other than that, it's uh, obviously a critical, critical part of the, the puzzle for whether farmers adopt or not. And I think having clear demonstrations of uh, of an economic pathway would uh, presumably only help to. Um, yeah, yeah. So, Ralph, do you want to add something uh, to this yourself? Uh, no, I think it's a, it could be a key to get uh, a new part of the channel uh, going uh, because not all farmers are uh, driven by uh, what we m might see as a future, but uh, they run a business. Uh, so it's interesting to think about how we can deliver those proof points uh, to accelerate uh, uh, the, the transformation for them. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 I think that uh, the business model can also be a bit surprising every now and then. For example, you, you can also have workshops, for example, with um, with consumers who come in, uh, so that you collaborate with a restaurant or or, or someone else who um, uh, who who will make something uh, out of it that is much wider than just the production of, of the, of the cultured meat, but also perhaps, uh, doing something more with it. Uh, but we will simply have to wait and see how this uh, develops. Yeah. Now that's interesting. See if anybody is interested, I'm, I'm not so much into the cultured meat sector. I'm a business model innovation, uh, consultant oh, interested. Uh -huh. Uh, we do this, this a lot of times for many companies to de design the business model instead of wait until a business model happens. Mm -hmm. So if you define where you can go, you can take the business model of a farmer. So I talked with Ira before, uh, I'm interested to, uh, to design the bi business model of a farmer of the future, but um, have a, don't have enough knowledge to uh, to do that the exercise so um, anybody who wants to help to do that uh, please uh, uh, engage with me because i know business models but i don't know the, a lot about farmers and meat yeah okay so uh, hopefully you will be uh, involved then in 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 the pilot uh, experiments uh, that that will, will be set up yeah that's very good to hear uh, I think we are, we 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 now dealt with most of the questions, uh, and many people already needed to go. Uh, is there um, anything else we want to discuss? No, oh, Mike is satisfied. Pete, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, this is great. It's really nice to hear more about your your research call. Look, look forward to being in touch. Yeah, I, I'm also looking forward to reading your. Um, your report or your 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 publication that you are you have just been making. Thanks, Nina, is there something else? Sorry, sorry, Pete, is it available oh, already? No, it's in review, but I'll be happy to share it as soon, um, even when it's. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thanks, Nina. Anything else you want to add? No, Kelly. No. Um, and Ralph was just uh, already there. So okay, shall we then uh, close this? Um, breakout session. Thank you all for being there and for uh, having a good discussion. Yeah, it was really, uh, it was really good to see you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks so much. And perhaps see you later in some other part of the of the conference. <laughs> and and Thank Peter, you. Peter, very good that you went you uh, you you went up you were up so uh, so early. <laughs> yeah, now I have to decide whether to go back to bed or not. <laughs> <laughs> I might just stay up. <laughs> this is great. Thanks for letting me know about the conference. This is a great lineup. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being there. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. We'll be in touch. Yeah, we will. Bye bye.
Hi everyone. Um, next we have Yana joining us, um, who used to be a part of the Ket team. So Ira has um, made it clear that you know she'll give a great instruction. She'll be joined by Alexandra, who she will also introduce. Um, so we're just checking if she's ready to join us now. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yes, I can hear you all, Yana. How are you? Hi, very good, thank you. I didn't realize I have to press this button again. So thank you for the patience. I was actually impatiently waiting backstage. Um, <laughs> no, thank you for fine. the introduction, though. That's perfect. No, great. Um, and yeah, um, Ira has mentioned that, you know, you have you were a part of the team as well. So she mentioned that you'll be taking over and introducing Alexandra. So we look forward to hearing from you. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much. And um, yes, I was actually part of the CAT team last summer. I still remember um, being responsible for investors at the time. I was volunteering and really just wanted to contribute. Um, and then Olivia kind of um, made me the head of investor partnerships or something like that. I got the title within, I think, 10 minutes of chatting with her. Um, so yes, I volunteered. I loved it. Um, I actually was part of, you know, Ira. Um, Isabella, Mackenzie, Olivia, of course, and everybody else who contributed last summer. So thank you so much, um, Ira, Olivia, team, uh, everybody who's new to CAT um, to have invited me to speak today. Um, Amazing. I am, uh, is it okay if I just kick off the, the 10 minutes then, right? Yes, please go ahead okay. and you feel free to share your screen. It's all uh, you now. Okay, super. Thank you. So um, first of all, thank you so much for Alexandra. We've had many, many talks. Um, in the last days, but now her computer unfortunately is not working, so she will not be able to join. Um, but I will definitely, yeah, I thank her very, very much for her input. I would have loved to have her co-present with me today. And so um, today I want to speak about um, investing in changing times um, and especially with sight on COVID and how kind of animal companies as well as plant-based or other alternative protein companies have done in the past and how one might expect them to do in the future. Um, I think I want to really zoom in on two very important points. How have they basically performed to date and what can we expect in the future and due to which factors um, am I building my presumptions? Um, so I think just introducing the topic, we've seen many investment classes really be turned onto their heads in terms of a risk return profile. Um, what would have been deemed an absolutely stable, kind of no-brainer, very crisis-resistant investment a few months ago, for example, critical infrastructure like airports or commercial real estate or, you know, um, affordable fashion or anything like that, hotelery travel, this nobody would have imagined that people will ever stop traveling or people will ever stop um, going to restaurants. But now we can see it completely topped and turned on their heads and suddenly investments in um, growth or venture stage alternative protein companies don't seem as risky anymore compared just because um, the risk return profiles of even government bonds and like completely stable investment um, opportunities have been a bit turned on their head. So it's a very interesting market environment right now. Obviously, volatility always gives, uh, gives way to uh, high gains as well, if you know what you're doing. But uh, this is the environment that everybody's operating in right now. Um, in terms of what makes an investment resilient, I want to look straight at the animal protein um, world, where I think they've done relatively well so far. Um, publicly listed animal protein companies usually have a pretty low beta, which just measures the volatility compared to general market swings, ups or downs. And I can imagine this is because they are well seen as staple food products they are operating at unit costs, which are fairly low, affordable, and they are available in every supermarket, food service, and basically everywhere, right? Animal protein is, is, uh, is, is available everywhere. Um, also, they have been the only option for meat um, or, or se several kind of uh, dairy products as well on the block. If somebody really wanted to taste the real meaty taste or a cheese, 
they had to go to these guys because there were simply no alternatives. So they had a quasi monopoly as a sector because an alternative protein hadn't been as developed from a taste and from a unit cost profile yet to compete with the consumer who just wants exactly that product. Obviously, conscious consumers have gone to tofu and other first generation alternative products, but this is not what I'm talking about here. Um, the second factor why I believe they've done pretty well um, in the past is that subsidies and government bailouts have well, basically helped to cover some of their catastrophic supply chains and catastrophic kind of safety regulations that they've had also for decades because they're operating on high volumes, low prices, very high speed, right? Um, and the most important factor I want to stress and something that I want to talk about in more detail here is all the negative external externalities had not been priced in correctly to the state yet. So mentioning just a few factors like GHG emissions, uh, water use, land use, which are quite well quantifiable, and then some softer ones, which are harder to quantify, like animal welfare and just the general kind of pollution of, um, of soils, seas and groundwater those are absolutely not priced into animal protein yet. Um, which is why I believe this might absolutely change in the future. And um, if you work in investments, you know there's a lot of disclaimers. And one of my favorite sentence in disclaimers is past performance doesn't guarantee future results. So I actually believe that this is drastically going to change um, in the next year and it's all going to be accelerated by COVID. So um, I've mentioned a lot already in terms of the kind of uh, pitfalls of animal protein um, and especially the, the supply chain risks. Just to put some numbers um, behind that, because we've had decades of consolidation, decades of, you know, margin optimization to cost and production efficiency and away from safety measures, worker safety and um, biosafety and other precaution measures um, which they don't have in place. They've set up a very fragmented, complex and long supply chain, which gives a lot of kind of room for for shocks to actually, yeah, to basically destroy part of those supply chains and then the whole system kind of tops and tumbles around and um, so what we've seen um in the us now during the first lockdown is that um the slaughtering capacity actually decreased by 55 zero percent in may in the us this is um and the prices for pork have increased by 40 percent and more just because slaughterhouse needed to close and then the raw material, if you will, which is animals, which were raised on other farms, they were creating bottlenecks and redundancies. We didn't know where to put them, so they needed to be culled and so on and so forth. It, it, was, it was all a mess, basically. Um, and this, these price spikes of 40% and more have obviously been felt by the consumer in terms of increased price and also even increased scarcity in the US and in, in, in many other countries. So this kind of paints a picture of these supply chains and these models maybe not being entirely future-proof. Um, COVID is not the only thing. We've got the African swine flu and the avian flu, which have also in the past created bottlenecks, scarcities, and unfortunately the mass culling of hundreds of millions of animals um, by just closing slaughterhouses and creating these market imbalances. Um, when you compare that to the plant-based alternative or alternative protein, which are um, produced at a scale that are ready for the market now, um, you look at plant-based and they have really managed to offer a resilience which has been missing in uh, the animal space. They have much shorter supply chains because you just take out the animal which is the most risky part of the supply chain because it can get ill, it's a living being, so it has to be kind of handled by humans. It's very hard to introduce automation into an animal supply chain. Um, 
And on a plant-based supply chain, it's much shorter, it's more transparent, it's usually less international, has less fragmentation and complexity. And usually plant-based companies also set up a system which is, um, well, more responsible as a whole. So they do plan for the rainy days and for the system shocks, um, which, which, yeah, animal proteins have, have usually ignored quite actively. So that's basically the status quo. Um, now a project that is really close to my heart, actually, um, I want to talk about, which will give even more, well, insight into this, is a study that we did, because I think the most important factor for looking into the future and which industries will be resilient in the future is how are we going to price in negative externalities which are currently being ignored and are not actually being passed to the industry creating the products and to the consumers buying the products. And for that, um, I would like to share my screen. Let's see if I managed to do this. Here we go. Uh, one sec. That looks good. Yes, super. So, We've done um, a study, we at Blue Horizon, we've done actually a study um, which is called um, the environmental impact of our food choices comparing animal protein to plant-based protein. And what we did is we wanted to compare three externalities which contribute to climate change. Um, it's greenhouse gas emissions, land use, and water use. And because we wanted to be able to compare them on, on the same level and also make it a lot easier to visualize, we decided to work together with PwC, with actually a very experienced um, ESG team of, 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 of PwC, in order to create a monetized, a monetized valued impact of these three externalities that are contributing negatively to climate change. And so what you can see on this graph is actually the valued environmental impact in dollars per kilogram of each animal protein category. We have looked at chicken, egg, beef, and pork products. And we've compared very like for like. So we've compared the same cuts um, with the same, let's say, equivalents in alternative protein worlds. And we have actually gone down to the recipe of the products, we've also taken into account geographic imbalances. For example, if you talk about GHG emissions, um, electricity in China is much more reliant on coal than in Europe. So there, the GHG impact or the energy use impact would be um, higher than in Europe. So we've really drilled down very detailed. And if you look at this, I think the only message, if you want to take a message from this is that, for every animal protein category that we looked at, the plant-based version is much more easy on the environment. And especially if we calculate with the true cost, then, and if we calculate with the true cost, then um, the consumer, once these are priced in, and this might happen in the next years, this might not, it might, might happen in a different format, but anyhow, theoretically, if the consumer were to pay the priced in environmental impact, they would have to pay an absolute multiple on every protein category that we looked at. And the plant-based version would be um, much more affordable in the medium to long term. So um, I hope this gives a bit of an overview and creates some clarity. I think um, going forward, the alternative protein world uh, is going to be uh, quite an attractive place to invest and obviously a very future-oriented place. And uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions or wants to look at the study, this is on the Blue Horizon website to download. And if you want to contact me directly, uh, don't hesitate and looking forward to speaking to you. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, very, very insightful talk indeed. Um, comparing animal products to their plant-based alternatives, um, I think right now, especially with you know prices being so high within the plant-based industry and you know they are driving down but i think it's a key focus that 
investors and um, startups look at that and think about the longevity of, you, of it. Um, I know you just mentioned, you know, where to find some of this data, but are there any other places that you would recommend um, where they can actually, where people can gain access to some of this data? So I honestly, I don't want to sound too salesy, but this is a really comprehensive study and we wanted to make it easy because measuring environmental data is so enormously complex that many people who don't have like seven PhDs in biotechnology, they just don't know. And also I, as a layman, working in the field i don't know how much a ton of co2 is is it a lot is it worse than a ton of water like i don't know i have to research right so if you see that a kilogram of beef is should be should cost seven dollars versus zero point i don't know zero point six dollars on the plant-based side this is easy to understand right and this is also easy for consumers to understand the real cost of the products that they're now buying at a discount, which is only due to subsidies and basically animal animal protein companies not not actually needing to can to well obey to free market rules. That's that's basically what it is. Yes, and um, one thing for sure is I think we're going to start seeing a lot of subsidies head into the plant based market as well. Yes, likely with the Horizon Europe um, initiative, which has 11 billion from farm to fork, obviously, that's going to be interesting. And in the end, um, since supply chains of, of alternative protein and especially plant based are so much shorter and, and less complex, it's inherently going to be cheaper. It's just going to come with scale. And I think we're going to see price parity very, very soon. And then the consumer is going to, to decide if the price, the availability and the taste is right. The consumer is going to decide it's going to be a matter of a uh, very short time. in my opinion. Definitely. Well, we all are very much looking forward to that day as well, for sure. So thank you very much for a very insightful talk indeed. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone. Thank you. Right. Now we have a few videos for you, um, which we're going to head to now. Globally, we already exceed planetary boundaries in the production of food. Livestock emissions, combined with intense farming methods and clearance of for agricultural land, further damage key components of our natural environment through deforestation, lost biodiversity, unsustainable water use, and disrupted biogeochemical flows. However, farming is an intrinsic part of human culture, and we can't live without it. We've evolved from hunter-gatherers through a number of evolutions of agricultural practice, from muscle to machine, through chemistry to genetic engineering, as we now enter a fifth era at the convergence of data, precision agriculture, and biotechnology. Farming and agriculture can't live without innovation and out-of-the-box thinking. They're two sectors that are not mutually exclusive. Agri-tech represents a toolbox of technologies that can deliver innovations in current food production through automation, AI, vertical farming, but also in delivering new alternative proteins through fermentation technologies and cell culture. To meet global demand for food in the next 30 years, we must grow the equivalent amount of food as that which we've grown in the last 10,000 years. And when faced with this, we should consider the opportunities afforded to the agricultural industry through plant-based and cultured protein production as an evolution of agriculture rather than its dissolution. What we need globally is a holistic approach to the production of food. The agricultural industry is continually making headway in addressing yield, but often to the detriment of sustainability. If we're to tackle climate change, we need a wholesale shift in focus to concentrate on land, water and nutrient management, whilst also delivering food that's rich in nutrition. Though I'm a founder of a business focused on bioprocess design for cultured meat, there's no one magic system. A diverse food system is the key to resilience. And there are lessons from tradition, heritage wheat and native livestock breeds, for instance, though seemingly more costly and slower to produce, are actually comparative in cost if we consider that less product needs to be consumed for the same nutritional benefit. 
and often tasting considerably better. Organic, biodynamic and regenerative practice, though niche, has much to teach conventional farming in terms of soil protection and improvement. And though the monocultures of conventional farming are by no means perfect, there are a number of lessons that we need to take from conventional farming, and they're essentially the reason why we have food on our plates. Consumers have a key role to play in our future food landscape. A reduction in food waste would have a considerable easing effect on the pressure of agricultural production. But so can small changes in consumer habits. As diets change, supply then follows that demand. And that, that creates new opportunities to div diversify into different crop production. Here in the UK, the climate provides good conditions for growing plant proteins for direct human consumption. Species such as broad beans, peas, hemp seeds, or sweet lupin offer opportunities to diversify and to add resilience and provide higher incomes. As a farmer myself, I come from a family that's farmed the same land for over 300 years. And farming's unlike any other industry. It's part of the fabric of our being. And you're often born into it, and any criticism seems direct and personal. This often makes it hard to enact change and to innovate as heritage and tradition are intrinsic. However, as a business, farming's a volatile sector, and farmers are being subject to immense hardships through climate change and large fluctuations in global markets. Changing weather patterns, tight economic margins, increasing feed and care costs, low farmer confidence and poor mental health are key challenges to the sector. Diversification is key to increase resilience. A Nuffield farming scholarship influ influenced my own shift from red meat production and specialist food processing to delivering enabling bioprocess technology for the nascent cultured meat industry. In some ways, the path of my own business is an example of traditional British agritech innovation pathways. The business was derived initially from an industrial academic partnership with the University of Bath. And we now have four PhD students spread across Bath, Aberystwyth and Reading. And our research to date has been supported purely through undiluted support from Innovate UK and the UK research councils. There are undoubted opportunities for some farmers to shift their focus as I, I've done. But we often think of ourselves not as food producers as we really see the finished product, but as specialists within our own discipline. A dairy farmer, an arable farmer, a sheep farmer. We're victims of geography and climate, producing products that suit our land. And I fully understand that not everyone has the skill set nor the experience to move into complex biotechnology. However, each farm has the potential to diversify, whether it be through adding value to primary produce, through tourism, by making a move to arable or horticultural production or through cons conservation and environmental land management. My previous meat business was itself a diversification project, turning primary product into high value goods. And in the context of cultured meat, primary agricultural produce is a key part of the future supply chain. Cells are derived from animals and the feedstocks for media formulations and the materials for scaffold production will undoubtedly be partly produced from plants. However, transitioning from one production system to another is often hard. It's capital intense and it requires re-education. The growing global population places an imperative need for us to make these transitions. Government policy and financial intervention would undoubtedly be the easiest route. And historic subsidy have themselves been extremely successful when considering agroecology. The agricultural community embraced the principles of environmental management when enticed financially. And future policy must recognize this. There's no one size fits all answer. A holistic approach to land requires a holistic approach in policy terms, where agricultural productivity is supported, but also where education plays a key role and where agroecology subsidy 
through carbon credits rewards those who promote good stewardship and high nature value. In 2016, at the invitation of the office of the UK Prime Minister, a group of us convened at 10 Downing Street over a number of weeks to discuss the pathways for alternative proteins in a UK context. We strove to deliver a policy of inclusivity and later we founded Cultivate as a multi-voiced forum for the cellular agricultural industries in the UK. And as an unashamed plug, you're more than welcome to join us and contribute at our next event, which is in December. But one of the key aspects of that work was understanding the pathways for this nascent industry. Fermented and cultured proteins sit at the intersection of the food and biomedical industries. And though they're new technologies, they're also reliant on agricultural inputs. And regardless of our own personal beliefs, we must be careful not to alienate the agricultural industry. In 2017, I delivered a keynote on this very subject of agricultural opportunity and transition at the Maastricht conference. And it was at that event that I first met Ira Van Elen, the organizer of this event, and the daughter of the godfather of cultured meat. And my take home message then is still relevant. We need to build bridges with the agricultural community to deliver this next stage of food production and together. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nadine Filko. I'm copywriter and author of the book Clean Meat, Flesh of the Labor, Die Zukunft der Ernährung. Auf die Frage, ob Bryant in der öffentlichen Wahrnehmung in den rund drei Jahren seiner Forschung bereits eine Veränderung feststellen konnte, reagiert er mit Zurückhaltung. Es gibt zahlreiche unterschiedliche Untersuchungen mit unterschiedlichen Samples. Noch haben wir keine Langzeitstudie durchgeführt, in der wir jedes Jahr dieselben Dinge abfragen. Dennoch gäbe es ein paar gute Gründe dafür anzunehmen, dass die Akzeptanz zunehmen wird. Eines der wichtigsten Ergebnisse ist für Bryant, dass über alle Studien hinweg, die ihm bisher begegnet sind, die Offenheit für das Produkt größer wird, je vertrauter dem Probanden das Konzept ist. I chose to read this part of the book because it's about consumer acceptance and uh, consumer acceptance is one crucial factor of bringing clean meat to the market. Chris Bryant states that the more the people know about the concept of cultivated meat, the opener they are to it, which is also one reason why I wrote this book, because I wanted to show the people out there opportunities to change the way they eat, especially in context of uh, the meat market and the meat industry. Um, I'm a meat eater myself, and in Germany there are a bunch of meat eaters, and uh, the way our system is built um, is not accept acceptable anymore. So the book tries to not point at people, but show what we can change to maybe individually change a tiny bit of the market, and uh, in this context, my book can, can be um, not about grievances, but about opportunities and maybe be a tiny part in changing the food, future of our food system. Once upon a time, the world was in balance. People used to grow their own food even called animals by their names. There was a connection between what we grew and what we ate. But today, in our hyper-industrialized world, we've lost this connection. We send billions of animals to slaughter every year. Using 30% of available lands, consuming 15,000 liters of water for every kilo of beef produced, increasing issues of contamination antibiotic resistance, and climate change, throwing our world out of balance. But what if we could go back to growing food that was in balance with nature? What if we could grow a steak identical to the steak we all like, but without the downsides to health and the environment, and in a way that's more humane? 
At Olive Farms, we believe meat should be celebrated and enjoyed. That's why we directly grow safe, cell-based real meat similar to farm meat. The same meat with an improved production process. Olive Farms replicates the muscle regeneration process that naturally occurs inside the cow, but on the outside. Using the same types of cells found in a steak, we grow slaughter-free meat in 3D, ensuring an end product which obtains the same taste, texture, and structure, advancing towards our vision of creating a cell-based steak. We're entering a new era by growing meat that's good for you, good for animals, and good for the planet, leaving a better legacy to future generations. This is no fairy tale. This is a true story brought to you by Olive Farms. Most companies today face significant challenges when attempting to access markets with their food or feed products, particularly heavily regulated markets such as the European Union and the USA. So we use our knowledge and experience of the legislative areas in those markets to help our clients achieve market access in a cost-efficient and timely way. And we understand very well that time is money for our clients, so we aim to match our experience and expertise in regulatory affairs with clients' objectives in order to get that fast access to market. Penantech specialises in food and animal feed regulations in the European Union and worldwide. We have over 20 years of experience and our services range from identifying a product's legal status to creating regulatory roadmaps and designing strategies to enable the fastest route to market. We are dedicated to finding optimal solutions that answer the challenges that companies face with growing complexity of the food chain legislation and regulatory requirements. One of the most important questions that our clients ask is whether their product is actually going to achieve a legal status in the target market. After that question, clients want to know how long is it going to take and how much is it going to cost? These are very important questions. Additionally, clients are very interested in knowing what are the significant challenges that lie ahead and are these significant challenges going to adversely affect our commercial objectives for the product. Our team consists of highly qualified experts with various backgrounds and from various countries, hence we speak all the major EU languages. We have specialists in agriculture, life science, food production, veterinary science, nutrition and food safety, to name just a few. We are here to help your company achieve faster product approvals and we offer you a full regulatory support service. Hello everyone and uh, thank you for joining me today from wherever you are in the world. Um, so I'm Hannah Lester and I'm the Scientific Director at Penn & Tech Consulting a consultancy based in Barcelona, where we help people and companies with their regulatory issues, um, specifically related to food and feed products. Um, okay, so why the title? Why, why fun and regulatory are not naturally compatible? Uh, so there's a story here. So basically, Ira, um, one of the KET co-founders and co-organizers of this conference, asked me to send in a fun title for my talk. So I thought, and I thought, and I thought, um, and I really wanted to come up with something that was fun, uh, clever, and culturally relevant. So first off, uh, I came up with regulations are like a box of chocolates. You never know what's coming next. Um, I thought most people uh, would understand the reference and the analogy seemed about right. So I then started to think about this um, and I thought and I thought and I came to the realization that actually in the regulatory world, uh, the majority of, of the time we do actually know what's coming next. So in the EU especially, there are endless public consultations uh, where stakeholders can have their say on current and future regulations. 
Uh, and one thing we do know for certain is that regulations and regulatory requirements only get tougher and not easier. So, for example, from March 27th next year, we will have a new EU regulation on transparency, which will cover all regulated products in the food chain. So from novel foods, animal feed to pesticides. So this regulation came about because of EU consumer pressure about the safety of glyphosate and the studies used to support the authorization of the product and the reauthorization of the product. So consumers wanted more transparency and access to the data uh, that are used to support glyphosate and other products in the food chain. So uh, in fact, this regulation was not sprung on us out of the blue, and we've known it's been coming for several years now. Um, the regulation itself was published in September 2019 and will only apply from March next year. So we've actually had uh, over a year and a very long transition period to get used to, to this regulation. So that title was no good. So back to the drawing board. So I then thought of drawing a comparison between uh, regulations and Pandora's box. I really thought I was onto something here and I could see that regulations could be construed as a great source uh, of great and unexpected troubles, and at the end, there's hope. So I started thinking this through um, and then thought, well, maybe this is over the top and this probably doesn't fit either. So as we all know, when Pandora opened the box or the jar, she released plague, sickness and death into the world. And thinking this through, actually regulations are there to protect us from plagues, sickness and death, and indeed to protect human health, animal health and the environment. Um, and in the EU, without doubt, we have the toughest uh, food regulations and regulatory framework. I mean, we have regulations for everything from novel foods, traditional foods, pesticide residues, GMOs, antimicrobial resistance, animal welfare, even down to the size and shape of the carrots you get in the supermarket. But on the flip side to this is we do have the safest food chain in the world. So the Pandora's box thing was no good either. So back to the drawing board. At this point, I was completely stumped. Um, so I emailed Ira uh, to ask for more time to think about a fun regulatory title. And in this email, I said, you know, I'm really struggling because fun and regulatory are not naturally compatible. Uh, within seconds, Ira had emailed me back and said, I have a title for you. Why fun and regulatory are not naturally compatible. So there you go. That's the story behind my title. And now I need to explain why fun and regulatory are not naturally compatible. So when I was thinking through about what I wanted to say, I realized that there are actually lots of fun things uh, about regulations. No, honestly, there is, and I'll tell you why. So I guess it ultimately depends on your personality. But for me, I really love uh, regulatory work because, number one, I really like problem solving. Um, it's great when you get a really complicated product and you find uh, a solution or solutions for your client. So, uh, for example, we've recently helped a food startup uh, to avoid going through a very lengthy novel food authorization by building a case to demonstrate non-novelty to present to the authorities. Um, in this instance, the scientists that had developed this product had come up with an incredibly uh, techy, very sciencey name. Um, for what was essentially just a protein hydrolysate. So we persuaded them to, um, to just call it a protein hydrolysate. We built the dossier to present to the authorities. Uh, and fortunately, the authorities agreed that this protein hydrolysate was not novel. So this saved the client the whole process of going through a novel food authorization. So saved them a lot of time and money. So that was a good outcome. Uh, number two, 
I really like telling people what to do. Uh, not in a bossy or smart ass way, but I really like it when we're able to tell our clients what they need to do in order to get their product to market. So one of the favorite one of my favorite parts of my job is performing what we call a data audit and gap analysis. So this is where we analyze the product and look at all of the data available uh, to identify the study and data gaps um, and to identify the studies that need to be performed to support the novel food dossier. So once we've audited all the data and identified the gaps, we then build a regulatory roadmap which is a blueprint for the client to follow in order to get uh, all of the data they need to build their dossier. Uh, number three, I really love a good argument. Uh, no, really. Um, it's so satisfying when you go into, the, into battle with the authorities. Um, you study the case, you do your research and look for precedents, you prepare your arguments and justifications, and then you enter into battle. Um, one of my favourite arguments is trying to convince the authorities that animal studies are not needed to support the safety of some products uh, and proposing alternatives, so using the literature or proposing alternative in vitro tests. And we've had several successful outcomes on this, so this is, this is really good. Number four, I know it sounds really cheesy, but I really do love helping people. Um, I love Kind Earth Tech um, and what it stands for, and I love meeting all the amazing people here uh, and hearing about all the incredible projects uh, that people are working on. Um, but what happens is I get really upset when I see a fantastic new pro food product being developed and I can see the regu regulatory issues that the company will face, uh, and I really want to help. So. There are regulatory considerations for all food products um, and regulations can seem daunting and dull and a roadblock to what you're trying to achieve. Uh, however, you can really save time and money and heartache by getting your regulatory strategy uh, sorted from the very early stages of product development. So um, I have a really good example for you. So, I'm sure you've all heard of Just Ink and their Just Egg product. If you haven't, I'm not sure where you've been. Um, so this alternative egg product has gone crazy in the US and is now taking on Singapore and Southeast Asia. So why isn't it here in the EU? And the simple answer, the regulations. <clears throat> so one of the ingredients that they use in their product is considered a novel food in the EU. So that was that. No market entry until that ingredient gets approval as a novel food. Um, this novel food approval process typically takes two to three years um, because you need to perform the studies, you need to write the dossier, get the dossier evaluated and the approval granted. So the lesson here is the sooner you know if your product or ingredients raise any regulatory red flags, the better. So to wrap up, um, often regulations are perceived as dull, but they are a necessary evil. Um, understanding the regulations and having a solid regulatory strategy will help you in the long run. And depending on your personality, regulations can be fun. So thank you all very much for listening and please feel free to contact me if you have any, any questions. Thank you very much. Imagine the same steaks we all care for, but without the environmental impact, without using any antibiotics and without involving any animal welfare issues. That's exactly the vision of our farms, producing high quality steaks directly from cells we isolate from a healthy animal without harming it by reproducing a natural phenomenon for tissue regeneration outside the animal. The company has been co-founded with the Strauss Group and with the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. We're part of the World Economic Forum's Technology Pioneer Program, part of EIT Food, and uh, we've been also recognized by UNESCO and NetExplo as one of the 10 most promising sustainable technologies in 2020. 
The company is led by a team of experienced and seasoned entrepreneurs and managers uh, coming uh, from the academy, but also from um, biotech companies and food companies. We have a very high level advisory board with a very strong focus on sustainability. And I'd like to start with a misperception. Many times we hear about the need for feeding 9 billion people in 2040. Actually, in 2018, we're already using the resources of 1.7 planets. We really need to, to figure out how we can, as quickly as possible, change the way we manage our natural resources in order to get back uh, to balance in nature and stop depleting our resources. Agriculture by its own is responsible for over a quarter of the global greenhouse gas emissions and livestock um, farming specifically for close to 15% according to FAO. But beyond the direct impact of livestock farming, there's also a very strong um, and significant indirect impact. Today, 46% of the global harvest is used for animal feed, meaning that meat is really the key to a just and sustainable agriculture transition. And we've seen two approaches developing in the last uh, last years to uh, address those issues. One is to replace meat with plants and to process the plants in order to make them uh, feel, look, taste as much as possible to meat. That's the meat analog approach promoted by Beyond Meat, Impossible, and many other um, plant-based companies. The second approach, which is relatively new, is the cell-cultured or cultivated meat approach. There is no product in the market yet, but it's a completely different uh, philosophy. The idea is to uh, stick to meat, but to change the production process for obtaining the same meat and, and uh, providing uh, the same nutritional quality, the same sensory quality as the meat we all know today. And this is important because we do see a paradox in the, in the um, animal protein market. On one hand, there's an increase in demand for, for meat and other animal products due to the increase of the global middle class, driven primarily by Asia. On the other hand, due to the same um, limitations of resources we've discussed before, many experts believe that it will not be possible to maintain the same production level for conventional meat. So we need to find a way to supplement conventional meat with additional products, with different options. And that paves the way for both plant-based and cultivated meat. According to Etty Kearney, cultivated meat uh, alone should represent an opportunity of $630 billion by 2040. Aleph Farms is sticking very much to nature, using non-GMO cells, but also um, reproducing as closely as possible the natural environments of the cow's body in order to reproduce the same nutritional quality, sensory quality, and uh, culinary quality of the meat growing inside the animal. What's uh, uh, characterizing Aleph farms within this emerging industry is the combination of a scalable cultivation platform with a clear path to cost priority, together with using natural cells, non-GMO, non-immortalized, still suitable for mass production, and the focus on steaks, meaning um, uh, growing structured whole pieces of meat. On top of that, Aleph Farms is working hand in hand with meat and food industries in order to lead together uh, this uh, needed uh, food system transition as an ecosystem, not as a standalone company. You can see here the first, uh, the picture of the first prototype released at the end of 2018. Since then, we've been working on turning this prototype into a commercial uh, product. And here is a rendering of the, the first uh, product we'll release in a, a few years from now in retail, um, which will be um, uh, fully transparent with a lot of uh, consumer-facing information. Those are some uh, feedbacks from journalists who tested the meat. The feedback is unanimously um, positive both on the test and texture. And following the completion of the first commercial prototype um, at the end of 2020, we plan to start transferring this product 
um, onto a production facility beginning of 2021. And by the end of next year, we should have a first biofarm, a first uh, pilot plant operational. We do expect a first market launch, second half of 2022. And 2025 should be the first year of full scale production and commercialization. At that time, uh, we will already be carbon neutral. The large scale production facilities will look very much like uh, dairy production facilities, fully automated and hygienic with no contact with living nor slaughtered animals. Based on the surveys we've performed, uh, we do uh, see that there is a huge opportunity for non-GMO cultivated meat. And there are some early data showing that the expected acceptance for cultivated meat should be higher than for plant-based meat analogs. The regulatory path for this type of products is today relatively clear um, in the US, in Europe, and in most of the Asian countries. Ali Farms is on a mission to solve environmental, public health, and ethical issues within the food ecosystem, replacing factory farming or industrial farming practices with a better way. But we've been also the first company in this space to commit to be carbon neutral. And we believe that cultivated meat will have a significant role in the transition toward carbon neutral economies in Europe and in other parts of the world, and will supplement um, regenerative agriculture with additional capabilities in order to meet the demand for animal protein. Another significant um, contribution of cultivated meat will be to food security. Um, the Chatham House in 2017 identified um, choke points related to global trade and the risk associated with um, the import of food in different parts of the world. Cultivated meat can be produced anytime, anywhere, and can solve a very significant um, uh, issue with the, uh, malnutrition and with uh, the resilience of the global food supply chain. To conclude on uh, uh, the sustainability aspect of cultivated meat, we believe there is no other technology out there we know which can promote up to 10 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And together with other companies in this space, including Israel, we intend to position cultivated meat as a cornerstone of a new global food ecosystem. And just to conclude, I want to mention that for a new protein solution to be um, uh, to have a, a real impact in the market and to drive a real change, it has to take into account the preferences of the consumers. It has to be able to, to fit into the consumer expectations and to manage well the consumer expectations. It's not enough just to find a technological solution. That Aleph Farms will put a lot of focus on quality meat, working hand in hand with the consumers and with the existing food and meat industries to make sure our product will be fully accepted. And by that, we'll drive wider acceptance for cultivated meat. Thank you. Great range of talks there, especially at the end with Didier, um, expressing how cultivated meat can um, address up to 10 of the UN's SDGs. Um, now we're going to be heading over to Andrew Spicer um, at Algae Wonders. Um, is Andrew ready to join us? Thank you so much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be part of this event. So I'm, I'm Andrew. I'm the CEO for Algenuity. We're uh, an algal biotech company located in Bedfordshire um, in the UK, about an hour north of London. <clears throat> and I'm going to be talking about one, one type of algae today, which is chlorella, specifically chlorella vulgaris. And for, for some of the people watching today, this is going to be a reintroduction to chlorella. Some people, it will be an introduction. But chlorella vulgaris is, has been known for actually, or chlorella has been known for decades to be an amazing source of nutrition, particularly for protein. And chlorella vulgaris actually means small, green, and common in terms of the Latin name. And it is everywhere. It grows everywhere. And as long ago as after World War II, actually, people were exploring the use of chlorella vulgaris as a source of protein to feed the future world. And the little paper that I've, I've put on the right there, Algae Burgers for a Hungry World, was published in 1997. And it concluded that while the nutritional value was there, 
the, the biggest stumbling block to using chlorella as a source of protein and nutrition was both the color and ultimately the taste. Quite frankly, you can make a burger from chlorella vulgaris, but it tastes like shit. And that's a very blunt way of, of presenting it. But if you look at the nutritional value of this material, you're looking at about a 40 to 50% protein biomass, healthy oil. Hi, Andrew. Andrew, Hello. can I jump in um, yes. really quickly? Because your presentation, um, would it be possible to put it on the full screen? Because oh, yeah, right yes, now- yes, yes. Hang on just one moment. Yes, yes, there we go. Is that better? Ah, perfect, Sorry. much better. Yeah, Thank there you. we go. Okay, so, so we're looking at 30 to 50% protein, relatively healthy oils, fats, high fiber, low sugar, packed full of antioxidants, but ultimately it's all about the taste and the color and the quality and the scalability, and of course the right price to make this really have an impact. And so what have we done about this? Well, if you look at actually Chlorella vulgaris as it was before we started working with it, you can see a loaf of bread there that I made personally about four or five years ago. And that loaf of bread was made with 5% chlorella vulgaris incorporated into it. And you can see that that's not something that you'd want to, you would have wanted to eat. So what have we done? We've effectively applied plant breeding approaches to, to develop strains of chlorella that now lack chlorophyll. So they're no longer green. And in the bottom panel there is an example of three of those new chlorella vulgaris variants that we've developed. These are all non-GMO. They've just been developed using plant breeding techniques and selection. We have a white chlorella, we have a lime chlorella, we have a yellow chlorella. We also now have a red chlorella. Why is this an interesting uh, advance? Well, now we can start incorporating those ingredients into foods at a much higher incorporation rate and start displacing animal sources of protein. If you look at the PDCAS, which is the uh, protein digestibility uh, corrected amino acid scores uh, relative to other sources of plant-based protein, you'll see in the red boxed area there, that Chlorella vulgaris actually punches really high. It's a, a complete source of protein. It's actually reasonably digestible. And so uh, we feel like this is an amazing, uh, amazing ingredient to go into a lot of different pro uh, um, uh, foods and beverages. And I'm gonna highlight some of those. So this picture, so remember the green loaf of bread. This is now a vegan noodles made with 8% yellow Chlorella. This is uh, an ingredient I like to call it simplicity. One ingredient bringing in functional protein, bringing in the texture and the function and the elasticity of the pasta, bringing in the nutritional value, bringing in the color, bringing in the flavor, a clean label ingredient. So all those things come in with one ingredient. Those noodles were made uh, simply with flour, water, chlorella, and a little bit of oil. We're really excited that quite a number of big food and beverage companies and smaller innovative startups are working with us now. And one of the biggest companies we're working with is Unilever. There's been quite a lot of press around this. Just this part in the last couple of days, there was a lovely paper in the Financial Times talking about Unilever's mission to hit 1 billion in sales from plant-based products uh, of foods by 2027. And the quote that was within that article was, algae is going to have a big role in providing nutrition to us all. And we're excited about where this is going. But another thing to, to highlight about our chlorella platform, our white chlorella actually grows, it's fermentable. All of these are now grown in fermenters. And our white chlorella, if you put it side by side with whole milk, really is quite an interesting observation. We have a lower, lower number of calories. We have a lower amount of fat. Uh, high amount of fiber, we have higher protein. Um, more, more importantly, when you compare this against other sources of plant-based protein, this stuff tastes good. You can drink this. You wouldn't gag on it like you would for pea protein. This stuff actually tastes good. It has a cereal quality to it. It has an oaty flavor to it. So watch this space. I wanted to highlight some pictures from our facility. So here we can see um, some of our team uh, producing uh, chlorella. You can see that the yellow chlorella in the top right actually grows like that. It almost looks like yellow paint. It's producing a high amounts of, of carotenoids. So that's lutein and zeaxanthin, what you'd normally find in marigolds. Um, so it just grows like that. Our white chlorella grows white, our lime chlorella grows lime. And down on the bottom right, you can see where we start in the lab when we start uh, characterizing some of our strains. We have our own fermentation plant in Bedfordshire, and we're now in commercial scale up so this product will get into foods and beverages, and we feel really excited about that. But we take these lab innovations, and we have to take it to the next step. And that's highlighted here. 
we're working with a very talented uh, vegan application chef, and now we're working with a number of food and beverage companies to take this, these ingredients into foods and beverages. And so just to highlight some of the things you can do with these ingredients, we have obviously vegan noodles, now egg-free. What about vegan cheeses? So there's a smooth white cheese there with our white chlorella. Top right, uh, a vegan ice cream using our lime chlorella. Bottom right, a vegan milk chocolate. Start just starting to explore that space. Uh, enriching soups, making them more creamy, more indulgent and increasing the nutritional profile. And then also again, back to pasta down the bottom left, that's a tagliatelle using our lime chlorella. So this, these ingredients will go into foods and beverages. And we've already heard about regulatory barriers um, in Europe and about the challenges with regulatory barriers. Chlorella vulgaris was being eaten before 1997. This is a whole cell ingredient. And these ingredients can go into foods and beverages in Europe now. So we're excited about where this is going and I'm excited to be sharing our story with you. So I'm gonna end there. Thank you so much. Hi, Andrew. Ah, there's Paul. Hello, Paul. How you doing there? Uh, are, you back of, are, you back of, are you back of the yards? I am not, I'm afraid. Okay, okay. I, well, I'm not either. Yeah. I'm, I'm from Algenuity. I'm another you, you did ask um, for the anonymous person to... Yes, uh, yeah, that's great. ...at least reveal themselves. So Yes, no, that's really helpful. Paul O'Connor is my name, and I set up a company called This Is Seaweed. So oh, macro, interesting. macro algae, okay. obviously. Okay. Um, yeah. and, and so I've, I've just actually joined the... The, the kind earth session and so then i saw there was an algae session going on so yes yeah, I, I, yeah. Well, I spoke this morning i spoke this morning um, oh, I see. so i run an algae company in bedfordshire called algenuity but we're micro algae yeah so so uh very good yeah my company is based in dublin but the the seaweed okay. come from the west coast of ireland so uh, okay so, cool yeah i mean I'm, i i know quite a number of the people in scotland who are doing seaweed yeah um, I know Craig. Oh gosh, what's Craig's Rose. last name? Rose. Yes, Craig Rose, Doctor Seaweed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've sat on various panels together. In Very the good. We know Craig. Do you also know John Spence? He's I've met John Spence. Yes, yeah, with a, a competitor, yeah. let's say, of yours. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a good guy, um, and as a mentor, as such, for me. So he's. Uh, He's, he's well, actually, I don't know if he's really a competitor because what we're doing with our chlorella is we are going into the algal omega-3 site in in Liverpool, which is yeah. where yeah. where they yeah. were, yeah. where yeah. New Horizons Global were uh, originally. And I think John Spence used to be based in Nosley outside yeah. Liverpool. Yeah. So we, we're, we're, we've just form, formed a joint venture actually with Mara Renewables. And Mara have a vested interest in the AO3 site so our, our fermentation scale up site is on the AO3 site in in outside Liverpool. That's brilliant. So, so we're in the process of scaling up to full commercial scale by occupying the, the other half of that site that's currently being occupied by AO3, with AO3 working as our as our tolling sort of manufacturer for the process. Yeah, so it's pretty exciting. We I mean we're we're literally going full steam ahead. So we are aiming for production of around a thousand tons of biomass on that site uh, by early 2022. A thousand tons per of biomass per. of biomass, yeah, of dried dried chlorella. Sorry, per per month per year per year per yeah. year per year. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. I mean, we could we could push it potentially to 1500 if we if we drive the process even faster, but it's going to take a lot of work to get to that target. So yeah. we're, we'll, be, we'll be happy if we hit 500 tonnes next year, by the end of next year, yeah. um, and then 1,000 tonnes for 2022. Right. But our demand at the moment, I mean, we've just signed a big deal with Unilever um, in terms of um, going, into, going into a variety of different foods, um, and we've got anywhere from 30 to 50 additional food companies, food and beverage companies, <laughs> Um, with wanting samples or in the process of evaluating samples. So it's it's a bit crazy. Yeah. At the moment, <laughs> the, my head's spinning. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a few steps behind it, but what, what does a, a Unilever deal like that 
do? do is there money on the table from day one? Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah it's a two-year joint development agreement. I won't share the amount of money, but it's a reasonable amount of money to support our R&D. Very good, yeah. Um, yeah. It's the thing that's, I think, set apart our products is that we've removed the chlorophyll from the chlorella. So we no longer have chlorophyll, so we no have a longer have a bad taste. Mm -hmm. Variant strains, white, yellow, lime, and red, uh, stable variants that grow that way, beautiful colors uh, that are high protein, high fiber, taste good, fermentable you know it's there there's just a crazy really taste good or taste less taste amazing um uh, the yellow ones have an umami have an umami as well as protein so we put them into noodles we we can make a vegan a vegan no egg noodle yeah. using uh, chlorella flour water and oil um eight percent incorporation rate and you get color flavor texture elasticity protein like nutritional value all those things come with one ingredient which is pretty crazy really yeah wonderful and then the white the white chlorella is very very neutral so neutral that you could actually drink it as like a milk no way it's very 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 neutral it's like an ot cereal flavor yeah right it's really interesting and and how did you push those flavors is it to do with the feed source or is it no, no. Basically, we evolved the organism because it's a, it's a single cell organism. We mm -hmm. basically put them through high throughput screens, high throughput screens to select for the very, very rare sort of one in a million haystacks cell that had no chlorophyll and was genetically programmed not to make any chlorophyll. And when we did that, we found yellows, whites, limes. We did it again. We found red. And so these are genetically stable variants that have single point mutations in their genomes that knock out chlorophyll or, and knock out other pigments. And so they literally grow like that. And when, they, when, when you do that, you get the flavor as well. It just comes along. And so the white is incredibly neutral. The yellow has a distinctive umami and the lime has a different umami. The, the yellow almost has a chocolate note to it. It's bizarre. Wow. It's like even make it up. I mean, it's just like one of those things where you, you do it and it works and you think, oh my goodness. Um, and, and, and who did it? Are, are you, did you, no, we did, it. did you recently yeah, we did it. out of a university or? or no, our company. So we, yeah. so our annuity has been going for about 10 years. Uh -huh. A lot of know-how on cultivation of microalgae. And, and, and that and original, biology. that original strain, did you, did you pay uh, a license fees? No, no, we buy a prospected, we buy, I, that came, the original chlorella, that we isolated that was the wild type came from my pond in my back garden. Get out. What a story. <laughs> Good man. So I, so I, so I bioprospected that and we fished out out of 40 Chlorella vulgaris isolates. One was a really productive isolate, like fast growing, really nice protein. And we then took that and we decided to screen it through high throughput screens. And we found you know, a whole panel of different colors that we could isolate, which are stable. And they're stunning. I mean, they look like they look like paint. The yellow, our yellow one looks like paint. Brilliant. Quite amazing. Yeah. So, as a result, you know, now what we've been able to do because of taking away the chlorophyll, you can now incorporate these ingredients at a much higher incorporation rate into foods. Mm -hmm. because the really bitter flavor that comes from heavy chlorophyll is gone mm -hmm. and the dark green color is gone. So you can make a pasta that's beautiful pasta. Would you still even make ice cream? We've even would made. You, would you still call it a, a spirulina? Is or chlorella? It's, it's chlorella. Um, I don't know what we, I, that's. That's a good. I get asked that. Well, my question is is really down to uh, FDA and EFSA, and and is it is it already accepted? Your yes. Your so chlorella chlorella vulgaris was being eaten before 1997. So there's no novel foods requirement. Yeah. Ingredients, they go straight into food and bev now. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't matter that it's that it's now yellow and and, and lime. No. no. It's just like it's just like a crop variant, you know, that you select for a plant. You wouldn't have to register every every variant crop that's got a slightly like non-GMO. This is non-GM. Yeah. Wow. Non-GM. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So so uh so we're yes. Hopefully, this is going to get into a lot of foods now. We're, we're talking with vegan meat 
companies too because Corella is already known to have binding binding yeah. function and so it yeah. does work you can make a burger from even from the green Corella but no one would want to eat it yeah, <laughs> yeah. so uh, is, there, is there an iodine content in it um it's a good question i don't know the answer to no that. okay no, all right no problem the answer to that yeah, yeah. And, and just briefly um we're working on an extraction process a, a novel extraction process for extracting alginates and then uh, okay. proteins nutraceuticals to get higher value from initially from alaria esculenta a macroalgae okay. that, that we can cultivate in northern europe um, okay um, and we did it successfully last year and there are probably 10 companies in Ireland doing it this year. Not at great scale, but that's okay. It's in its infancy, let's say. Um, they're doing it at larger scales in Norway, uh, also okay. in, uh, in parts of Scotland, it, and, and probably probably parts of England. So and how is it cultivated? Is it cultivated on like long lines? Is it is it seeded on lines? Yeah. Sim simple as that, yeah, uh, quite basic. Um, I got invited onto a seaweed for Europe uh, okay. consortium and so we had a, a chat on on monday the science group uh and it is to uh develop cultivation at exposed sites or outside okay. of the because uh, yes. currently it's either in fjords or in bays or yes. hiding behind an island and and that's limited in its scale and its size and, and so to bring it to asian extents then we need mm -hmm. to go outside of, of and then okay. and then of course you're doing, it's an engineering project then because yeah of, absolutely yeah yeah cool yeah but we're we're jealous of you guys because you're all inside and warm and, and uh, i know as well and and with fermentation as well it's a very controlled process you know you things don't eat our algae you know <laughs> that's you know yeah. you're outside things can eat things can go wrong things yeah. can get pushed away you know all yeah. sorts of can happen. Yeah, indeed. Uh, the the cost of entry to to what I'm doing because I've done it on a on a shoestring is very different to to what John has told me the cost of setting up New Horizons Tech. So you know, I'm, yeah, yeah. I mean, we so we've been really lucky, I think, because Algenuity uh, as a as a biotech company was incubated within another company that had that was very profitable. And so we used an R and D tax credit model mm -hmm. for years, where yeah. that company no longer paid any corporation tax for ten years, and we had a fixed budget of about four hundred thousand pounds a year that was right. specifically dedicated to algenuity, free money effectively, um, and then we've used that to springboard and develop all of our know-how and our understanding to the point where we've just spun off actually as a separate limited company earlier this year. Mm -hmm. We formed a joint venture with Mara Renewables, 50-50 joint venture, okay. and gives us that access into the AO3 site in Nosley for fermentation. And so in terms of the cost to our genuity to get to where we're going, we've also just got a granted patent that on the whole platform, um, a GP patent, which is really exciting for us. Um, it's 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 been a really cost-efficient way to build a business that's having a big impact um so yeah but to if we had gone out and then tried to invest in a in a fermentation plant and build our own fermentation plant number one the time element behind that would have probably been three years before we were making product and number two the cost probably would have been around 30 million pounds to do that from from the ground up and you know we probably could have gone out because of what we've done so far we're getting quite a lot of attention from big players. We probably could have gone out and got the funding to do that, mm -hmm. but it's the time. The time is the more precious part yep. because the, the industry and the plant-based food and, and food ingredients industry is moving at such a pace that yep. we would be several tiers behind. Yeah, you know, I think right, right now we're coming in really into the plant-based ingredient space probably as a second generation. Yep. So we're coming in and saying this is better than pea, this is better than soy, this is be you know, better than oat, better than some of those ingredients, mm -hmm. there'll be more to follow. But if we don't get in now, it, you know, there's less, op the, op the opportunities will, will get less over time, I think. There'll still be opportunities, but they'll be smaller, I think. Yeah. Uh, but in, a, in an Impossible Burger, um, 
like which is made up of vegetable proteins as well as other stuff. Uh, do you see yourself as a replacement to pea? Because we would only see ourselves as a as an input of 0.5 yes. or one percent of that. Uh, no, I think we can replace. I think we can replace a lot of it. We wouldn't replace all of it because of the cost. Yeah. We're roughly three times the price of pea. I okay. mean, if you look at pea protein isolate, we're actually not that more more expensive. Yeah. Than pea protein isolate. So. Um, nutritionally, we're better in terms yeah. of the amino acid and the digestibility, and we're clean label, so we don't have hygienicity. Mm -hmm. And so, certainly, from some from those perspectives, we could replace a good chunk of pea pea protein. And the other issue that we have that we that we don't have that pea does have is pea protein isolate tastes horrific. Yeah, I tried it. <laughs> and so, you've got to mask it. Whereas with our stuff, you don't mask any of it. You don't have to mask it. It's an asset. The flavor is pot is, is an asset. Yeah. Do you boast about your amino acid profile on, on your website? Not yet. Okay. Not okay. Yet. Yeah. We're doing so we've done PDCAS. Uh, we've got PDCAS data. We're doing DS, which is the new way sort of, of judging protein, of looking at the comparative value of your protein as ranked against other sources of protein. It looks specifically at the breakdown of amino acids, the non-essentials, the essentials, everything else, and then looks at it in the context of bioavailability of those amino acids. Um, so we are we're working hard on defining exactly that, but we've also improved already upon it. So we can isolate again variants that are better, that have higher protein and have a better profile. It's pretty crazy. So we've gone from about 30% protein to almost 50% protein. No way. In in a matter of two years, just by keeping on selecting. No, no GM, just just going through, selecting again, taking that population, putting it back through and finding. So a lot of it's been tool, tool development, you know, finding the right tools like a dye that will enable you to stain cells, live cells, and be specific for protein content so that you then mix the cells with the dye, run it through a flow cytometer, mm -hmm. pick out the one in a, you know, like one in a million haystacks, I call it. Mm -hmm. Not just a needle in a haystack, it's a needle in a million haystacks. Because mm -hmm. um, that's the rare, how rare these events are. And so I think it's been, um, it's been really exciting to see how, how things have accelerated. And so, um, yeah, pretty cool. Very so, cool. Yeah. It's kind of taking taking all the learning that's been applied over a hundred years of crop improvement for plants and shoving it into two years to do rapid improvements because we don't have a hundred years to, nope. to do what we what they've done in crop plants. And you're still improving. And still improving. Yeah. Do you have a market or a value for your fiber extract? Are they I mean the, the other extracts? So you take the protein out. Well, we you're... don't no, we don't extract. This yeah. is a wholesale ingredient. So oh, yeah. other foods. We don't do any extraction. This, this, yeah. this ingredient works as a whole cell ingredient. It, so it brings in fiber, protein. The, we think the function, actually, the functional aspect of how this ingredient works comes from a combination of the fiber and the protein working together. Yes. Um, it's yeah. really interesting. It's really interesting. So, for instance, if you look at the binding function in meat, like in a meat binding function, and you look at the amount of protein that's in the biomass, the binding function does not correlate with the amount of protein. <laughs> the binding function correlates with the amount of biomass. And so that would suggest that it's a unique combination between the other things that are in the ingredient and the protein that work together to give the binding. And it may be that we've got hemicellulose in the cell wall, we've got chitin in the cell wall, we've got other carbohydrates, polysaccharides in the cell wall. It may be that those contribute along with the protein to the binding yeah uh, give you a really interesting ingredient mm -hmm. do, do you have a, a dha epa level no we have almost no dha epa so that's one thing we have yeah okay yeah so there might uh, be interesting uh other elements in there that can boast almost the same things of, of good heart health and good uh brain yeah yeah and, absolutely i mean we've got beta, we've got beta glucan in the cell wall so that's okay. really for immune health um yeah you know we've got 18.3 which is a poly which is a polyunsaturated omega-3 yeah. not the best one it's shorter chain yeah and c22 d3 um, yeah 
Yeah. Uh, we don't have any D3, don't have any vitamin D3. Okay. Uh, plus we do have there's some vitamin B12 that accumulates. So that's really good for vegan. Very good. Uh, B6, B1, uh, vitamin E, a little bit of vitamin A. So there's just, it's some interesting, interesting things in there. Yeah. And, and I mean, obviously, don't answer this if, it, if, it, if it's not relevant. But but the Unilever deal does that give them access to all of your projects, all of the all of the output? Yeah, I mean, they have they have they have access. They don't have exclusivity. Yeah, good. Very good. Some, they have exclusivity in a couple of key areas for them, very niche areas for them. Um, while we're in the deal, um, there's no commercial exclusivity terms at the moment. So until there's a business case from their side, they don't put the big hit the big golden buzzer and actually initiate a supply agreement and of course then it has to come down to price and scale you know and, and so that's the those are the two big things that have to be satisfied at that point and yeah so but it's 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 exciting to be working and getting uptake from a company of that size mm-hmm. yeah, yeah yeah without a doubt yeah yeah yeah, so, it certainly helps if you've got any other investors going on it's a, it's yeah a, yeah. A, yeah so it's it's a it's a good first step yeah I wonder who else is in the room. I know Omid is still here. I think I think Omid Omid is from Iran. The, um, oh, Omid. Emma, Os- Emma Osborne, who's one of the organizers from Kind Earth Tech, was in the room briefly at the beginning. I see. And she said the whole point of this is to get people talking. So I came in here to meet the back of the yards algae sciences <laughs> <laughs> who just weren't here. They've not showed up. Okay, right. Okay, this so, is their slot. They're supposed to. Yeah, be here. this is their slot. Okay. And I gave my talk this morning, and I had a session after that, which a few people showed up to. Um, but I just thought I'd come in just to say hello, and now I'm here on my own. So Emma, Emma left, and she said, "Stay there. I'm going to try and get the back of the yards." Okay, very good. <laughs> into the room. So here I am now talking about algenuity and about what we do, what we do, as opposed to what they do. What's yeah. the name of your company? What's the name? This- of your company? This is oh, yeah. This, that's right. This is yeah. this is seaweed. This is seaweed. Yeah. Cool. It's always good to meet sort of entrepreneurial. Yeah, quite. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pleasure to meet you. Yeah. Love the story. It's really. Yeah, I mean, I, could, I don't think I've got any slides. I, I can show you a picture. And you'll 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 be gobsmacked because people's perception of algae is very different to what we're doing. Yeah. Mm. Just, I just need to get a plug. One yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Show you. Let's see if I can show you this. I don't know if it'll let me. Let me see if I can share this. Here we go. Yeah. So I, I showed this this morning. I showed this this morning. Can you see that, Paul? Yes, I can indeed. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. So those are vegan. So those are vegan noodles made eight percent yellow chlorella and they look just like noodles and so it's it's the quite interesting comes from the algae comes from the yellow that's right comes so there's there's lutein and zeaxanthin um in there so i'm going to stop sharing i'll show you another I'll share this next picture here um there's another one here here we are so this is so this is in our facility. And so you see the yellow chlorella there. That's what, yeah. that's what it looks like after it comes out of the fermenter. Um, and then on the left there, on the top, you see um, four one-liter fermenters. And the front one is growing the wild type, the original organism. Mm-hmm. One. Then we've got white chlorella, lime chlorella, and yellow chlorella. Mm-hmm. Those are all stable variants. And then down the bottom left is our is our pilot facility with the fermenters and the carbon feed tank and all the other things there. That's Gavin, our lab manager, setting up the the, the tubing to pump the fermentate over to the over to the washing um, storage vessels. And then down here on the bottom right, those are those are an indication of some of our variants that we yeah. developed, including our red, our yeah. chlorella, which is down yeah. the front there. And the, and the a clear one to the left um, yeah so they just settled that's just a white a white yeah. that's just settled because of because the shaking platform there had stopped long enough for the photo okay. so it just and started to settle and then the one, at the, back, the, big one at the, the big one at the back is the wild type again 
above the red and to the right, uh, yeah. kind of a whitish, creamish looking one. That's a white. That's a white chlorella one. That's a white. That's a white variant. We've got several whites. Our, our current production white, which is in the top left up here, we call it W3, really grows like milk. It's like a really brothy sort of cereal type milk. And it just grows that way. I mean, it's it's quite um, it's quite surprising what you can do. And then down here, this is um, this is just an example of a few things we've made with our vegan chef. We have a vegan application chef. So this is highlighting uh, yeah. our sort of yeah, our noodles. This is yeah. um, soft white cream cheese. And substituting some of the nuts, there's cashew nuts and white chlorella in there. The top right is vegan ice cream using lime chlorella. It looks like pistachio type ice cream. Bottom right is milk chocolate using white chlorella. Wow. Um, and then we've got an upgraded soup in the middle. We've taken a Noor packet of Noor soup, which is generally watery. Yeah. We turned it into a real creamy, really indulgent soup by adding in lime chlorella. And then the bottom left is a tagliatelle. That's before we actually cooked it, just showing how you can make a beautiful tagliatelle with our lime. That's with our lime chlorella again. So bring yeah. the color and all the function. So it's um pretty cool. It's uh, super cool, Andrew. And, and are you concerned? We have another person has just joined the room. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, um, yeah, let me see. Are you, are you concerned about your limitations on volume? You said uh, pushing it to 1500. <laughs> uh we were already looking at other sites okay. um uh, so we are concerned because if the market explodes we have to be able to serve it yeah support that market and we at least have to have a plan to get there yeah uh, the, the good thing about fermentation is that there's quite a lot of older fermentation plants around um globally uh, not all that are being occupied or used i mean there's uh, several in the usa that are either on the market or going to be on the market very good okay that were being used for sort of bioethanol plants and things like that yes indeed it just didn't work out and so yeah. we, we're already exploring what the next steps would need to be we we haven't got there yet but we're already looking at a site in europe uh, right. primarily because of brexit and so that we have a, a plan because yeah. of costs of shipping stuff we don't know what the tariffs could be and what this is crazy really um, but, uh, yeah, we 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 don't know how big this market is going to be. It could get very big. We 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 estimate it probably in the low in the tens of thousands of tons range. Mm -hmm. It could go into the hundreds of thousands of tons range. Yeah. It becomes a very different different space. Yeah, is your feed source unique? And and so it's if just you sugar, you're... it's just sugar. It's just glucose. Actually, it's yeah. So it's wheat based. We are currently using wheat based glucose. Okay, so it's, oh, well, it's sourced from the Manchester area, so the the distance to Liverpool is very. So we're looking at the whole, you know, farm to fork, carbon yeah. footprint, and everything else, and so we source from non-food grade wheat, so just used for sort of bulk protein and for sugar, it gets produced for that. Yeah, my my question really was that if you do jump to the US or to another site in Europe your feed source is, is, is pretty basic actually. we could do corn we could use corn in the corn belt in the usa yeah yeah we could yeah. do the sources of glucose it will it will potentially impact our our life cycle assessment and our footprint depending on what we where we source from and and what they do and how they produce but but you know we're we're, we're working through a really in-depth life cycle assessment now so that we can have all those numbers and certainly, I think because we don't do a hydrolysis or any sort of extraction, we have a whole cell product, we end up with clean water at the end. There's no discharge issues or anything like that. You literally just, you could drink it. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's that level of quality. Wow. So it's, um, yeah, pretty cool. And uh, I hope I can watch your talk back. Um, I don't yeah, know I'm not sure. The only thing I should say is the video. I couldn't get the video to work. So there's just a picture of me and then all my slides with me talking. I couldn't get my video working. There has been some glitches this morning. Okay. Two things, but um, but you can hear me talking and talking through the slides. And and your background was it uh, marine science? Or no, I, I mean I have a biology. I have a background in genetics and microbiology. Um, mm -hmm. Was teaching in the USA actually at university, and then 
um, the company that my dad started, which actually is a totally different area, it's electronics manufacturing. My dad was reaching re- retirement age mm-hmm. to visit me in the States and said, God, what am I going to do with my company? It's doing really well, you know, just need to sell it. And, and so we came up with this plan that I would come wind down things in the States, move back to the UK with family, um, come on as a director of the electronics firm. But the incentive was to build a biotech company from the ground up. Uh, but the directors at the time, this was in 2009, uh, you know, peak oil and all the other things around biofuels and algae was really interested in, in new, new scientists and scientific American and things like that. And they said, we think you're a biologist, do something with algae. <laughs> That's all they said. <laughs> and, uh, so I was given a budget on day one and just said, just do something with algae and see if you can be successful and return. Yeah, well, you're lucky you didn't go down. Uh, yeah, and, so I, I looked at that and I said, I'm not going to touch that. I'm not going to go that route. So yeah. we, we decided very early on to go with Chlorella um, because it was already uh, scalable. It was already fermentable and already had a market, both for food and for cosmetics and personal care ingredients. We thought there was a flexibility in the organism and a market, existing market, and maybe we could then explore other opportunities within that space and so i think what what we really did well was we built know-how and we watched the market and we watched the mistakes the companies were making and we learned from all those and we stayed quite small and then we saw what the plant-based market was doing and thought hang on a minute how can we get chlorella new chlorella into that market and disrupt and have an have an impact and the big thing we realized was that the chlorophyll was a barrier to the market, both for taste and color. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the market for food and beverage products with normal wild type chlorella in them is very niche. It's for a small group of people who don't mind the flavor, don't mind right. the color, yeah. the nutritional benefits. The market for what we've done is mainstream. You know, that's anybody wants to eat good tasting noodles. <laughs> And if that yeah. nutritional story as well and the sustainability element, it just adds the value. So so I think so that's 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 my background. My background is actually in cell biology, genetics and cell biology. So just yeah. Yeah, but with a business acumen there as well. Yeah, so, always been applied. Always what you're doing academia was always looking at, you know, how could you apply the research you were doing in a way that would be have an impact. Mm-hmm. Used to consult for Procter and Gamble and Novozymes uh, when I was in academia, so I had an, an understanding of how that works. Mm-hmm. So, um, what about yourself? Uh, I I went back to college at the age of thirty and studied marine science. Oh, okay, yeah, having worked as a, a dive master in gorgeous places around the world, oh, wow. and um, then four years there then went to plymouth for a year to do a master's and went to the netherlands to work in the marine institute and so from my fourth year project end of undergrad was uh harmful algal blooms okay cool uh, and uh certain species primnesium primnesium and things like that yeah 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 Uh, a number of different ones and, and and looked at different beds and stuff uh but actually the result of it was uh, viruses that infect them have, have such a control on it. And, and so then for my master's, I studied viruses. I was in Plymouth Ooh. Marine Laboratories. Yeah. Was that Plymouth. with Mike? Was that with Mike Allen? I know Mike very well. Do you indeed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Mike very well. So Mike, in a way, I was under Susan Commands, but they were in the same okay. office. Uh, but Mike, I, I have good dealings with. Still in touch with these days. He's a great guy. Yeah. Really great. No, I share uh, I share a PhD student with Mike. My, my, we have a case student uh, where we have an industrial placement student who's a, appointed to Exeter because Mike's got an adjunct position yeah. in Exeter now. And yeah. so Gino, who's was an analytical um, chemist with us, um, wanted to get a PhD while he was with us. And so he's doing it with Mike as his academic supervisor. Brilliant. Um, and it's in the area of chlorella viruses. So there were no way, is it? Yeah. Okay. So there's some really interesting biology there in terms of viruses that infect specific chlorella and what they can do and what they do to the metabolism of the chlorella when they infect. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, there's an obvious, there's, there was an obvious synergy between what Mike does and his thinking 
and yeah. you work. But you you couldn't have a virus, and you, you I mean you couldn't be surviving this long if you. No, had no. Um, chlorella chlorella viruses infect chlorella variabilis, hmm. which is a different chlorella strain. They're very specific for it, or they infect micro microactinium. In, in the European version of chlorella viruses, infect a microactinium species. I can't remember the species, but they um they're very specific. They won't infect other chlorella. Uh, yeah. Typically, infect chlorella strains or closely related algae that live as a symbiont for most of their lives inside the gut of something else like a hydra or a paramecium. Okay, yeah. As chlorella live as a symbiont, they are resistant to attack from the virus. They, they, they're hidden basically from the virus. When they're free living, they become susceptible to viral, viral attack. Yeah. Quite fascinating viruses, giant viruses, very big genomes. Yes, indeed, cool. Yeah. So, yeah, but we don't get virus problems with our Corella, Corella vulgaris touch wood. <laughs> We've never seen one yet. No, if, would you, uh, um, my comment was that you couldn't. No, I mean, if you're no, we don't. For two years, there's no way it's anywhere nearby. No. And so, mm -hmm. Gotta hope Gino doesn't come home with the a virus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We've been looking. I have to say we have looked. We have looked. Yeah, okay. For to see if there's any evidence, but we haven't found any yet. Yeah. Although so, although, although interestingly yeah. interestingly, if you look in the vulgaris genome, there are evidence of viral genes that are integrated in the genome. And so at some point in the in the past, there has been certainly interaction with viruses of some to some degree. So quite interesting that is interesting indeed yeah yeah but no Very small good. world small world yeah no, that's gas now i love yeah. it that's great and, so uh, i'm trying to figure out who the other people are that are in the room i'm going to see if we can get introductions so there's five people here myself and paul are speaking i'm andrew spicer are the other three people is omid one of them i don't know if omid can confirm omid said he couldn't use his video or audio but there's two other people and I don't know who they are at the moment. But if you wanted to come on and join the discussion, you're welcome to. No pressure. Just type, just type in the or chat. Just type, or just type, let us know who you are and whether you have any questions. I mean, this is all being recorded. So it's it's um, it's um, a way of sharing information and, and connecting really within the space. So <laughs> I the offer now. So thank you, thank you, Paul, for for taking me up and having a good conversation. It's been really helpful, it's been really nice. Uh, such a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. I still, I actually still feel quite bad that the bad back of the yards algae sciences people aren't here um, because I really wanted to meet them, but I feel bad about sort of squatting in their space, so to speak. We, we have Victoria. Okay, okay, Victoria, hello. Um, sure, I can give an introduction, a very brief one of me. So I'm I'm Andrew Spicer, actually, from Algenuity. I'm not related to Back of the Yards Algae Sciences. Um, I run a different company called Algenuity, and I gave a talk earlier today. Um, we're going into food and beverages with our chlorella platform, which we call Chlorella Colors, which are chlorophyll deficient, chlorella vulgaris, and we're currently in commercial scale-up and talking to a large number of food and bev companies, making them aware of Corella virus in its new form and what it can do. So that's my, I'm the CEO for Algenuity. So. And hi, Victoria. My name is Paul O'Connor. I'm not with uh, Backyard either. I'm, I have a company called This Is Seaweed. And we deal in macroalgae, obviously. And we're working on a novel extraction process, extracting alginates, proteins, and other nutraceuticals from macroalgae. Mm -hmm. Do you want to um, ask any questions, Victoria? You could come on video or do it, or do it by audio. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else want to reveal themselves? <laughs> <laughs> Have you, to, have you spoken to VCs who, who play in the plant-based space? If you were to scale to the US, would you, know, would you need that kind of funding? Or, or I don't, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, we, 
we've fended off VCs so far. We've, we've had a lot of interest from VCs, uh, but we wanted to give away equity until we were ready. Yeah. So now that we've formed a separate, so we've got Algenuity and Algenuity Ingredients Limited now. And Algenuity Ingredients is the joint venture with Mara. Okay. So Algenuity Ingredients is really, it's the commercial scale up. It's the sales, marketing and distribution. Mm-hmm. 50, 50, 50 owned between Algenuity and Mara. That ingredients company potentially is, is a different vehicle, which then could seek funding uh, and or seek acquisition, you know, wanted that company if it was attractive enough. And so uh, we needed to separate and form separate companies so that we we, we just have a mechanism to mm-hmm. do those sorts of rounds without significant dilutions. Yeah. So, the, uh, the patent that you mentioned earlier is that... Is that exclusively in Algenuity? Oh, my microphone's gone. Yeah, so my, yeah, my, our patent uh, sits with Algenuity. Good, yeah, yeah, good idea. Yeah, it's currently a GB patent, but we have pending status of two applications in the world, PCT, PCT pending. Uh, and we have a second application that's just about to go to grant, GB application that's just about to go to grant, which is of an improved digestibility uh, variant. Um, which is quite unique, which is going to yeah. be different. so that's both of those together. I mean, are quite quite strong in terms of what they cover. So, um, great. Yeah, I can share. I can share my email address. Always nice just to have context and my one. Feedback from potential customers is an interesting question. We don't have any yet. So our main, com- um, so we're, we're currently in scale up. Um, we, um, our vegan, our vegan chef. So we, we produce out of our pilot plant currently in Bedfordshire, which is a food grade facility. It's a GMP pilot plant fermentation facility. So we're making five to 10 kilo batches of biomass at food grade that's dried powder and we have a vegan application chef who we work with who did all the foods that was in that slide i showed and she's her family are vegan and so the things that she produces she eats with her family and so we get feedback from them and the feedback is overwhelmingly positive so much so that her husband and her children ask for the pasta now they they prefer the chlorella pasta so um, so it's quite exciting in terms of the pasta angle. The ice cream, the feedback we got from her on ice cream was, again, really, um, really lovely ice cream. I'm going to write down. And what we, what we find is the main thing that we're trying to kind of communicate to businesses that we engage with is um, our ingredient. One of the big things about it is its simplification. It allows you to simplify a new product development cycle because the flavors are so subtle or so pleasing that you don't have to mask. You don't have to do all this sort of smoke and mirrors business where you try and mask the plant-based ingredients, which taste really bad, like pea protein. And quite the opposite, you bring in positive flavors and you also bring in things like binding function and other functions. And so you you could take potentially a vegan meat and simplify the ingredients in a vegan meat and make it look appear much more natural. So so that's that's what that's where we are with this. It's um, very simple. Um, we cultivate our in the UK. We're based in the UK and we have a scale up plant um, that we're just scaling up into just outside Liverpool. Have you been there, Paul? Have you been to that plant? And I haven't. No. I, I... It's an old. It's an old plant. 1979. It was. Um. It was Tate and Lyle Guar Gum. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So old fermentation plant. It's being upgraded. It's being upgraded so that it's a lot more energy efficient. There's okay. Upgrades there. And and could you take over a beer plant? Potentially, yeah. A fermentation plant. We'd have to do. I mean, the the, the main things would be downstream. The downstream process. You know, we have to wash the biomass to get rid of unspent media and then we have to dry it so we have to have spray drying capacity uh, mm-hmm. primarily we're doing spray drying through cmos at the moment so we 
have to invest in them because a spray dryer is a is a huge investment. I know, I I, I know it is, yeah. But it, it's serious advancements over the last couple of years. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. it's mainly the downstream. But yeah, if you've got fermentation a fermentation plant, you can adapt that. But, and 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 centrifugation and washing isn't that expensive. No, indeed. Put in a, to put in a plant like that. Yeah. Uh, would you would you license out your strains to anybody or, or do you want to hold <laughs> I think at the moment we're not we've been asked uh, we were asked in the last year we weren't ready to even we're not at commercial scale yet and so I think if the opportunity is really big and it it gets beyond us and a lot for instance a large food company wanted to yeah. license in for their own production we would explore that what that what that looks like yeah I think it, it, it all depends on the next two to three years, really, I think are going to be key. Yeah. Yeah. So, but we did. It doesn't, it doesn't look like COVID has hampered you at all. I mean, we're, obviously we're not attending, uh, you know, food ingredients fairs and stuff like yeah. that, but still you're able to operate. I mean, yeah, it slowed us down. Our pilot plant was supposed to have been up and running by April, May, and it's yeah. become functional. So, and that was because we couldn't get the engineers in from, we had an engineer coming from Germany, an engineer coming from the Netherlands, yeah. engineer yeah. coming from Portugal, and literally we just couldn't get them to come, yeah. to come so we had to wait. And so that's that's frustrating, but it's meant that we've we've really spent a lot of time refining the process um, in the lab with, with you know, 10 litre fermenters and mm -hmm. the fermenters to understand actually what we can do and how, yeah. how how much better we can make it. So it's given us really sort of disciplined time that we've had to focus on that and make the most out of it. Yeah. They look very sophisticated. The uh, the lab setup looks very sophisticated. Uh, it, I mean, it is. It's very clean and very, very precise. And so yeah. obviously in a large scale fermentation, it's not going to be as clean or precise. No. <laughs> So because the fermenters and Nosley are, there's 200 cubic meter fermenters, which operate at about 80 cubic meter volume. And then there's four 200 cubic meter fermenters, which have a working volume of 160 cubic meters. So and that's a lot of volume to move around, mm -hmm. especially when you've got sugar as your, as your main carbon source. And so the bigger challenges, the biggest challenges are gonna be uh, contamination, controlling contamination, and mm -hmm. having a, a clean product at the end that's fit for human consumption with a mm -hmm. bacterial count and anything else that might want to get in there. So that mm -hmm. be, that's primarily the biggest challenge of any fermentation when you're growing on glucose is having it clean. But how do you know your sugar is clean? But the guys there know how to do that. I mean, that's how they, they're making schizocytrium at the moment for DHA. Yeah. Yeah. So they know fermentation on glucose. They understand the challenges Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's it's a me different media and a different organism effectively that we're working with mm -hmm. so um but yeah they're, they're challenges that have been solved many times before by other people so they're they're not impossible is there anybody else so we've got victoria uh, and maybe it's omid still i don't know if omid's still here don't know i can't tell if he's gone so, no, I think I'm probably going to head off. To be honest, I, just feel... I am as well, and I'm going to tune into uh, to what's yes. happening on the main stage and stuff like yes. that. I, I've just sent you an email, Andrew, and uh, okay, great. We can stay in touch. It's absolutely, no, that's really good. No, yeah, really good important. to meet you too. Yeah, and Victoria, a pleasure to meet you as well. Yeah. Okay, and, cool. uh, be in touch again Victoria. yeah cool care. i think we're going to all ex all vacate this room now <laughs> so i'm going to sure. nice meeting you bye omid as well i didn't meet okay. you but yes. uh, wish you okay. well bye-bye bye-bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. going to move over to Koyan um, Vandenberg on the science of Fumi. Thanks uh, thanks for having me by the way. Uh, I must say uh, the Kind Earth uh, Technology Conference last year in, in Amsterdam was, a, was an eye-opener for me. It was uh, yeah, the best conference uh, I ever attended. 
even though it was in the Netherlands and I am Dutch, so it shouldn't be that special, but uh, hopefully next year we'll be able to have a, a proper Kind Earth Technology Conference again, where I can physically meet everybody. So um, my name is Koyan van der Berg. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Fumi Ingredients, and we're actually making egg whites from microorganisms. And uh, more specifically today, I would like to share more on the technology that we apply to make egg whites from beer. And um, I will not do a whole general uh, company pitch uh, or anything like this. I really want to focus on the technology for the next couple of minutes. So let's have a look at um, uh, egg whites and how they are made. I think most of you uh, know that uh, you know the egg whites, they come from uh, the egg and thus uh, a chicken. Uh, but what not everybody is aware of is, of course, is the environmental footprint of, of making egg whites. Um, so you need to feed the chicken for 21 weeks and then you need to add antibiotics, water, lots of uh, feed. And then finally, it starts uh, making egg whites. And the, these egg whites are, of course, uh, used all over the place. So whether it's meat replacers to bind stuff, making meringues, sauces, you name it. Now, however, if you look at the whole value chain of making egg whites, you'll see that it has a very high environmental footprint. So to make one kilo of, of egg whites, you need 40, you'll basically be emitting 40 kilos of CO2 equivalents. And this is what we want to uh, stop as, uh, as Fumi ingredients, because we believe we can do it much, much more efficient. So how do we go about this? Well, our raw material um, is, um, is, raw, is really uh, simple single cell proteins. So microorganisms. So think of, for example, yeasts, bacteria, fungi, um, microalgae, you name it. This is our raw material. And what we do is we then take these raw materials, so these small microbes, just natural, non-GMO, and we start to process them. That means that we will start applying efficient extraction techniques and we basically fish out very selectively the ingredients that we are looking for. And in this case, this is of course the vegan egg white replacers that we are really trying to take from all these microorganisms. So how, how does it work? Well, if you then zoom in on a uh, microscopic level, on uh, in this case, for example, uh, um, a microalgae, yes, one like similar like uh, what Andrew was uh, talking about, uh, and you look at all the compartments, what we do is we break the cell in a very mild way, and then we selectively look at, hey, we want to have a little bit of a cell wall material or soluble protein. We just tailor our process in the way that we know that we get the ingredient that we are looking for. And so we've been working for, on this uh, topic already for six years. It started at Wageningen University. And then uh, one and a half years ago, we incorporated uh, Fumi ingredients. And, you know, original designs that we made of, of all these factories that we were designing looked something like this. And, uh, you know, it, it's a terrible, terrible slide that I'm sharing with you guys. But it gives the idea of what we were trying to do. And if you start looking at all the stuff that's going on in such a factory, you'll, you'll, you'll quickly realize this is never going to happen, right? So there's 32 unit operations, so 32 machines that are next to each other, and then hopefully you'll get some ingredient. So we figured this is not going to happen. We need to completely rethink it. And what we did is designed a process that is much more simple and is not really obsessed over how pure ingredients is, are, but really on how ingredients are performing. And once you make this, this uh, you, you design your process in, in such a way, it can be much more economically uh, viable. Now, uh, another thing I'd like to uh, share is that we uh, actually are also a bit obsessed about upcycling or using waste streams. And a very interesting one is, uh, is yeast, uh, yeast that is coming from the brewery industry, actually. So, uh, Maybe not everybody knows this, but when you make beer, you have a lot of waste streams. So you have uh, spent grain that is basically a, a side stream, but also the yeast that is left over after the brewing process is also a waste stream. And this is a very big problem for the, the brewing industry. So what we did is we take now the waste yeast from the brewing industry and we start making these ingredients out of it. And uh, we are not doing this alone. Um, actually, uh, I also like to use this opportunity to share with you guys that we are now uh, scaling up this process together with AB InBev, um, basically the largest beer brewer in the world, and they also are interested in upcycling their waste streams into high-value ingredients. So we are 
very excited about this uh, collaboration and, and where it will bring us. And uh, we expect to have the first factory operational in, uh, in 2023. And to give you a bit of an idea on the, on the impact that we will make with this factory, in a typical beer brewer, beer brewery, uh, you'll, you'll produce about 1,000 to 2,000 tons of yeast per year. If you then convert this material to our egg whites, uh, you'll realize that per year we will be replacing 100 million eggs or egg whites per year from just this one factory. So this will have a huge huge impact and we are very excited about this to, to make this uh, to make this happen so does it actually work the ingredients i'll keep it very brief but yes yes it works so you can make very nice gels you can make foams you can stabilize emulsions so it's very cost effective and we believe that at full scale we will be even able to undercut egg white prices so this is going to be a very much a game changer so thank you very much for, uh, for listening to my story and uh, looking forward to, to meet you all in, in some of the breakout rooms. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Koyan. Um, very, very interesting. Um, this is definitely new to me, <laughs> I should say. Um, this, this concept, obviously, um, speaking about you know, the bare waste, um, what, where did you get this idea from? Ah. So we, um, we were actually working initially on, on, on this concept at, at Wageningen University, but applying it to, to microalgae. And we saw that uh, the technology that we were using, it was, um, it was scalable, it looked fantastic, but we were stuck with the wrong microorganism, which was a micro microalgae that was growing on sunlight. And if you want to set up a company on this, you need to have the right raw materials. So we started scouting for different raw materials that are abundantly available and cheap, and we found brewer spend yeast. And there you I go. Won't, <laughs> I won't jump into how exactly you found that. <laughs> it took a while, but <laughs> it's a uh, yeah. It's uh, but once we saw that it, it, you know, besides the microalgae, it also worked for yeast. That was a yeah. game changer. So that for me was the moment I, I realized I, I need to quit university and I need to pursue this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, that sounds great. Thank you very much for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thank Ciao. you. Next, we have um, Leo joining us. I'm not sure if Leo's ready. Yes, we can perfectly. So, Leo, um, I'll hand it over to you to introduce yourself, and we're all looking forward to your presentation. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. Um, so, welcome. Uh, my name is Leo Groenewegen. I am uh, CEO and co founder of Cellular Revolution. Cellular Revolution is not a culture meat company. It is not a plant-based meat company. It is a company developing enabling technologies. So we are developing enabling technologies which can be used by companies in the culture meat space, but also in the cell therapy space, which allows for continuous cell culturing technologies and allows for companies actually accelerating their business and actually getting their products to market. Um, I'm going to do it a bit different today. Normally, I would do a, a, a sort of normal pitch or normal pitch like I've been doing the last year. Um, today, I didn't really feel like that. So today, I'm going to do a Q&A of some of the questions I've been asked most in the last 12 months and uh, answer them to the, to the general public. Let's move to the first. I have seven questions that were most commonly asked. The first one, of course, is what you always see at the beginning of every call, especially nowadays through Zoom and Skype. Um, the general, how are you? How are things? Um, everybody always replies, I'm fine, how are you? Um, the last few months, I've actually been trying to change that. So instead of just saying, how are you? Where well, you always get basically the same reply. Nowadays, I'm asking people, what is the most interesting thing you've been doing so in the last week or since we last spoke? Uh, in my case, the most interesting thing actually I've been doing in the last few days or this week is actually uh, this morning we got the keys to a new laboratory. So I would say, okay, you know, I'm fine. But actually, more interestingly, this morning we got the keys to a new facility and next week we'll be moving our equipment, our parts to that new office. Second most common question is what is culture meat and why is it better? Uh, if you can see here on the right, cultured meat is uh, meat produced from cells that are harvested from an animal, uh, proliferated, differentiated, put into a, a scaffold in a shape, and then becomes a burger, a sausage, or another meat product. Uh, the reason why it is sort of seen as being better than conventional meat sources, or potentially better, 
is, uh, of course, it addresses some environmental issues. Belgian meat is supposed to be able to reduce uh, CO2 emissions, greenhouse gases, by, by approximately 80%. Um, it has ethical benefits, as you no longer need to kill or harm animals to produce your, your food. And, of course, health concerns, both your food will get healthier due to sort of elimination of things like antibiotics and microplastics, but also generally uh, the health and, and things like COVID-19 might be less uh, less occurring if you use healthy meat as opposed to conventional sort of factory farming. Uh, number three, what is the biggest challenge for the industry? So looking specifically at culture meat, what is the challenge? So, so what I see as the biggest challenge is the fact that uh, scalability. So how is the culture meat industry in the coming sort of years or decades going to be able to produce sufficient cells and sufficient uh, meat products? So I've been doing some calculations together with my colleagues. And actually, the amount of cells that we need is at least 10 to the factor 20 which to make it a bit easier to say is either all the grains of sand that we have on planet Earth or all the stars in the observable universe. And we need to produce these every year. So every year we need to produce the entire amount of cells, uh, which is a huge challenge. So the biggest challenge is how do we get the right yield as in fulfill this demand and this need for cells? And how do we produce these at suitable uh, prices and quality actually make sure that people can actually afford these products. So the question that normally follows is then how does your technology enable the further development of the industry? So how are we solving the challenges just mentioned before? Well, um, what I always say is we're doing things differently. Conventional production of cultured meat, uh, especially in the cell proliferation stage, is based on batch bioreactors, which work but are inefficient. So we have developed a novel type of cell culturing and a novel type of bioreactor, which allows for continuous cell production. Uh, here on the right, uh, sorry, on the left hand side, you can see actually the amount of cells needed in the coming in the coming decades. With conventional technologies, which is just a gray line, we think the capability can only be slowly increased by just building more bioreactors. Um, but actually, we need sort of a, a real step change, system change in how cells are grown to be able to really match that need that's sort of coming up from 2035 to 2040. Our bioreactor, which, which I'll show in a second, is, is again a novel type of bioreactor, capable of continuous cell production, which is much more efficient than batch production. That should lead to an increase in yield, lowered cost, a fully closed automated system, making it safer, cleaner, less prone to contaminations. And uh, we should be able to do media recycling, reuse, thus also reducing sort of the overall footprint uh, and, and resource consumption of, of the bioreactor in itself, making also the production as compared to other production methods more uh, efficient and, and cheaper. Uh, so what is the difference between batch and continuous, just as, as a, a proper overview? So on the left-hand side, on the top you see a continuous culturing system cells are first seeded to the surface, then growing, proliferating. The moment they're fully grown, they will self-detach. And one, in the moment one cell is self-detaching, another cell will take the place, it will self-detach, another cell will take the place. So we have a continuous system of cells growing, proliferating, self-detaching, being harvested, new cells will take the place, and so on. Uh, in a batch system, which is a little bit different, you have a surface, cells are growing on it, seeding, growing, proliferating. And then you need to manually harvest them. And when you do, you need to add trypsin to, to cleave them. Then you need to take them all out, clean it up, and a few days later start again. So it's a very manual process. And ours is fully automated. So on the right hand side, you can sort of see this difference in a 30 day period. If you look at the batch production, you have production in this sort of theoretical example is every five days. Uh, if you look at continuous production, you have actually output every individual day, except for the first few when you're sort of starting up the bioreactor. So in a 30-day runtime, in comparison, we were able, or the continuous system was able to produce um, about, about two to two and a half times the yield as a batch production. You can really see that there's a, a huge sort of increase in yields um, 
other tests that we've done for, for batch versus continuous is that with a six times smaller bioreactor, we were able to produce two to two and a half times the yield in, in also in a 30 day period. You can really see that this continuous process, which is a bit like comparing a, a ferry with a bridge. So a ferry is a batch production process where you put people or cells or cars onto the ferry, you move it across, you empty it, you clean it, you load it again and you go back. It works, but you have batches coming out every so many days, every so many hours. Uh, continuous is more like a bridge where you have a continuous flow of people, of cars, of bikes across the river and thus overall can, can come with a much higher output. So another question that I often ask, what is your biggest achievement or what was your milestone that you recently achieved? For us, a biggest milestone we achieved in the last of half a year, uh, you can see it on the right. Uh, just a few months ago, uh, we finished our first prototype bioreactor. So this is the first bioreactor in the world that is capable of continuous cell production. This is, of course, a small scale prototype uh, which fits on any sort of lab bench. We will use this in the next months, next year, to further validate, get data out of it, test potential collaborator and customer cells, and also, of course, move in scale and sophistication to, to more efficient, larger bioreactors. So our biggest achievement this year is the world's first continuous bioreactor for calcium meat production. Another QA I get a lot is, tell me something about our team. Well, I can give a quick insight in the team. I mean, you see myself already in the middle, uh, Leo Groenewegen, CEO and co-founder. My two co my two other founders are uh, Dr. Martina Miotto. She is our CSO. She's taking care of the scientific experiments, the laboratory. And on the other hand, we have uh, Professor Che Conan as uh, our third co-founder. He is a CTO and takes care of the, the technical development, which is also sort of the scientific um, and academic sort of brain behind the company and uh, in a way our, our sort of technical conscious. Uh, besides that, we have at the moment four employees um, are looking to recruit additional employees, both in the field of um, sort of bioengineers, uh, technicians, scientists, and even in the coming year, we'll also be recruiting some uh, commercial staff. So anybody interested in a job in the sort of more general culture meat slash biotech space, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Final question, which we get from mo mainly from the investor side, but also from some, some other collaborators. Are you currently fundraising? Or what is up with your funding round? How much are you looking to raise? Um, so we are actually in a funding round right now. Um, we will use the money from the funding round, move our bioreactor from the, the prototype that we have now to the first commercially available model. In about a year from now, we will use the funding for our new office, which we just opened, but still, of course, need to put in resources to, to sort of further grow and um, furniture the lab. Um, we're going to do additional R&D activities, more research, more prototypes, more development work, so we can make better products, and then, generally speaking, grow both our scientific and commercial team. So that were the seven questions I've been asked most, sort of in the last 12 months. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Hi, my name is Mare Dwebers. I'm the initiator of Matters. And Matters is uh, still a work in progress, but will be online within hopefully three to six months. And what we do is practice with consumers to do something good. Um, sounds a bit weird maybe, but it's, it's, I, I believe it's a beautiful concept because reality is shaped by what we believe, of course. Um, and our belief system is based on what we've experienced and whatever you've experienced uh it's mainly is it practice what you see and how you handle what you see is practice what you eat is is a practice uh what you're good at you've been practicing to become good at it um and reality is is something very very fluid um we know with behavioral change we can we can simply uh, change um, the way we look at things and experience things um, and what we tend to forget is being a good person is a practice too if you want to do good you can practice doing good and you can start really small um, and that's what we've 
tend to forget in this in this life where where there's these huge worldly topics about what's going wrong, uh, climate change, um, uh, animal cruelty, uh, the, the, the whole stream of refugees. It's 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 a very ugly thing, and um, we have the feeling we we can hardly contribute to these big themes, but we can. Um, and practicing doing good makes you become a good person. And a good person unconsciously makes other decisions than somebody who doesn't practice it or doesn't believe it, of course. Um, what I've heard my whole life is, Mao, you cannot change the world by yourself. And maybe it's a bit true, but we're not changing the world by ourselves. We're, we're initiating change and we're initiating uh, a sense of belief that we can and and in a while you'll find the people that want to work with you on these topics and you're not alone anymore so change the world you don't do it alone <laughs> you do it with other people but you might initiate change or you might inspire change or motivate others to create change uh, and that's the beautiful thing about reality it's fluid everything is possible everything is possible um so i'll show you a little bit about what we do we're creating use flows now um these are like the pre-technical features to uh, create the design on and to create the app so there's the onboarding uh here we create goal cards we're using goal cards where people can set up objectives uh, daily weekly it's going to be very interesting um, and related to their objectives, we're going to uh, inspire them, of course, with small things that they can do good, like decide to go to a different restaurant um, uh, that is plant-based or uh, decide to take the bike instead of the car to go to your work or whatever. It's small things. Um, these are goal cards. Uh, we have a beautiful rewarding system where we can send uh, gifts like products that are of course circular um we're going to introduce gigs we call it gigs but it's like helping out at a at a, at a good cause um yeah life events so when you're good at something maybe we we can use that skill uh for a good cause or for a product we can link products in good causes it's going to be a very interesting and beautiful setup where uh, where doing good becomes something inspirational and motivational, and it, we want it to um, be fun and be not intense is not the word, but we want you to feel something. Uh, we want you to touch reality again. Like, what is important in life? Is it that, that like the big house, or is it helping a group of people, or um, or seeing a change on a farm where animals are feeling better or being freed. I don't know, man. There's a there's a, a lot of possibilities. So one of these worldly topics um, interests me very, very much. And it uh, hits me every day. It hurts me too. And that's animal agriculture. Um, an industry where we kill over 70 billion land animals every year and an incountable amount of sea creatures um there it's it's a world of suffering and in, in injustice it's uh it's very ugly and even uglier if you look at what it brings us what it gives us back and we're on this website now our world in data where you can find data about uh, the craziest things it's beautiful it's all backed up with science and we're on the category of land use and here's this infographic which shows us what we do with our land. Um, and it seems that 77% of agricultural land is used by for uh, meat and dairy. An amazing thing, and what it gives us back is only 18% of global calorie supply. So let that sink in. Wrap your head around this. 77% of agricultural land gives us back only 18% of calorie supply. While 23% of crops give us back 
82% of calorie supply. Like the answer is right in front of us. If we want to change the world, we have to change our, the way we eat. The world will simply look different if we change the way we eat. It's amazing. And it's crazy that, um, that the governments and food industries are not 100% focused on this. Um, why? No, let's not say why. Let's talk about cultured meat. Um, getting back to behavioral change again. People find it hard to change. Change is difficult, uh, especially when you're busy. So what science tells us that people will change when the changes are really small. Um, they can do a, a small step, but they can, cannot do 10 steps at once. If you look at how people become vegans, it's the same way. Um, it's not it's not for many people to to directly be, be, become a vegan uh, from one day on another. Uh, it takes some time. It takes some adjustments. It take it takes to change um, the reality in your life. Like how do you live? What are your uh, what are your what, your basic uh, settings? Uh, what are your values? Things like this. So cultured meat is the perfect next step uh, to a better world because it doesn't harm animals, but it gives you the meat. It's the next best thing instead of animal meat. It's cultured animal meat. That's why I love it. Um, I've met Ira through a friend of mine. Um, she gave me her details. I just gave her a call and I kind of invited myself to her place. I was like, I want to talk to you. Um, we talked. Uh, I thought it would be uh, an hour, but it became three, maybe three and a half hours of talking about everything. Um, and that's where we are now. We're trying to figure out what, uh, how, how, uh, what, an, what the next steps are in this concept of hers, which she probably tells you on this platform. Um, and um, we hope to change the world. That's it. So, if you think about me, think about matters, but. Uh, Behavioral change, I love that. Think about tech and um, think about Ira. Contact me if you want to, if you want to uh, ask questions or get more information. I, uh, I love to help out. I, I, I love to get my head uh, into this industry too. Um, I have a great team um, of uh, designer uh, behavioral change, uh, like scientists. I don't even, not even sure what you call it um and a, a tech giant <laughs> and um we're going to be, do beautiful things i wish you all well take care good luck with all the things you're doing and i hope to speak to you soon cheers great great talk there um i believe now we should have emma osborne ready from citizen kind who will be speaking to us about sustainable teams ah hey, hey emma. Hi. <laughs> Finally here. We were waiting for it you. Worked. It worked. Yeah. It worked. I was so busy organizing everyone else. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, so we've heard quite... Can you hear us okay? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yep. Slight delay. Great. Great. We've heard um quite a bit about people who are building out teams, um, you know, moving into new labs and looking for new people. So I think this is a great time to have you speak to us about, you know, how exactly to build out those teams and um, yeah, how to find the right talent. So we'll hand it over to you and we look forward to the chat. Great stuff. So um, I'm just going to open up my slide. Here we go. Uh, can you see that OK? Hopefully. Can you see those? Yep. Yeah. Great. Okay, perfect. Well, yeah, so a bit of a change to the content in that we're going to be talking about people rather than innovation. But obviously, what would innovation be without people? So um, how do you successfully grow a sustainable team? Well, um, that is something that is very dear to my heart. Um, and I've been many successful teams or startups in the past, so I thought I'd share just a few of the 
tips that we have for um, how to do that successfully and, and so set some of the landmines. So the number one thing, hire before you need them. This sounds completely counterintuitive because you think as a startup that you, you know, money's always um, tight and you want to really, you know, pace yourself in terms of spending. But um, hiring people before you need them is a really great way to help accelerate the growth of your business. And it's, it is a, men a bit of a mental block, but it's definitely worth pushing through and, and and doing as soon as you can afford to because uh, you'll start to reap the rewards earlier. So um, this is what uh, most companies do is they uh, call us about a week before they need someone to start, <laughs> which isn't really ideal because um, that generally takes about three months from initiating a search to actually having someone start in a job it would take a minimum of three months, um, but it could even take five months. So if you think most people's notice periods are a month, could be two months, could be three months. Um, so you need to really start thinking um, about when you want them to start, um, you know, rather than uh, when you want to start hiring. <laughs> um, and uh, so that requires a good deal of planning. Uh, as the process is longer than most people anticipate. Um, other things to think about um, about the timing of it is that you know if they are relocating from another country that can obviously elongate the process. If they're a senior they might be locked in in terms of um, their neg uh, negotiating their notice period might not be possible so they could be on a six month notice period. Um, and if they have a contract agreement, it might be that they can't work for a competitor or something like that. So they have a restricted covenants clause in their contract. If that's the case, you're in trouble because that can be six months to a year. So know the cost. Uh, this is this, this is a list of the costs of recruitment. Um, now, obviously, um, it's there's a there's a lot here, um, but. The essential thing to think about is not only being able to sustain that person's um, salary, but also all of the other costs that come in with it. Um, don't also um, forget about the cost of your time that you spend on recruitment. Um, and that can be really valuable because some people will um, insist on recruiting themselves, but in doing so, take themselves away from much more productive and revenue generating activities that they could be doing. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily make sense to um, take on that responsibility, particularly if it's outside of your comfort zone. Consider your needs. Um, so that really is balancing the soft skills and the hard skills um, in a way which means that uh, you're not just thinking about, OK, well, I, you know, I need I need someone who can do this list of things. Um, it's also thinking about the, the nature of the person that you're looking for. It's about that person's personality. It's about um, what um, energy they can bring to your team. It's about um, their attitude. It's about how well they can communicate. All of these things are really, really important and um, vital to the uh, to a successful team. Uh, the other thing is, of course, culture and having them have a value, um, uh, have, having the same shared values across the team, which can really help with motivation and keeping people on that with that focus. So follow a process. I mean, as is the case with everything, following a process means that you eliminate the likelihood of things going wrong. Uh, so before you start, decide on that screening criteria that I just mentioned. So what are your hard skills? What are your soft skills? How do you prioritize those? And then what does your interview process look like? How many stages are you going to have and then over what period of time? Who are you going to involve in that process? Who in your team is most suited to be able to select people for you? And whose opinion do you value the most? Um, you, getting your team involved is a great way to enhance collaboration and enhance engagement with your employees. Um, but be careful because this is actually one of the ways in which you can um, subconsciously um, introduce uh, subconscious bias into your hiring decisions because some people might not actually be qualified to be able to make those uh, decisions on people and might be using their subconscious bias to uh, 
affect their decisions. So um, from a diversity perspective, it's a real, um, it's a really interesting point because you want to essentially minimize the number of people's opinions that you're inviting whilst also involving your team. So it's a really delicate balancing act. And then of course, how are you testing them? You know, what is going to be the most suitable way for you to assess their ability to do the job that you're asking them to do? So think about, about that beforehand and maybe come up with a task um, that you feel would reflect um, one of the most important elements of that person's job. Sell yourself. This is something that um, is a real bugbear of mine because it's something that lots of employers forget to do. Um, somewhat arrogantly, uh, lots of employers will think, well, of course, everybody wants to come and work for me. I'm amazing. I've got the best company in the world. Why wouldn't everyone want to come and work here? Yeah, that might be true. But there's a load of other people for whom that's also true. So um, you've really got to figure out what are your differentiators? Talent is your most valued commodity in your business because you can have the best idea in the world and all the money in the world. But if you haven't got the right people, it's not going to work. You can't execute on that idea. You can't make that stuff happen. So knowing your USPs and understanding why someone would work for you over your competition and driving those points home throughout the interview process is really important to engage the candidates that you're meeting and, and really help them um, feel like their contribution is going to be valued. So make your focus not only about selling yourself and your and your business and your vision, but also about your candidate um, experience and how that would um, how it would feel for that person were they to join your business. So, you know, how can they expect to grow and develop their career by joining you? What training are you going to offer them? And also think about from their perspective how they're viewing the competition and the competitive landscape. So. You know, what are going to be the motivating factors for candidates in 2020? Well, remote working is probably one of them. Safety could be another, um, but also stability, security. And um, and so that needs to be reflected in your salary offering um, and potentially offering things like shares and equity is advisable um, in order to uh, attract the really top talent and also retain them. They're an excellent way to retain um, people because they'll be bought into that vision and that mission in more ways than one. So thank you for listening to my top five tips for building sustainable teams. And um, I will now pass you back to Des Moines. But if anybody needs help with their recruitment, we're an international company, it's Citizen Kind. So we would love to help you and um, just get in touch.